Thranodia by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Lois B. Yoder, Charlotte, North Carolina Gone, gone from us, and shall we see these civil leaves of destiny, those calm eyes nevermore, those deep dark eyes so warm and bright, wherein the fortunes of the man lay slumbering in prophetic light, in character a child might scan, so bright and gone forth utterly, O stern word, nevermore. The stars of those two gentle eyes will shine no more on earth, quenched are the hopes that had their birth, as we watch them slowly rise, stars of a mother's fate, and she would read them o'er and o'er, pondering as she sate over their dear astrology, which she had conned and conned before, deeming she needs must read aright what was writ so passing bright. And yet, alas, she knew not why, her voice would falter in its song, and tears would slide from out her eye, silent as they were doing wrong. O oh, stern word, nevermore. The tongue that scarce had learned to claim an entrance to a mother's heart by that dear talisman, a mother's name, sleeps all forgetful of its art. I love to see the infant soul, how mighty in the weakness of its untutored meekness, peep timidly from out its nest, his lips the while fluttering with half-fledged words, or hushing to a smile that more than words expressed, when his glad mother on him stole and snatched him to her breast. O oh, thoughts were brooding in those eyes that would have soared like strong-winged birds far, far into the skies, gladding the earth with song and gushing harmonies had he but tarried with us long, O oh, stern word, nevermore. How peacefully they rest, cross-folded there upon his little breast, those small white hands that ne'er were still before, but ever sported with his mother's hair, or the plain cross that on her breast she wore. Her heart no more will beat to feel the touch of that soft palm, that ever seemed a new surprise, sending glad thoughts up to her eyes to bless him with their holy calm. Sweet thoughts, they made her eyes as sweet. How quiet are the hands that wove those pleasant bands, but that they do not rise and sink with his calm breathing, I should think that he were dropped asleep. Alas, too deep too deep is this his slumber time scarce can number the years ere he will wake again oh may we see his eyelids open then O oh, stern word nevermore as the airy gossamer floating in the sunlight clear where air it toucheth clingeth tightly round glossy leaf or stump unsightly so from his spirit wandered out tendrils spreading all about, knitting all things to its thrall with a perfect love of all, O oh, stern word, nevermore. He did but float a little way adown the stream of time, with dreamy eyes watching the ripples play or listening their fairy chime. His slender sail near felt the gale, he did but float a little way, and putting to the shore while yet twas early day, went calmly on his way to dwell with us no more. No jarring did he feel, no grating on his vessel's keel. A strip of silver sand mingled the waters with the land where he was seen no more. O oh, stern word, nevermore. Full short his journey was. No dust of earth unto his sandals clave. The weary wake that old men must, he bore not to the grave. He seemed a cherub who had lost his way and wandered hither, so his stay with us was short. 
and twas most meet that he should be no delver in earth's clod nor need to pause and cleanse his feet to stand before his god o oh, blessed word evermore end of poem this reading is in the public domain sirens by james russell lowell read for LibriVox.org by eric burns bozeman montana the sirens the sea is lonely the sea is dreary the sea is restless and uneasy thou seekest quiet thou art weary wandering thou knowest not whither our little isle is green and breezy come and rest thee oh come hither come to this peaceful home of ours where evermore the low west wind creeps panting up the shore to be at rest among the flowers full of rest the green moss lifts as the dark waves of the sea draw in and out of rocky rifts calling solemnly to thee with voices deep and hollow to the shore follow oh follow to be at rest forevermore forevermore look how the gray old ocean from the depth of his heart rejoices heaving with a gentle motion when he hears our restful voices listen how he sings in an undertone chiming with our melody and all sweet sounds of earth and air melt into one low voice alone that murmurs over the weary sea and seems to sing from everywhere here mayst thou harbor peacefully here mayst thou rest from the aching oar turn thy curved prow ashore and in our green isle rest forevermore forevermore and echo half wakes in the wooded hill and to her heart so calm and deep murmurs over in her sleep doubtfully pausing and murmuring still evermore thus on life's weary sea heareth the marinery voices sweet from far and near ever singing low and clear ever singing longingly is it not better here to be than to be toiling late and soon in the dreary night to see nothing but the blood-red moon go up and down into the sea or in the loneliness of day to see the still seals only solemnly lift their faces gray making it yet more lonely is it not better than to hear only the sliding of the wave beneath the plank and feel so near a cold and lonely grave a restless grave where thou shalt lie even in death unquietly look down beneath thy wave-worn bark lean over the side and see the leaden eye of the sidelong shark upturned patiently ever waiting there for thee look down and see those shapeless forms which ever keep their dreamless sleep far down within the gloomy deep and only stir themselves in storms rising like islands from beneath and snorting through the angry spray as the frail vessel perisheth and the whirls of their unwieldy play look down look down upon the seaweed slimy and dark that waves its arms so lank and brown beckoning for thee look down beneath thy wave-worn bark into the cold depth of the sea look down look down thus on life's lonely sea heareth the marinery voices sad from far and near ever singing full of fear ever singing drearfully here all is pleasant as a dream the wind scarce shaketh down the dew the green grass floweth like a stream into the ocean's blue listen oh listen here is a gush of many streams a song of many birds and every wish and longing seems lulled to a numbered flow of words listen oh listen here ever hum the golden bees underneath full blossomed trees at once with glowing fruit and flowers crowned the sand is so smooth the yellow sand that thy keel will not grate as it touches the land all around with a slumberous sound the singing waves slide up the strand and there where the smooth wet pebbles be the waters gurgle longingly as if they fain would seek the shore to be at rest from the ceaseless roar 
to be at rest forevermore, forevermore. Thus on life's gloomy sea heareth the marinery, voices sweet from far and near ever singing in his ear, Here is rest and peace for thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. by James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org by Lois Beachy Yoder, Charlotte, North Carolina. Hers is a spirit deep and crystal clear, calmly beneath her earnest face it lies, free without boldness, meek without a fear, quicker to look than speak its sympathies, Far down into her large and patient eyes I gaze, deep drinking of the infinite, as in the mid-watch of a clear still night I look into the fathomless blue skies. So circled lives she with love's holy light, that from the shade of self she walketh free. The garden of her soul still keepeth she in Eden where the snake did never enter, she hath a natural wise sincerity a simple truthfulness and these have lent her a dignity as moveless as the center so that no influence of earth can stir her steadfast courage nor can take away the holy peacefulness which night and day unto her queenly soul doth minister most gentle is she her large charity an all unwitting childlike gift in her not freer is to give than meek to bear and though herself not unacquaint with care hath in her heart wide room for all that be her heart that hath no secrets of its own but open is as eglantine full bloom cloudless forever is her brow serene speaking calm hope and trust within her whence welleth a noiseless spring of patience that keepeth her life so fresh so green and full of holiness that every look the greatness of her woman's soul revealing unto me bringeth blessing and a feeling as when i read in god's own holy book a graciousness in giving that doth make the smallest gift greatest and a sense most meek of worthiness that doth not fear to take from others, but which always fears to speak its thanks in utterance for the giver's sake. The deep religion of a thankful heart, which rests instinctively in heaven's law, with a full peace that never can depart from its own steadfastness, a holy awe for holy things, not those which men call holy, but such as are revealed to the eyes of a true woman's soul bent down and lowly before the face of daily mysteries a love that blossoms soon but ripens slowly to the full goldenness of fruitful prime enduring with a firmness that defies all shallow tricks of circumstance and time by a sure insight knowing where to cling and where it clingeth never withering. These are Irene's dowry, which no fate can shake from her serene, deep-builded state. In seeing sympathy is hers, which chasteneth no less than loveth, scorning to be bound with fear of blame, and yet which ever hasteneth to pour the balm of kind looks on the wound, if they be wounds which such sweet teaching makes giving itself a pang for others' sakes. No want of faith that chills with sidelong eye hath she, no jealousy, no Levite pride that passeth by upon the other side, for in her soul there never dwelt a lie. Right from the hand of God her spirit came unstained, and she hath ne'er forgotten whence it came, nor wandered far from thence, but laboreth to keep her still the same near to her place of birth that she may not soil her white raiment with an earthly spot 
Yet sets she not her soul so steadily above that she forgets her ties to earth, but her whole thought would almost seem to be how to make glad one lowly human heart. For with a gentle courage she doth strive in thought and word and feeling so to live as to make earth next heaven, and her heart herein doth show its most exceeding worth, that bearing in our frailty her just part, she hath not shrunk from evils of this life, but hath gone calmly forth into the strife, and all its sins and sorrows hath withstood with lofty strength of patient womanhood. For this I love her great soul more than all, that being bound like us with earthly thrall, she walks so bright and heaven-like therein, too wise, too meek, too womanly to sin. Like a lone star through riven storm clouds seen by sailors tempest-tossed upon the sea, telling of rest and peaceful heavens nigh, unto my soul her star-like soul hath been. Her sight is full of hope and calm to me, for she unto herself hath builded high a home serene, wherein to lay her head, earth's noblest thing, a woman perfected. 1840. End of poem. by james russell lowell read for LibriVox.org by leonard wilson of springfield ohio from the close shut windows gleams no spark the night is chilly the night is dark the poplars shiver the pine trees moan my hair by the autumn breeze is blown under thy window i sing alone 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 ah woe alone the darkness is pressing coldly around the windows shake with a lonely sound the stars are hid and the night is drear the heart of silence throbs in thine ear in thy chamber thou sittest alone 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 ah woe alone the world is happy, the world is wide, Kind hearts are beating on every side. Ah, why should we lie so coldly curled, Alone in the shell of this great world? Why should we any more be alone? Alone, alone, ah, woe, alone. Oh, tis a bitter and dreary word, the saddest by man's ear ever heard we each are young we each have a heart why stand we ever coldly apart must we forever then be alone 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 ah woe alone end of poem this recording is in the public domain Pressed Flower by James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. This little flower from afar hath come from other lands to thine, for once its white and drooping star could see its shadow in the Rhine. Perchance some fair-haired German maid hath plucked one from the self-same stalk, and numbered over half afraid, its petals in her evening walk. He loves me, loves me not, she cries. He loves me more than earth or heaven. And then glad tears have filled her eyes to find the number was uneven. And thou must count its petals well, because it is a gift from me and the last one of all shall tell something I've often told to thee. But here at home, where we were born, thou wilt find flowers just as true, 
down bending every summer morn with freshness of new england dew for nature ever kind to love hath granted them the same sweet tongue whether with german skies above or here our granite rocks among and a poem this recording is in the public domain by james russell lowell read for librivox dot org by sonia the beggar a beggar through the world am i from place to place i wander by fill up my pilgrim script for me for christ's sweet sake and charity a little of thy steadfastness round it with leafy gracefulness old oak give me that the world's blast may round me blow and i yield gently to and fro while my stout-hearted trunk below and firm-set roots unshaken be some of thy stern unyielding might enduring still through day and night rude tempest shock and withering blight that i may keep at bay the changeful april sky of chance and the strong tide of circumstance give me old granite gray some of thy pensiveness serene some of thy never dying green put in this scrip of mine that griefs may fall like snowflakes light and deck me in a robe of white ready to be an angel bright o sweetly mournful pine a little of thy merriment of thy sparkling light content give me my cheerful brook that i may still be full of glee and gladsomeness wherever i be though fickle fate hath prisoned me in some neglected nook ye have been very kind and good to me since i've been in the wood ye have gone nigh to fill my heart but good-bye kind friends every one i far to go ye said of sun of all good things i would have part the day was high ere i could start and so my journey scarce begun heaven help me how could i forget to beg of thee dear violet some of thy modesty that blossoms here as well unseen as if before the world thou hadst been o oh, give to strengthen me eighteen thirty nine end of poem this recording is in the public domain love by james russell lowell read for librivox dot org by lois beachy yoder charlotte north carolina September 10th, 2015. Not as all other women are, is she that to my soul is dear. Her glorious fancies come from far, beneath the silver evening star, and yet her heart is ever near. Great feelings hath she of her own, which lesser souls may never know. God giveth them to her alone, and sweet they are as any tone wherewith the wind may choose to blow. Yet in herself she dwelleth not, although no home were half so fair, no simplest duty is forgot, life hath no dim and lowly spot that doth not in her sunshine share. She doeth little kindnesses, which most leave undone or despise, for naught that sets one heart at ease and giveth happiness or peace is low esteemed in her eyes. She hath no scorn of common things, and though she seem of other birth, round us her heart entwines and clings, and patiently she folds her wings to tread the humble paths of earth. Blessing she is, God made her so, and deeds of weekday holiness fall from her noiseless as the snow, nor hath she ever chanced to know that aught were easier than to bless. She is most fair, and thereunto her life doth rightly harmonize. Feeling or thought that was not true ne'er made less beautiful the blue unclouded heaven of her eyes. She is a woman, one in whom the springtime of her childish years hath never lost its fresh perfume, 
though knowing well that life hath room for many blights and many tears. I love her with a love as still as a broad river's peaceful might, which by high tower and lowly mill goes wandering at its own will, and yet doth ever flow aright. And on its full deep breast serene, like quiet isles my duties lie, it flows around them and between, and makes them fresh and fair and green, sweet homes wherein to live and die. 1840 End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Summer Storm by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Lois B. Yoder, Charlotte, North Carolina, September 8, 2015 Untremulous in the river clear, toward the sky's image hangs the imaged bridge so still the air that I can hear the slender clarion of the unseen midge. Out of the stillness with a gathering creep, like rising wind in leaves, which now decreases, now lulls, now swells, and all the while increases. The huddling trample of a drove of sheep tilts the loose planks, and then as gradually ceases in dust on the other side. Life's emblem deep, a confused noise between two silences, finding at last in dust precarious peace. On the wide marsh the purple-blossomed grasses soak up the sunshine. Sleeps the brimming tide, save when the wedge-shaped wake in silence passes of some slow water-rat whose sinuous glide wavers the long green sedge's shade from side to side. But up the west, like a rock-shivered surge, climbs a great cloud edged with sun-whitened spray. Huge whirls of foam boil, toppling o'er its verge, and falling still it seems, and yet it climbs all way. Suddenly all the sky is hid as with the shutting of a lid. One by one great drops are falling, doubtful and slow. Down the pane they are crookedly crawling, and the wind breathes low. Slowly the circles widen on the river widen and mingle one and all here and there the slender flowers shiver struck by an icy raindrop's fall now on the hills i hear the thunder mutter the wind is gathering in the west the upturned leaves first whiten and flutter then droop to a fitful rest up from the stream with sluggish flap struggles the gall and floats away. Nearer and nearer rolls the thunderclap. We shall not see the sun go down today. Now leaps the wind on the sleepy marsh and tramples the grass with terrified feet. The startled river turns leaden and harsh. You can hear the quick heart of the tempest beat. Look, look, that livid flash! and instantly follows the rattling thunder, as if some cloud crag split asunder fell splintering with a tumultuous crash on the earth, which crouches in silence under. And now a solid gray wall of rain shuts off the landscape, mile by mile. For a breath's space I see the blue wood again, and ere the next heartbeat, the wind-hurled pile that seemed but now a league aloof bursts crackling o'er the sun-parched roof. Against the windows the storm comes dashing, through tattered foliage the hail tears crashing. The blue lightning flashes, the rapid hail clashes, the white waves are tumbling, and in one baffled roar, like the toothless sea mumbling a rock-bristled shore, the thunder is rumbling and crashing and crumbling. Will silence return nevermore? Hush! Still as death, the tempest holds his breath. 
as from a sudden will. The rain stops short, but from the eaves you see it drop and hear it from the leaves. All is so bodingly still. Again now, now again, flashes the rain in heavy gouts. The crinkled lightning seems ever brightening, and loud and long again the thunder shouts his battle song. One quivering flash, one wildering crash, followed by silence dead and dull, as if the cloud let go, leaped bodily below to whelm the earth in one mad overthrow, and then a total lull. Gone, gone so soon, no more my half-crazed fancy there can shape a giant in the air, no more I see his streaming hair, the writhing portent of his form. The pale and quiet moon makes her calm forehead bare. And the last fragments of the storm, like shattered rigging from a fight at sea, silent and few, are drifting over me. 1839 End of poem this recording is in the public domain. By James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org, by Larry Wilson. True love is but a humble, low-born thing, and hath its food served up in earthenware. It is a thing to walk with hand in hand, through the everydayness of this workday world bearing its tender feet to every roughness yet letting not one heartbeat go astray from beauty's law of plainness and content a simple fireside thing whose quiet smile can warm earth's poorest hovel to a home which when our autumn cometh as it must and life in the chill wind shivers bare and leafless shall still be blessed with indian summer youth in bleak november and with thankful hearts smile on its ample stores of garnered fruit as full of sunshine to our aged eyes as when it nursed the blossoms of our spring such is true love which steals into the heart with feet as silent as the lightsome dawn that kisses smooth the rough brows of the dark and hath its will through blissful gentleness not like a rocket which with savage glare whirs suddenly up then bursts and leaves the night painfully quivering on the dazed eyes a love that gives and takes that seeth false not with flaw-seeking eyes like needle points but loving kindly ever looks them down with the o'ercoming faith of meek forgiveness a love that shall be new and fresh each hour as is the golden mystery of sunset or the sweet coming of the evening star alike and yet most unlike every day and seeing every best and fairest now a love that doth not kneel for what it seeks but faces truth and beauty as their peer showing its worthiness of noble thoughts by a clear sense of inward nobleness a love that in its object findeth not all grace and beauty and enough to sate its thirst of blessing but in all of good found there it sees but heaven granted types of good and beauty in the soul of man and traces in the simplest heart that beats a family likeness to its chosen one that claims of it the rights of brotherhood for love is blind but with the fleshly eye that so its inner sight may be more clear and outward shows a beauty only so are needful at first as a hand to guide and to uphold an infant's steps great spirits need them not their earnest look pierces the body's mask of thin disguise and beauty is ever to them revealed behind the unshapeliest meanest lump of clay with arms outstretched and eager face ablaze yearning to be but understood and loved eighteen forty end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Perdita Singing by James Russell Lowell 
Read for LibriVox.org by Lois Beachy Yoder, Charlotte, North Carolina, November 12, 2015. Thy voice is like a fountain leaping up in clear moonshine, silver, silver, ever mounting, ever sinking without thinking to that brimful heart of thine. Every sad and happy feeling thou hast had in bygone years through thy lips come stealing, stealing, clear and low. All thy smiles and all thy tears in thy voice awaken, and sweetness wove of joy and woe. From their teaching it hath taken feeling and music moved together. Like a swan and shadow ever heaving on a sky-blue river in a day of cloudless weather. It hath caught a touch of sadness, yet it is not sad. It hath tones of clearest gladness, yet it is not glad. A dim, sweet twilight voice it is, where today's accustomed blue is overgrayed with memories, with starry feelings quivered through. Thy voice is like a fountain leaping up in sunshine bright, and I never weary counting its clear droppings, lone and single, or when in one full gush they mingle, shooting in melodious light. Thine is music such as yields feelings of old brooks and fields, and around this pent-up room sheds a woodland free perfume. Oh, thus forever sing to me, oh, thus forever. The green bright grass of childhood brings to me, flowing like an emerald river, and the bright blue skies above. Oh, sing them back as fresh as ever into the bosom of my love. The sunshine and the merriment, the unsought evergreen content of that never cold time, the joy that like a clear breeze went through and through the old time. Peace sits within thine eyes, with white hands crossed in joyful rest while through thy lips and face arise the melodies from out thy breast. She sits and sings with folded wings and white arms crossed. Weep not for passed things, they are not lost. The beauty which the summer time or thine opening spirit shed, the forest oracles sublime that filled thy soul with joyous dread, the scent of every smallest flower that made thy heart sweet for an hour. Yea, every holy influence flowing to thee, thou knewest not whence, in thine eyes today is seen, fresh as it hath ever been. Promptings of nature, beckoning sweet, whatever led thy childish feet still will linger unawares the guiders of thy silver hairs. Every look and every word which thou givest forth today tell of the singing of the bird whose music stilled thy boyish play. Thy voice is like a fountain twinkling up in sharp starlight when the moon behind the mountain dims the low east with faintest white, ever darkling, ever sparkling. We know not if tis dark or bright, but when the great moon hath rolled round, and sudden slow its solemn power grows from behind its black clear-edged bound. No spot of dark the fountain keepeth, but swift as opening eyelids leapeth into a waving silver flower. 1841 End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. by James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. My soul was like the sea before the moon was made, moaning in vague immensity of its own strength afraid, unrestful and unstayed. Through every rift it foamed in vain about its earthly prison, seeking some unknown thing in pain and sinking restless back again. For yet no moon had risen, its only voice a vast dumb moan of utterless anguish speaking. It lay unhopefully alone, 
and lived but in an aimless seeking so was my soul but when twas full of unrest and o'erloading a voice of something beautiful whispered a dim foreboding and yet so soft so sweet so low it had not more of joy than woe and as the sea doth oft lie still making its waters meet as if by an unconscious will for the moon's silver feet so lay my soul within mine eyes when thou its guardian moon didst rise and now how o'er its waves above may toss and seem uneaseful one strong eternal law of love with guidance sure and peaceful as calm and natural as breath moves its great deeps through life and death end of poem this recording is in the public domain music by james russell lowell read for LibriVox.org by leonard wilson of springfield ohio a fragment thick rushing like an ocean vast of bisons the far prairie shaking the notes crowd heavily and fast as surfs one plunging while the last draws seaward from its foamy breaking or in low murmurs they began rising and rising momently as o'er a harp aeolian a fitful breeze until they ran up to a sudden ecstasy and then like minute drops of rain ringing in water silvery they lingering dropped and dropped again till it was almost like a pain to listen when the next would be and a poem this recording is in the public domain song by james russell lowell read for LibriVox.org by leonard wilson of springfield ohio to m l a lily thou wast when i saw thee first a lily bud not opened quite that hourly grew more pure and white by morning and noontide and evening nursed in all of nature thou hadst thy share thou wast waited on by the wind and sun the rain and the dew for thee took care it seemed thou never couldst be more fair a lily thou wast when i saw thee first a lily bud but oh how strange how full of wonder was the change when ripe with all sweetness thy full bloom burst how did the tears to my glad eyes start when the woman flower reached its blossoming hour and i saw the warm deeps of thy golden heart glad death may pluck thee but never before the gold dust of thy bloom divine hath dropped from thy heart into mine to quicken its faint germs of heavenly lore for no breeze comes nigh thee but carries away some impulses bright of fragrance and light which fall upon souls that are lone and astray to plant fruitful hopes of the flower of day End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Gra by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. I would more natures were like thine that never casts a glance before thou hebe who thy heart's bright wine so lavishly to all dost pour that we who drink forget to pine and can but dream of bliss in store thou canst not see a shade in life with sunward instinct thou dost rise 
and leaving clouds below at strife gazest undazzled at the skies with all their blazing splendors rife a songful lark with eagle's eyes thou wast some foundling whom the hours nursed laughing with the milk of mirth some influence more gay than ours hath ruled thy nature from its birth as if thy natal stars were flowers that shook their seeds round thee on earth and thou to lull thine infant rest was cradled like an indian child all pleasant winds from south and west with lullabies thine ears beguiled rocking thee in thine oriole's nest till nature looked at thee and smiled thine every fancy seems to borrow a sunlight from thy childish years making a golden cloud of sorrow a hope-lit rainbow out of tears thy heart is certain of to-morrow though yon to-day it never peers i would more natures were like thine so innocently wild and free whose sad thoughts even leap and shine like sunny wavelets in the sea making us mindless of the brine in gazing on the brilliancy and a poem this recording is in the public domain by james russell lowell read for librivox dot org by leonard wilson of springfield ohio into the sunshine full of the light leaping and flashing from morn till night into the moonlight whiter than snow waving so flower-like when the winds blow into the starlight rushing in spray happy at midnight happy by day ever in motion blithesome and cheery still climbing heavenward never a weary glad of all weathers still seeming best upward or downward motion thy rest full of a nature nothing can tame changed every moment ever the same ceaseless aspiring ceaseless content darkness or sunshine thy element glorious fountain let my heart be fresh changeful constant upward like thee end of poem this recording is in the public domain by james russell lowell read for LibriVox.org by Chris Bars February 8, 2016 Part 1 In the old days of awe and keen-eyed wonder, the poet's song with blood-warm truth was rife. He saw the mysteries which circle under the outward shell and skin of daily life. Nothing to him were fleeting time and fashion, his soul was led by eternal law. There was in him no hope of fame, no passion, but with calm, godlike eyes he only saw. He did not sire, O oh, heroes dead and buried, chief mourner at the golden age's hearse, nor deem that souls whom Charon grim had ferried alone were fitting themes of epic verse. He could believe the promise of tomorrow, and feel the wondrous meaning of today. He had a deeper faith in holy sorrow than the world's seeming loss could take away. To know the heart of all things was his duty. All things did sing to him to make him wise, and with a sorrowful and conquering beauty, the soul of all looked grandly from his eyes. He gazed on all within him and without him. He watched the flowing of time's steady tide, and shapes of glory floated all about him, and whispered to him, and he prophesied. Then all men he more fearless was and freer, and all his brethren cried, and with one accord 
Behold the holy man, behold the seer, him who hath spoken with the unseen Lord. He to his heart with large embrace had taken the universal sorrow of mankind, and from that root a shelter never shaken, a tree of wisdom grew and sturdy rind. He could interpret well the wondrous voices, which to the calm and silent spring come. He knew that one soul no more rejoices in the star's anthem that the insects hum. He in his heart was ever meek and humble, and yet with kingly pomp his numbers ran, as he foresaw how all things false should crumble before the free, uplifted soul of man. And, when he was made full to overflowing, with all the loveliness of heaven and earth, out rushed his song like molten iron glowing, to show God sitting by the humblest hearth. With the calmest courage he was ever ready, to teach the action was the truth of thought, and, with strong arm and purpose firm and steady, an anchor for the drifting world he wrought. So he did make the meanest man partaker of all the brother gods unto him gave. All souls did reverence him and name him maker, and when he died heaped temples on his grave. And still his deathless words of light are swimming, serene throughout the great deep infinite of human soul, unwaning and undimming, to cheer and guide the mariner at night. Part two. But now the poet is an empty rhymer, who lies with idle elbow on the grass, and fits his singing like a cunning timer to all men's prides and fancies as they pass. Not his the song, which in its meter holy chimes with the music of eternal stars, humbling the tyrant, lifting up the lowly, and sending sun through the soul's prison bars. Maker no more, oh no, unmaker rather, for he unmakes who doth not all put forth. The power given by our loving Father, to show the body's dross, the spirit's worth. Awake, great spirit of the ages olden, shiver the mists that hide thy starry lyre and let man's soul be yet again beholden, to thee for wings to soar to her desire. O prophecy, no more to-morrow's splendor, be no more shame-faced to speak out for truth. Lay on her altar all the gushings tender, the hope, the fire, the loving faith of youth. O prophecy, no more the Maker's coming, Say not this onward footsteps thou canst hear in the dim void, like to the awful humming of the great wings of some new lighted sphere. O prophecy, no more, but be the poet, this longing but was granted unto thee, and that when all beauty thou couldst feel and know it, that beauty in its highest thou couldst be. O thou who moanest tossed with sea-like longings, who dimly hearest voices call on thee, with soul is overfilled with mighty throngings of love and fear and glorious agony. Though of the toil-strung hands and iron sinews and soul by Mother Earth with freedom fed, in whom the hero spirit yet continues, the old free nature is not chained or dead. Arouse, let thy soul break in music thunder, let loose the ocean that is in thee pent. Pour forth thy hope, thy fear, thy love, thy wonder, and tell the age what all its signs have meant. Where thy wildered crowd of brethren jostles, where there lingers but a shade of wrong. There still is need of martyrs and apostles. There still are text for never-dying song. From age to age 
man's still aspiring spirit, finds wider scope and sees with clearer eyes, and thou in larger measure dost inherit what made thy great forerunners free and wise. Sit thou, enthroned where the poet's mountain above the thunder lifts its silent peak, and roll thy sounds down like a gathering fountain, that all may drink and find the rest they seek. Sing, there shall silence grow in earth and heaven, a silence of deep awe and wondering, for listening gladly bend the angels, even, to hear a mortal like an angel sing. Part 3 among the toil-worn poor, my soul is seeking for one to bring the Maker's name to light, to be the voice of that Almighty speaking, which every age demands to do it right. Proprieties are silken bards environ. He who would be the tongue of this wide land must string his harp with cords of sturdy iron and strike it with a toil-embrowned hand. One who hath dwelt with nature well attended, Who hath learnt wisdom from her mystic books, Whose soul with all her countless lives hath blended, So that all beauty awes us in his looks. Who not with body's waste his soul hath pampered, Who as the clear northwestern wind is free, Who walks with forms observances unhampered, and follows the one will obediently, whose eyes like windows on a breezy summit control a lovely prospect every way, who doth not sound God's sea with earthly plummet and find a bottom still of worthless clay, who heeds not how the lower gusts are working, knowing that one sure wind blows on above and sees beneath the foulest faces lurking, one God-built shrine of reverence and love, who sees all stars that wheel their shiny marches around the center fixed of destiny, where the encircling soul serene or arches the moving globe of being like a sky who feels that God and heaven's great deeps are nearer, him to whose heart his fellow man is nigh, who doth not hold his soul's own freedom dearer than that of all his brethren low and high, who to the right can feel himself the truer for being gently patient with the wrong, who sees a brother in the evildoer and finds in love the heart's blood of his song. This is he for whom the world is waiting, to sing the beatings of its mighty heart. Too long hath it been patient with the grating of scrannel pipes and heard it misnamed art. To him the smiling soul of man shall listen, laying a while its crown of thorns aside, and once again in every eye shall glisten the glory of a nature satisfied. His verse shall have a great commanding motion, heaving and swelling with a melody, learnt of the sky, the river, and the ocean, and all the pure majestic things that be. Awake then thou, we pine for thy great presence to make us feel the soul once more sublime. We are of far too infinite an essence to rest contented with the lies of time. Speak out, and lo, a hush of deepest wonder shall sink o'er all this many-voiced scene, as when a sudden burst of rattling thunder shatters the blueness of a sky serene. 1841 End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. by James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. 
Where is the true man's fatherland? Is it where he by chance is born? Doth not the yearning spirit scorn in such scant borders to be spanned? Oh, yes, his fatherland must be as the blue heaven, wide and free. Is it alone where freedom is, where God is God and man is man? Doth he not claim a broader span for the soul's love of home than this? Oh, yes, his fatherland must be as the blue heaven, wide and free. Where'er a human heart doth wear joy's myrtle wreath or sorrow's jives, where'er a human spirit strives after a life more true and fair, there is the true man's birthplace grand. His is a world-wide fatherland. Where'er a single slave doth pine, where'er one man may help another, thank God for such a birthright, brother. That spot of earth is thine and mine. There is the true man's birthplace grand. His is a world-wide fatherland. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Forlorn by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Lois Beachy Yoder, Charlotte, North Carolina September 17, 2015 The night is dark, the stinging sleet swept by the bitter gusts of air drives whistling down the lonely street and stiffens on the pavement bare the street lamps flare and struggle dim through the white sleek clouds as they pass or governed by a boisterous whim drop down and rattle on the glass one poor heartbroken outcast girl faces the east wind's searching flaws and as about her heart they whirl her tattered cloak more tightly draws the flat brick walls look cold and bleak her bare feet to the sidewalk freeze yet dares she not a shelter seek though faint with hunger and disease the sharp storm cuts her forehead bare and piercing through her garments thin beats on her shrunken breast and there makes colder the cold heart within she lingers where a ruddy glow streams outward through an open shutter adding more bitterness to woe more loneliness to desertion utter one half the cold she had not felt until she saw this gush of light spread warmly forth and seemed to melt its slow way through the deadening night she hears a woman's voice within singing sweet words her childhood knew and years of misery and sin furl off and leave her heaven blue her freezing heart like one who sinks out wearied in the drifting snow drowses to deadly sleep and thinks no longer of its hopeless woe old fields and clear blue summer days old meadows green with grass and trees that shimmer through the trembling haze and whiten in the western breeze old faces all the friendly past rises within her heart again and sunshine from her childhood cast makes summer of the icy rain and haloed by a mild warm glow from all humanity apart she hears old footsteps wandering slow through the lone chambers of her heart outside the porch before the door her cheek upon the cold hard stone she lies no longer foul and poor no longer dreary and alone next morning something heavily against the opening door did weigh and there from sin and sorrow free a woman on the threshold lay a smile upon the one lips told that she had found a calm release 
and that from out the want and cold the song had borne her soul in peace. For whom the heart of man shuts out, sometimes the heart of God takes in, and fences them all round about with silence mid the world's loud din. And one of his great charities is music, and it does not scorn to close the lids upon the eyes of the polluted and forlorn. Far was she from her childhood's home, farther in guilt had wandered thence. Yet thither it had bid her come to die in maiden innocence, 1842. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Night by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. The moon shines white and silent on the mist, which, like a tide of some enchanted ocean, o'er the wide marsh doth glide, spreading its ghost like billows silently far and wide. A vague and starry magic makes all things mysteries and lures the earth's dumb spirit up to the longing skies. I seem to hear dim whispers and tremulous replies. The fireflies o'er the meadow in pulses come and go, the elm tree's heavy shadow weighs on the grass below, and faintly from the distance the dreaming cock doth crow. All things look strange and mystic, the very bushes swell and take wild shapes and motions, as if beneath a spell. They seem not the same lilacs from childhood known so well. The snow of deepest silence o'er everything doth fall, so beautiful and quiet, and yet so like a pall as if all life were ended and rest were come to all o oh, wild and wondrous midnight there is a might in thee to make the charmed body almost like spirit be and give it some faint glimpses of immortality end of poem this recording is in the public domain A Prayer by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio God, do not let my loved one die, but rather wait until the time that I am grown in purity enough to enter thy pure clime. Then take me, I will gladly go, so that my love remain below oh let her stay she is by birth what i through death must learn to be we need her more on our poor earth than thou canst need in heaven with thee she hath her wings already i must burst this earth shell ere i fly then god take me we shall be near more near than ever each to each her angel ears will find more clear my heavenly than my earthly speech. And still, as I draw nigh to thee, her soul and mine shall closer be. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Heritage by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. The rich man's son inherits lands and piles of brick and stone and gold, and he inherits soft white hands and tender flesh that fears the cold, nor dares to wear a garment old. A heritage, it seems to me, one scarce would wish to hold in fee. The rich man's son inherits cares, 
the bank may break the factory burn a breath may burst his bubble shares and soft white hands could hardly earn a living that would serve his turn a heritage it seems to me one scarce would wish to hold in fee the rich man's son inherits wants his stomach craves for dainty fare with sated heart he hears the pants of toiling hinds with brown arms bare and wearies in his easy chair a heritage it seems to me one scarce would wish to hold in fee what doth the poor man's son inherit stout muscles and a sinewy heart a hardy frame a hardier spirit king of two hands he does his part in every useful toil and art a heritage it seems to me a king might wish to hold in fee what does the poor man's son inherit wishes or joyed with humble things a rank adjudged by toil one merit content that from employment springs a heart that in his labours sings a heritage it seems to me a king might wish to hold in fee what does the poor man's son inherit a patience learned of being poor courage if sorrow come to bear it a fellow feeling that is sure to make the outcast bless his door a heritage it seems to me a king might wish to hold in fee o oh, rich man's son there is a toil that with all others level stands large charity doth never soil but only whiten soft white hands this is the best crop from thy lands a heritage it seems to be worth being rich to hold in fee o poor man's son scorn not thy state there is worse weariness than thine in merely being rich and great toil only gives the soul to shine and makes rest fragrant and benign a heritage it seems to me worth being poor to hold in fee both heirs to some six feet of sod are equal in the earth at last both children of the same dear god prove title to your heirship vast by record of a well-filled past a heritage it seems to be well worth a life to hold in fee End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Ballad by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. One. In his tower sat the poet, gazing on the roaring sea take this rose he sighed and throw it where there's none that loveth me on the rock the billow bursteth and sinks back into the seas but in vain my spirit thirsteth so to burst and be at ease take o oh sea the tender blossom that hath lain against my breast on thy black and angry bosom it will find a surer rest life is vain and love is hollow ugly death stands there behind hate and scorn and hunger follow him that toileth for his kind forth into the night he hurled it and with bitter smile did mark how the surly tempest whirled it swift into the hungry dark foam and spray drive back to leeward and the gale with dreary moan drifts the helpless blossom seaward through the breakers all alone two stands a maiden on the morrow musing by the wave-beat strand half in hope and half in sorrow tracing words upon the sand 
shall i ever then behold him who hath been my life so long ever to this sick heart fold him be the spirit of his song touch not see the blessed letters i have traced upon thy shore spare his name whose spirit fetters mine with love for evermore swells the tide and overflows it but with omen pure and meet brings a little rose and throws it humbly at the maiden's feet full of bliss she takes the token and upon her snowy breast soothes the ruffled petals broken with the ocean's fierce unrest love is thine o heart and surely peace shall also be thine own for the heart that trusteth purely never long can pine alone three in his tower sits the poet blisses new and strange to him fill his heart and overflow it with a wonder sweet and dim up the beach the ocean slideth with a whisper of delight and the moon in silence glideth through the peaceful blue of night rippling o'er the poet's shoulder flows a maiden's golden hair maiden lips with love grown bolder kiss his moonlit forehead bare life is love and love is power death all fetters doth unbind strength and wisdom only flower when we toil for all our kind hope is truth the future giveth more than present takes away and the soul forever liveth nearer god from day to day not a word the maiden uttered fullest hearts are slow to speak but a withered rose leaf fluttered down upon the poet's cheek and a poem this recording is in the public domain End of Brittany by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by John Burlinson Part First Fair as a summer's dream was Margaret, Such dream as in a poet's soul might start, Musing of old loves while the moon doth set. Her hair was not more sunny than her heart, though like a natural golden coronet it circled her dear head with careless art, mocking the sunshine that would fain have lent to its frank grace a richer ornament. His loved one's eyes could poet ever speak, so kind, so dewy, and so deep were hers. But while he strives, the choicest phrase too weak their glad reflection in his spirit blurs as one may see a dream dissolve and break out of his grasp when he to tell it stirs like that sad dryad doomed no more to bless the mortal who revealed her loveliness she dwelt forever in a region bright peopled with living fancies of her own where naught could come but visions of delight far far aloof from earth's eternal moan a summer cloud thrilled through with rosy light floating beneath the blue sky all alone her spirit wandered by itself and won a golden edge from some unsetting sun the heart grows richer that its lot is poor. God blesses want with larger sympathies. Love enters gladliest at the humble door, And makes the cot a palace with his eyes. So Margaret's heart a softer beauty wore, And grew in gentleness and patience wise, For she was but a simple herdsman's child, a lily chance sown in the rugged wild. There was no beauty of the wood or field, But she its fragrant bosom secret knew, 
nor any but to her would freely yield some grace that in her soul took root and grew nature to her glowed ever new revealed all rosy fresh with innocent morning dew and looked into her heart with dim sweet eyes that left it full of sylvan memories oh what a face was hers to brighten light and give back sunshine with an added glow to while each moment with a fresh delight and part of memory's best contentment grow oh how her voice as with an inmate's right into the strangest heart would welcome go and make it sweet and ready to become of white and gracious thoughts the chosen home none looked upon her but he straightway thought of all the greenest depths of country cheer and into each one's heart was freshly brought what was to him the sweetest time of year so was her every look and motion fraught with out-of-door delights and forest leer not the first violet on a woodland lea seemed more visible gift of spring than she is love learned only out of poets books is there not somewhat in the dropping flood and in the nunneries of silent nooks and in the murmured longing of the wood that could make margaret dream of lovelorn looks and stir a thrilling mystery in her blood more trembly secret than aurora's tear shed in the bosom of an eglatier full many a sweet forewarning hath the mind full many a whispering of vague desire ere comes the nature destined to unbind its virgin zone and all its deeps inspire low stirrings in the leaves before the wind wakes all the green strings of the forest lyre faint heatings in the calyx ere the rose its warm voluptuous breast doth all unclose long in its dim recesses pines the spirit wildered and dark despairingly alone though many a shape of beauty wander near it and many a wild and half-remembered tone tremble from the divine abyss to cheer it yet still it knows that there is only one before whom it can kneel and tribute bring at once a happy vassal and a king to feel a want yet scarce know what it is to seek one nature that is always new whose glance is warmer than another's kiss whom we can bear our inmost beauty to nor feel deserted afterwards for this but with our destined co-mate we can do such longing instinct fills the mighty scope of the young soul with one mysterious hope so margaret's heart grew brimming with the lore of love's enticing secrets and although she had found none to cast it down before yet off to fancy's chapel she would go to pay her vows and count the rosary o'er of her love's promised graces haply so miranda's hope had pictured ferdinand long ere the gaunt wave tossed him on the strand a new-made star that swims the lonely gloom unwedded yet and longing for the sun whose beams the bride gifts of the lavish groom blithely to crown the virgin planet run her being was watching to see the bloom of love's fresh sunrise roofing one by one its clouds with gold a triumph arch to be 
for him who came to hold her heart in fee not far from margaret's cottage dwelt a knight of the proud templars a sworn celibate whose heart in secret fed upon the light and dew of her ripe beauty through the grate of his close vow catching what gleams he might of the free heaven and cursing all too late the cruel faith whose black walls hemmed him in and turned life's crowning bliss to deadly sin for he had met her in the wood by chance and having drunk her beauty's wildering spell his heart shook like the pennon of a lance that quivers in a breeze's sudden swell and thenceforth in a close enfolded trance from mistily golden deep to deep he fell till earth did waver and fade far away beneath the hope in whose warm arms he lay a dark proud man he was whose half-blown youth had shed its blossoms even in opening leaving a few that with more winning ruth trembling around grave manhood's stem might cling more sad than cheery making in good sooth like the fringed gentian a late autumn spring a twilight nature braided light and gloom a youth half smiling by an open tomb fair as an angel who yet inly wore a wrinkled heart foreboding his near fall who saw him always wished to know him more as if he were some fate's defiant thrall and nursed a dreaded secret at its core little he loved but power most of all and that he seemed to scorn as one who knew by what foul paths men choose to crawl thereto he had been noble but some great deceit had turned his better instinct to a vice he strove to think the world was all a cheat that power and fame were cheap at any price, that the sure way of being shortly great was even to play life's game with loaded dice, since he had tried the honest play and found that vice and virtue differed but in sound. Yet Margaret's sight redeemed him for a space from his own thraldom, Man could never be a hypocrite when first such maiden grace smiled in upon his heart. The agony of wearing all day long a lying face fell lightly from him, and, a moment free, erect with wakened faith his spirit stood and scorned the weakness of its demon mood. Like a sweet wind-harp to him was her thought, Which would not let the common air come near, Till from its dim enchantment it had caught A musical tenderness that brimmed his ear With sweetness more ethereal than aught, Save silver drooping snatches, that will air Rained down from some sad angel's faithful harp, to cool her fallen lover's anguish sharp deep in the forest was a little dell high overarched with the leafy sweep of a broad oak through whose gnarled roots there fell a slender rill that sung itself asleep where its continuous toil had scooped a well to please the fairy folk Breathlessly deep the stillness was, Save when the dreaming brook From its small urn a drizzly murmur shook. The wooded hills sloped upward all around, 
with gradual rise and made an even rim so that it seemed a mighty cask unbound from some huge titan's brow to lighten him ages ago and left upon the ground where the slow soil had mossed it to the brim till after countless centuries it grew into this dell the haunt of noontide dew dim vistas sprinkled o'er with sun-flecked green wound through the thickest trunks on every side and toward the west in fancy might be seen a gothic window in its blazing pride when the low sun two arching elms between lit up the leaves beyond which autumn dyed with lavish hues would into splendour start shaming the laboured pains of richest art here leaning once against the old oak's trunk mordred for such was the young templar's name saw margaret come unseen the falcon shrunk from the meek dove sharp thrills of tingling flame made him forget that he was vowed a monk and all the outworks of his pride o'ercame flooded he seemed with bright delicious pain as if a star had burst within his brain such power hath beauty and frank innocence a flower bloomed forth that sunshine glad to bless even from his love's long leafless stem the sense of exile from hope's happy realm grew less and thoughts of childish peace he knew not whence thronged round his heart with many an old caress melting the frost there into pearly dew that mirrored back his nature's morning blue she turned and saw him but she felt no dread her purity like adamantine mail did so encircle her and yet her head she drooped and made her golden hair her veil through which a glow of rosiest lustre spread then faded and anon she stood all pale as snow o'er which a blush of northern light suddenly reddens and as soon grows white she thought of tristram and of lancelot of all her dreams and of kind fairy's might and how that dell was deemed a haunted spot until there grew a mist before her sight and where the present was she half forgot born backward through the realms of old delight then starting up awake she would have gone yet almost wished it might not be alone how they went home together through the wood and how all life seemed focused into one thought-dazzling spot that set ablaze the blood what need to tell fit language there is none for the heart's deepest things who ever wooed as in his boyish hope he would have done for when the soul is fullest the hushed tongue voicelessly trembles like a lute unstrung but all things carry the heart's messages and know it not nor doth the heart well know but nature hath her will even as the bees blithe go-betweens fly singing to and fro with the fruit quickening pollen hard if these found not some all unthought of way to show their secret each to each and so they did and one heart's flower dust into the other slid young hearts are free the selfish world it is that turns them miserly and cold as stone 
and makes them clutch their fingers on the bliss which but in giving truly is their own she had no dreams of barter asked not his but gave hers freely as she would have thrown a rose to him or as that rose gives forth its generous fragrance thoughtless of its worth her summer nature felt a need to bless, and a like longing to be blessed again. So, from her sky-like spirit, gentleness dropped over like a sunlit fall of rain, and his beneath drank in the bright caress as thirstily as would a parched plain, that long hath watched the showers of sloping grey forever ever falling far away how should she dream of ill the heart filled quite with sunshine like the shepherd's clock at noon closes its leaves around its warm delight whate'er in life is harsh or out of tune is all shut out no boding shade of light can pierce the opiate ether of its swoon. Love is but blind as thoughtful justice is, but naught can be so wanton blind as bliss. All beauty and all life he was to her. She questioned not his love. She only knew that she loved him and not a pulse could stir in her whole frame but quivered through and through with this glad thought and was a minister to do him fealty and service true like golden ripples hasting to the land to wreck their freight of sunshine on the strand o oh, dewy dawn of love O oh, hopes that are hung high like the cliff swallow's perilous nest, most like to fall when fullest, and that jar with every heavier billow. O oh, unrest than balmiest deeps of quiet sweeter far. How did ye triumph now in Margaret's breast, making it readier to shrink and start? than quivering gold of the pond lily's heart here let us pause oh would the soul might ever achieve its immortality in youth when nothing yet hath damped its high endeavour after the starry energy of truth here let us pause and for a moment sever this gleam of sunshine from the day's unruth that sometime come to all, for it is good to lengthen to the last a sunny mood. Part Second As one who from the sunshine and the green enters the solid darkness of a cave, nor knows what precipice or pit unseen may yawn before him with its sudden grave and with hushed breath doth often forward lean dreaming he hears the plashing of a wave dimly below or feels a damper air from out some dreary chasm he knows not where so from the sunshine and the green of love we enter on our story's darker part and though the horror of it may well move an impulse of repugnance in the heart yet let us think that as there is naught above the all-embracing atmosphere of art so also there is naught that falls below her generous reach though grimed with guilt and woe. Her fittest triumph is to show that good lurks in the heart of evil evermore, that love, though scorned and outcast and withstood, can without end forgive, and yet have store. God's love and man's are of the self-same blood, 
and he can see that always at the door of foulest hearts the angel nature yet knocks to return and cancel all its debt it ever is weak falsehood's destiny that her thick mask turns crystal to let through the unsuspicious eyes of honesty but margaret's heart was too sincere and true aught but plain truth and faithfulness to see and mordred's for a time a little grew to be like hers won by the mild reproof of those kind eyes that kept all doubt aloof full oft they met as dawn and twilight meet in northern climes she full of growing day as he of darkness which before her feet shrank gradual and faded quite away soon to return for power had made love sweet to him and when his will had gained full sway the taste began to pall for never power can sate the hungry soul beyond an hour he fell as doth the tempter ever fall even in the gaining of his loathsome end god does not work as man works but makes all the crooked paths of ill to goodness tend let him judge margaret if to be the thrall of love and faith too generous to defend its very life from him she loved be sin what hope of grace may the seducer win grim-hearted world that look'st with levite eyes on those poor fallen by too much faith in man she that upon thy freezing threshold lies starve to more sinning by thy savage ban seeking that refuge because foulest vice more godlike than thy virtue is whose span shuts out the wretched only is more free to enter heaven than thou wilt ever be thou wilt not let her wash thy dainty feet with such salt things as tears or with rude hair dry them soft pharisee that sits at meat with him who made her such and speaks to him fair leaving god's wandering lamb the while to bleat unheeded shivering in the pitiless air thou hast made prisoned virtue show more wan and haggard than a vice to look upon now many months flew by and weary grew to margaret the sight of happy things blight fell on all her flowers instead of dew shut round her heart were now the joyous wings wherewith it wont to soar yet not untrue though tempted much her woman's nature clings to its first pure belief and with sad eyes looks backward o'er the gate of paradise and so though altered mordred came less oft and winter frowned where spring had laughed before in his strange eyes yet half her sadness doffed and in her silent patience loved him more sorrow had made her soft heart yet more soft and a new life within her own she bore which made her tenderer as she felt it move beneath her breast a refuge for her love this babe she thought would surely bring him back and be a bond forever them between before its eyes the sullen tempest rack would fade and leave the face of heaven serene and love's return doth more than fill the lack which in his absence withered the heart's green and yet a dim foreboding still would flit between her and her hope to darken it she could not figure forth a happy fate 
even for this life from heaven so newly come the earth must needs be doubly desolate to him scarce parted from a fairer home such boding heavier on her bosom sat one night as standing in the twilight gloam she strained her eyes beyond that dizzy verge at whose foot faintly breaks the future's surge poor little spirit naught but shame and woe nurse the sick heart whose life-blood nurses thine yet not those only love hath triumphed so as for thy sake makes sorrow more divine and yet though thou be pure the world is foe to purity if born in such a shrine and having trampled it for struggling thence smiles to itself and calls it providence as thus she mused a shadow seemed to rise from out her thought and turn to dreariness all blissful hopes and sunny memories and the quick blood doth curdle up and press about her heart which seemed to shut its eyes and hush itself as who with shuddering guess harks through the gloom and dreads e'en now to feel through his hot breast the icy slide of steel but at the heartbeat while in dread she was in the low wind the honeysuckles gleam a dewy thrill flits through the heavy grass and looking forth she saw as in a dream within a wood the moonlight's shadowy mass night's starry heart yearning to hers doth seem and the deep sky full-hearted with the moon folds round her all the happiness of june what fear could face a heaven and earth like this what silveriest cloud could hang neath such a sky a tide of wondrous and unwonted bliss rolls back through all her pulses suddenly as if some seraph who had learned to kiss from the fair daughters of the world gone by had wedded so his fallen light with hers such sweet strange joy through soul and body stirs now seek we mordred he who did not fear the crime yet fears the latent consequence if it should reach a brother templar's ear it haply might be made a good pretence to cheat him of the hope he held most dear for he had spared no thoughts or deeds expense that by and by might help his wish to clip its darling bride the high grand mastership the apathy ere a crime resolved is done is scarce less dreadful than remorse for crime by no allurement can the soul be won from brooding o'er the weary creep of time mordred stole forth into the happy sun striving to hum a scrap of breton rhyme but the sky struck him speechless and he tried in vain to summon up his callous pride in the courtyard a fountain leaped all way a triton blowing jewels through his shell into the sunshine mordred turned away weary because the stone face did not tell of weariness nor could he bear to-day heart-sick to hear the patient sink and swell of winds among the leaves or golden bees drowsily humming in the orange trees all happy sights and sounds now came to him like a reproach he wandered far and wide following the lead of his unquiet whim but still there went a something at his side that made the cool breeze hot the sunshine dim it would not flee 
it could not be defied he could not see it but he felt it there by the damp chill that crept among his hair day wore at last the evening star arose and throbbing in the sky grew red and set then with a guilty wavering step he goes to the hid nook where they so oft had met in happier season for his heart well knows that he is sure to find poor margaret watching and waiting there with love-lorn breast around her young dreams rudely scattered nest why follow here that grim old chronicle which counts the dagger strokes and drops of blood enough that margaret by his mad steel fell unmoved by murder from her trusting mood smiling on him as heaven smiles on hell with a sad love remembering when he stood not fallen yet the unsealer of her heart of all her holy dreams the holiest part his crime complete scarce knowing what he did so goes the tale beneath the altar there in the high church the stiffening corpse he hid and then to scape that suffocating air like a scared ghoul out of the porch he slid but his strained eyes saw blood spots everywhere and ghastly faces thrust themselves between his soul and hopes of peace with blasting mien his heart went out within him like a spark dropped in the sea wherever he made bold to turn his eyes he saw all stiff and stark pale margaret lying dead the lavish gold of her loose hair seemed in the cloudy dark to spread a glory and a thousandfold more strangely pale and beautiful she grew her silence stabbed his conscience through and through or visions of past days a mother's eyes that smiled down on the fair boy at her knee whose happy upturned face to hers replies he saw sometimes or margaret mournfully gazed on him full of doubt as one who tries to crush belief that does love injury then she would wring her hands but soon again love's patience glimmered out through cloudy pain meanwhile he dared not go and steal away the silent dead cold witness of his sin he had not feared the life but that dull clay those open eyes that showed the death within would surely stare him mad yet all the day a dreadful impulse whence his will could win no refuge made him linger in the aisle freezing with his wan look each greeting smile now on the second day there was to be a festival in church from far and near came flocking in the sunburnt peasantry and knights and dames with stately antique cheer blazing with pomp as if all fairy had emptied her quaint halls or as it were the illuminated marge of some old book while we were gazing life and motion took when all were entered and the roving eyes of all were stayed some upon faces bright some on the priests some on the traceries that decked the slumber of a marble knight and all the rustlings over that arise from recognizing tokens of delight when friendly glances meet then silent ease spread o'er the multitude by slow degrees then swelled the organ up through choir and nave 
the music trembled with an inward thrill of bliss at its own grandeur wave on wave its flood of mellow thunder rose until the hushed air shivered with the throb it gave then poising for a moment it stood still and sank and rose again to burst in spray that wandered into silence far away like to a mighty heart the music seemed that yearns with melodies it cannot speak until in grand despair of what it dreamed in the agony of effort it doth break yet triumphs breaking on it rushed and streamed and wantoned in its might as when a lake long pent among the mountains bursts its walls and in one crowding gush leaps forth and falls deeper and deeper shudders shook the air as the huge base kept gathering heavily like thunder when it rouses in its lair and with its hoarse growl shakes the low-hung sky it grew up like a darkness everywhere filling the vast cathedral suddenly from the dense mass a boy's clear treble broke like lightning and the full-toned choir awoke through gorgeous windows shone the sun aslant brimming the church with gold and purple mist neat atmosphere to bosom that rich chant where fifty voices in one strand did twist their very colored tones and left no want to the delighted soul which sank abyss in the warm music cloud while far below the organ heaved its surges to and fro as if a lark should suddenly drop dead while the blue air yet trembled with its song so snapped at once that music's golden thread struck by a nameless fear that leapt along from heart to heart and like a shadow spread with instantaneous shiver through the throng so that some glanced behind as half aware a hideous shape of dread was standing there as when a crowd of pale men gather round watching an eddy in the leaden deep from which they deem the body of one drowned will be cast forth from face to face doth creep an eager dread that holds all tongues fast bound until the horror with a ghastly leap starts up its dead blue arms stretched aimlessly heaved with the swinging of the careless sea so in the faces of all these there grew as by one impulse a dark freezing awe which with a fearful fascination drew all eyes toward the altar damp and raw the air grew suddenly and no man knew whether perchance his silent neighbor saw the dreadful thing which all were sure would rise to scare the strained lids wider from their eyes the incense trembled as it upward sent its slow uncertain thread of wandering blue as twere the only living element in all the church so deep the stillness grew it seemed one might have heard it as it went give out an audible rustle curling through the midnight silence of that awe-struck air more hushed than death though so much life was there nothing they saw but a low voice was heard threading the ominous silence of that fear gentle and terrorless as if a bird wakened by some volcano's glare should cheer the murk air with his song yet every word in the cathedral's farthest arch seemed near as if it spoke to every one apart 
like the clear voice of conscience in each heart. O oh, rest, to weary hearts thou art most dear. O oh, silence, after life's bewildering din, thou art most welcome, whether in the sear days of our age thou comest, or we win the poppy wreath in youth. Then, wherefore here, linger I yet, once free to enter in at that wished gate which gentle death doth ope, into the boundless realm of strength and hope? Think not in death my love could ever cease. If thou wast false, more need there is for me still to be true. That slumber were not peace, if twere unvisited with dreams of thee. And thou hast never heard such words as these, save that in heaven I must be most comfortless and wretched, seeing this our unbaptized babe shut out from bliss. This little spirit with imploring eyes wanders alone the dreary wild of space. The shadow of his pain forever lies upon my soul in this new dwelling place. His loneliness makes me in paradise more lonely, and unless I see his face, even here for grief could I lie down and die, save for my curse of immortality. World after world he sees around him swim, crowded with happy souls, that take no heed of the sad eyes that from the night's faint rim gaze sick with longing on them as they speed with golden gates that only shut out him. And shapes sometimes from hell's abysses freed flap darkly by him, with enormous sweep of wings that roughen wide the pitchy deep. I am a mother, Spirits do not shake this much of earth from them, and I must pine till I can feel his little hands and take his weary head upon this heart of mine. And, might it be, full gladly for his sake, would I this solitude of bliss resign and be shut out of heaven to dwell with him forever in that silence drear and dim. I strove to hush my soul and would not speak at first. For thy dear sake, a woman's love is mighty, but a mother's heart is weak, and by its weakness overcomes. I strove to smother bitter thoughts with patience meek, but still in the abyss my soul would rove, seeking my child and drove me here to claim the right that gives him peace in Christ's dear name. I sit and weep while blessed spirits sing. I can but long and pine the while they praise, and, leaning o'er the wall of heaven, I fling my voice to where I deem my infant strays like a robbed bird that cries in vain to bring her nestlings back beneath her wings' embrace. But still he answers not, and I but know that heaven and earth are both alike in woe. Then the pale priests with ceremony do baptize the child within its dreadful tomb beneath that mother's heart whose instinct true, star-like, had battled down the triple gloom of sorrow, love, and death. Young maidens, too, strewed the pale corpse with many a milk-white bloom, and parted the bright hair, and on the breast crossed the unconscious hands in sign of rest. Some said that when the priest had sprinkled o'er the consecrated drops, they seemed to hear a sigh, as of some heart from travail sore released. And then two voices singing clear, Misereatur Deus, 
more and more, fading far upward, and their ghastly fear fell from them with that sound, as bodies fall from souls upspringing to celestial hall. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Prometheus by James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org by Hanford. Prometheus One after one the stars have risen and set, sparkling upon the hoar-frost on my chain. The bear that prowled all night about the fold of the North Star hath shrunk into his den, scared by the blithesome footsteps of the dawn, whose blushing smile floods all the Orient. And now bright Lucifer grows less and less into the heavens blue, quiet, deep withdrawn. Sunless and starless all, the desert sky arches above me, empty as this heart. For ages hath been empty of all joy, except to brood upon its silent hope, as o'er its hope of day the sky doth now. All night have I heard voices, deeper yet. The deep low breathing of the silence grew, while all about, muffled in awe, there stood shadows or forms or both, clear felt at heart. But when I turned to front them, far along only a shudder through the midnight ran, and the dense stillness walled me closer round. But still I heard them wander up and down that solitude, and flappings of dusk wings did mingle with them. Whether of those hags let slip upon me once from Hades deep, or of yet direr torments, if such be, I could but guess. And then toward me came a shape as of a woman. Very pale it was and calm. Its cold eyes did not move, and mine moved not, but only stared on them. Their fixed awe went through my brain like ice. A skeleton hand seemed clutching at my heart, and a sharp chill, as if a dank night fog suddenly closed me in, was all I felt. And then, methought, I heard a freezing sigh, a long, deep, shivering sigh, as from blue lips stiffening in death, close to mine ear. I thought some doom was close upon me, and I looked and saw the red moon through the heavy mist, just setting, and it seemed as if it were falling, or reeling to its fall, so dim and dead, and palsy-struck it looked. And then all sounds merged into the rising surges of the pines, which leagues below me, clothing the gaunt loins of ancient Caucasus with hairy strength, sent up a murmur in the morning wind, sad as the wail that from the populous earth all day and night the high Olympus soars fit incense to thy wicked throne, O Jove. Thy hated name is tossed once more in scorn from off my lips, for I will tell thy doom. And are these tears? Nay, do not triumph, Jove. They are wrung from me but by the agonies of prophecy, like those sparse drops which fall from clouds and travail of the lightning when the great wave of the storm, high-curled and black, rolls steadily onward to its thunderous break. Why art thou made a god of, thy poor type of anger and revenge and cunning force? True power was never born of brutish strength, nor sweet truth suckled at the shaggy dugs of that old she-wolf. Are thy thunderbolts, that quell the darkness for a space, so strong as the prevailing patience of meek light? who with the invincible tenderness of peace wins it to be a portion of herself. Why art thou made a god of, thou who hast the never-sleeping terror at thy heart, that birthright of all tyrants, worse to bear than this thy ravening bird on which I smile? Thou swearest to free me, if I will unfold what kind of doom it is whose omen flits across thy heart, as o'er a troop of doves the fearful shadow of the kite. What need to know that truth whose knowledge cannot save? Evil its errand hath, as well as good. When thine is finished, thou art known no more. 
There is a higher purity than thou, and higher purity is greater strength. Thy nature is thy doom, at which thy heart trembles behind the thick walls of thy might. Let man but hope, and thou art straightway chilled with thought of that drear silence and deep night, which like a dream shall swallow thee in thine. Let man but will, and thou art God no more, more capable of ruin than the gold and ivory that image thee on earth. He who hurled down the monstrous titan brood, blinded with lightnings, with rough thunders stunned, is weaker than a simple human thought. My slender voice can shake thee, as the breeze that seems but apt to stir a maiden's hair sways huge Oceanus from pole to pole. For I am still Prometheus, and foreknow in my wise heart the end and doom of all. Yes, I am still Prometheus, wiser grown by years of solitude that holds apart the past and future, giving the soul room to search into itself and long commune with this eternal silence. More a God in my long suffering and strength to meet with equal front the direst shafts of fate than thou in thy faint hearted despotism, girt with thy baby toys of force and wrath. Yes, I am that Prometheus who brought down the light to man which thou in selfish fear hadst to thyself usurped, his by sole right, for man hath right to all save tyranny, and which shall set him free yet from thy frail throne. Tyrants are but the spawn of ignorance begotten by the slaves they trample on, who could they win a glimmer of the light and see that tyranny is always weakness, or fear with its own bosom ill at ease, would laugh away in scorn the sand-wove chain which their own blindness feigned for adamant. Wrong ever builds on quicksands, but the right to the firm center lays its moveless base. The tyrant trembles if the air but stirs the innocent ringlets of a child's free hair, and crouches when the thought of some great spirit with worldwide murmur like a rising gale over men's hearts as over standing corn rushes and bends them to its own strong will. So shall some thought of mine yet circle earth and puff away thy crumbling altars, Jove. And wouldst thou know of my supreme revenge, poor tyrant, even now dethroned in heart, realmless in soul as tyrants ever are? Listen, and tell me if this bitter peak, this never-glutted vulture, and these chains shrink not before it, for it shall befit a sorrow-taught, unconquered, titan heart. Men, when their death is on them, seems to stand on a precipitous crag that overhangs the abyss of doom, and in that depth to see, as in a glass, the features dim and vast of things to come, the shadows, as it seems, of what have been. Death ever fronts the wise, not fearfully, but with clear promises of larger life, on whose broad vans upborne their outlook widens, and they see beyond the horizon of the present and the past, even to the very source and end of things. Such am I now. Immortal woe hath made my heart a seer, and my soul a judge between the substance and the shadow of truth. The sure supremeness of the beautiful, by all the martyrdoms made doubly sure of such as I am. This is my revenge, which of my wrongs builds a triumphal arch, through which I see a scepter and a throne. The pipings of glad shepherds on the hills tending the flocks no more to bleed for thee, the songs of maidens pressing with white feet, the vintage on thine altars poured no more, the murmurous bliss of lovers underneath dim grapevine bowers whose rosy bunches press not half so closely their warm cheeks, unpaled by thoughts of thy brute lust, the hive-like hum of peaceful commonwealths, where sunburnt toil reaps for itself the rich earth made its own by its own labor, lightened with glad hymns to an omnipotence which thy mad bolts would cope with as a spark with the vast sea. Even the spirit of free love and peace, duty's sure recompense through life and death, these are such harvests as all master spirits reap, happily not on earth, but reap no less because the sheaves are bound 
by hands not theirs. These are the bloodless daggers wherewithal they stab fallen tyrants. This is their high revenge. For their best part of life on earth is when long after death, prisoned and pent no more, their thoughts, their wild dreams even, have become part of the necessary air men breathe. When, like the moon herself behind a cloud, they shed down light before us on life's sea that cheers us to steer onward still in hope. Earth with her twining memories ivies o'er their holy sepulchres. The chainless sea in tempest or wide calm repeats their thoughts. The lightning and the thunder, all free things, have legends of them for the ears of men. All other glories are as falling stars, but universal nature watches theirs. Such strength is won by love of humankind. Not that I feel that hunger after fame which souls of a half-greatness are beset with, but that the memory of noble deeds cries shame upon the idle and the vile, and keeps the heart of man forever up to the heroic level of old time. To be forgot at first is little pain to a heart conscious of such high intent as must be deathless on the lips of men. But, having been a name, to sink and to be a something which the world can do without, which, having been or not, would never change the lightest pulse of fate, this is indeed a cup of bitterness, the worst to taste, and this thy heart shall empty to the dregs. Endless despair shall be thy Caucasus, and memory thy vulture. Thou wilt find oblivion far lonelier than this peak. Behold thy destiny. Thou think'st it much that I should brave thee, miserable God. But I have braved a mightier than thou, even the tempting of this soaring heart, which might have made me scarcely less than thou, a God among my brethren, weak and blind. Scarce less than thou, a pitiable thing to be downtrodden into darkness soon. But now I am above thee, for thou art the bungling workmanship of fear, the block that awes the swart barbarian. But I am what myself have made, a nature wise with finding in itself the types of all. With watching from the dim verge of the time what things to be are visible in the gleams thrown forward on them from the luminous past, wise with the history of its own frail heart, with reverence and sorrow and with love broad as the world, for freedom and for man. Thou and all strength shall crumble except love, by whom and for whose glory ye shall cease. And when thou art but a dim moaning heard from out the pitiless glooms of chaos, I shall be a power and a memory, a name to fright all tyrants with, a light unsetting as the pole star, a great voice heard in the breathless pauses of the fight by truth and freedom ever waged with wrong, clear as a silver trumpet to awake huge echoes that from age to age live on in kindred spirits, giving them a sense of boundless power from boundless suffering wrung. And many a glazing eye shall smile to see the memory of my triumph for to meet wrong with endurance, and to overcome the present with a heart that looks beyond our triumph, I, like a prophet eagle, perch upon the sacred banner of the right. Evil springs up in flowers, and bears no seed, and feeds the green earth with its swift decay, leaving it richer for the growth of truth. But good, once put in action or in thought, like a strong oak, doth from its boughs shed down the ripe germs of a forest. Thou, weak God, shall fade and be forgotten, but this soul, fresh living still in the serene abyss, in every heaving shall partake that grows from heart to heart among the sons of men, as the ominous hum before the earthquake runs, far through the Aegean, from roused isle to isle, foreboding wreck to palaces and shrines, and mighty rents in many a cavernous error that darkens the free light to man. This heart, Unscarred by thy grim vulture, as the truth grows but more lovely neath the beaks and claws of harpies blind that fain would soil it, shall in all the throbbing exultation share that wait on freedom's triumphs, and in all the glorious agonies of martyr spirits. Sharp lightning throws to split the jagged clouds that veil the future, showing them the end. P.
Pain's thorny crown for constancy and truth, girding the temples like a wreath of stars. This is a thought that like a fabled laurel makes my faith thunderproof, and thy dread bolts fall on me like the silent flakes of snow on the hoar brows of aged Caucasus. But, oh, thought far more blissful, they can rend this cloud of flesh and make my soul a star. Unleash thy crouching thunders now, O Jove. Free this high heart, which a poor captive long doth knock to be let forth. This heart which still, in its invincible manhood, overtops thy puny godship, as this mountain doth the pines that moss its roots. Oh, even now, while from my peak of suffering I look down, beholding, with a far-spread gush of hope, the sunrise of that beauty, in whose face shone all around with love, no man shall look but straight away like a god, he is uplift unto the throne, long empty for his sake, and clearly oft foreshadowed in wide dreams by his free inward nature, which nor thou, nor any anarch after thee, can bind from working its great doom. Now, now, set free this essence not to die, but to become part of that awful presence which doth haunt the palaces of tyrants, to hunt off with its grim eyes and fearful whisperings and hideous sense of utter loneliness, all hope of safety, all desire of peace, all but the loathed for feeling of blank death, part of that spirit which doth ever brood in patient calm on the unpilfered nest of man's deep heart, till mighty thoughts grow fledged to sail with darkening shadow o'er the world filling with dread such souls as dare not trust in the unfailing energy of good, until they swoop and their pill quarry make of some or bloated wrong, that spirit which scatters great hopes in the seed field of man, like acorns among grain, to grow and be a roof for freedom in all coming time. But no, this cannot be for ages yet, in solitude unbroken, shall I hear the angry Caspian to the Euxine shout, and Euxine answer with a muffled roar. On either side, storming the great walls of Caucasus with leagues of climbing foam, less from my height than flakes of downy snow, that draws back baffled but to hurl again, snatched up in wrath and horrible turmoil. Mountain on mountain as the titans erst, my brethren scaling the high seat of Jove, heaved Pelion upon Asa's shoulders broad in vain emprise. The moon will come and go in her monotonous vicissitude. Once beautiful, when I was free to walk among my fellows and to interchange the influence benign of loving eyes, but now by aged use grown wearisome. False thought, most false, for how could I endure these crawling centuries of lonely woe unshamed by weak complaining but for thee? loneliest save me of all created things. Mild-eyed Astarte, my best comforter, with thy pale smile of sad benignity, year after year will pass away and seem to me in mine eternal agony, but as the shadows of dumb summer clouds, which I have watched so often darkening o'er the vast Sarmatian plain, league-wide at first, but with still swiftness lessening on and on till cloud and shadow meet and mingle where the gray horizon fades into the sky far, far to the northward. Yes, for ages yet must I lie here upon my altar huge, a sacrifice for man. Sorrow will be, as it hath been, his portion endless doom, while the immortal with the mortal linked dreams of its wings and pines for what it dreams with upward yearn unceasing. Better so, for wisdom is meek sorrow's patient child, and empire over self, and all the deep strong charities that make men seem like gods, and love that makes them be gods, from her breasts sucks in the milk that makes mankind one blood. Good never comes unmixed, or so it seems, having two faces as some images are carved of foolish gods, one face is ill. But one heart lies beneath, and that is good, as are all hearts when we explore their depths. Therefore, great heart, bear up. Thou art but type of what all lofty spirits endure, that fain would win men back to strength and peace through love. 
Each hath his lonely peak, and on each heart envy, or scorn, or hatred, tears lifelong with vulture beak. Yet the high soul is left, and faith, which is but hope grown wise, and love, and patience, which at last shall overcome. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Violet, sweet Violet, thine eyes are full of tears. Are they wet even yet with the thought of other years? Or with gladness are they full for the night so beautiful and longing for those far-off spheres? Loved one of my youth thou wast, of my merry youth, and I see tearfully all the fair and sunny past, all its openness and truth, ever fresh and green in thee, as the moss is in the sea. Thy little heart that hath with love grown colored like the sky above, on which thou lookest ever, can it know all the woe of hope for what returneth never? All the sorrow and the longing to these hearts of ours belonging? Out on it! No foolish pining for the sky dims thine eye, or for the star so calmly shining. Like thee, let this soul of mine take hue from that wherefore I long self-stayed and high serene and strong not satisfied with hoping but divine violet dear violet thy blue eyes are only wet with joy and love of him who sent thee and for the fulfilling sense of that glad obedience which made thee all that nature meant thee End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Rosaline by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Lois Beachy Yoder, Charlotte, North Carolina, November 13, 2015 Thou lookst on me all yesternight Thine eyes were blue, thy hair was bright as when we murmured our troth plight beneath the thick stars, Rosaline. Thy hair was braided on thy head, as on the day we two were wed. Mine eyes scarce knew if thou wert dead, but my shrunk heart knew, Rosaline. The death watch ticked behind the wall, the blackness rustled like a pall. The moaning wind did rise and fall among the bleak pines, Rosaline. My heart beat thickly in mine ears. The lids may shut out fleshly fears, but still the spirit sees and hears. Its eyes are lidless, Rosaline. A wildness rushing suddenly, a knowing some ill shape is nigh, a wish for death, a fear to die. Is not this vengeance, Rosaline? A loneliness that is not lone, a love quite withered up and gone, a strong soul trampled from its throne. What wouldst thou further, Rosaline? Tis drear such moonless nights as these, strange sounds are out upon the breeze, and the leaves shiver in the trees, and then thou comest, Rosaline. I seem to hear the mourners go, with long black garments trailing slow, and plumes and nodding to and fro, and once I heard them, Rosaline. Thy shroud is all of snowy white, and in the middle of the night thou standest moveless and upright, gazing upon me, Rosaline. There is no sorrow in thine eyes, 
but evermore that meek surprise o oh god thy gentle spirit tries to deem me guiltless rosaline above thy grave the robin sings and swarms of bright and happy things flit all about with sunlit wings but i am cheerless rosaline the violets on the hillock toss the gravestone is o'ergrown with moss for nature feels not any loss but i am cheerless rosaline i did not know when thou wast dead a blackbird whistling overhead thrilled through my brain i would have fled but dared not leave thee rosaline the sun rolled down and very soon like a great fire the awful moon rose stained with blood and then a swoon crept chilly o'er me rosaline the stars came out and one by one each angel from his silver throne looked down and saw what i had done i dared not hide me rosaline i crouched i feared thy corpse would cry against me to god's quiet sky i thought i saw the blue lips try to utter something rosaline i waited with a maddened grin to hear that voice all icy thin slide forth and tell my deadly sin to hell and heaven rosaline but no voice came and then it seemed that if the very corpse had screamed the sound like sunshine glad had streamed through that dark stillness rosaline and then amid the silent night i screamed with horrible delight and in my brain an awful light did seem to crackle rosaline it is my curse sweet memories fall from me like snow and only all of that one night like cold worms crawl my doomed heart over rosaline why wilt thou haunt me with thine eyes where in such blessed memories such pitying forgiveness lies than hate more bitter, Rosaline. Woe's me! I know that love so high as thine, true soul, could never die, and with mean clay in churchyard lie. Would it might be so, Rosaline. 1841. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Shepherd of King Edmetus by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Jeff Moon of Rochester, New York There came a youth upon the earth some thousand years ago, Whose slender hands were nothing worth, whether to plough or reap or sow. Upon an empty tortoise shell he stretched some chords, And drew music that made men's bosoms swell fearless, Or brimmed their eyes with dew. Then King Edmetus, one who had pure taste by right divine, decreed his singing not too bad to hear between the cups of wine. And so well pleased with being soothed into a sweet half-sleep, three times his kingly beard he smoothed, and made him viceroy or his sheep. His words were simple words enough, and yet he used them so that in what in other mouths was rough in his seemed musical and low. Men called him but a shiftless youth, in whom no good they saw, and yet unwittingly, in truth, they made his careless words their law. They knew not how he learned it all, for idly, hour by hour, he sat and watched the dead leaves fall or mused upon a common flower. It seemed the loveliness of things did teach them all their use, for in mere weeds and stones and springs he found a healing power profuse. Men granted that his speech was wise, but when a glance they caught of his slim grace in woman's eyes, they laughed and called him good for naught. Yet after he was dead and gone, and e'en his memory dim, earth seemed more sweet to live upon, more full of love because of him. And day by day more holy grew each spot where he had trod, till after poets only knew their first-born brother as a god. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. by James Russell Lowell.
Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The token. It is a mere wild rosebud, quite sallow now and dry, yet there's something wondrous in it, some gleams of days gone by. Dear sights and sounds that are to me the very moons of memory, and stir my heart's blood far below its short-lived waves of joy and woe. Lips must fade and roses wither, all sweet times be o'er, they only smile and, murmuring thither, stay with us no more. And yet oft times a look or smile, forgotten in a kiss's while, years after from the dark will start and flash across the trembling heart. Thou hast given me many roses, but never one like this, over floods both sense and spirit with such a deep wild bliss. We must have instincts that clean up sparse drops of this life in the cup, whose taste shall give us all that we can prove of immortality. Earth's stablest things are shadows, and in the life to come, haply some chance safe trifle may tell of this old home. As now sometimes we seem to find, in a dark crevice of the mind, some relic which, long pondered o'er, hints faintly at a life before. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Incident in a Railroad Car by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, November 2015. An Incident in a Railroad Car. He spoke of Burns. Men rude and rough pressed round to hear the praise of one whose heart was made of manly, simple stuff as homespun as their own. And when he read, they forward leaned, drinking with thirsty hearts and ears his brook-like songs whom glory never weaned from humble smiles and tears. Slowly there grew a tender awe, sunlike o'er faces brown and hard, as if in him who read, they felt and saw some presence of the bard. It was a sight for sin and wrong and slavish tyranny to see, a sight to make our faith more pure and strong in high humanity. I thought, these men will carry hence promptings their former life above, and something of a finer reverence for beauty, truth, and love. God scatters love on every side, freely among his children all, and always hearts are lying open wide wherein some grains may fall. There is no wind but soweth seeds of a more true and open life, which burst unlooked for into high-souled deeds with wayside beauty rife. We find within these souls of ours some wild germs of a higher birth, which in the poet's tropic heart bear flowers whose fragrance fills the earth. Within the hearts of all men lie these promises of a wider bliss, which blossom into hopes that cannot die in sunny hours like this. All that hath been majestical in life or death since time began is native in the simple heart of all, the angel heart of man. And thus, Great deeds and feelings find a home that cast in shadow all the golden lore of classic Greece and Rome. O oh, mighty brother soul of man, where'er thou art in low or high, thy skyey arches with exulting span or roof infinity. All thoughts that mould the age begin deep down within the primitive soul, and from the many slowly upward win to one who grasps the whole. In his wide brain the feeling deep that struggled on the many's tongue swells to a tide of thought whose surges leap o'er the weak thrones of wrong. All thought begins in feeling, Wide in the great mass its base is hid, and narrowing up to thought stands glorified a moveless pyramid. Nor is he far astray who deems that every hope which rises and grows broad in the world's heart by ordered impulse streams from the great heart of God. God wills, man hopes, 
in common souls hope is but vague and undefined till from the poet's tongue the message rolls a blessing to his kind never did poesy appear so full of heaven to me as when i saw how it would pierce through pride and fear to the lives of coarsest men it may be glorious to write thoughts that shall glad the two or three high souls like those far stars that come in sight once in a century but better far it is to speak one simple word which now and then shall waken their free nature in the weak and friendless sons of men to write some earnest verse or line which seeking not the praise of art shall make a clearer faith and manhood shine in the untutored heart he who doth this in verse or prose may be forgotten in his day but surely shall be crowned at last with those who live and speak for i eighteen forty two end of poem this recording is in the public domain Crocus by James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org by Lois Beachy Yoder, Charlotte, North Carolina. God sends his teachers into every age, to every clime and every race of men, with revelations fitted to their growth and shape of mind, nor gives the realm of truth into the selfish rule of one sole race. Therefore, each form of worship that hath swayed the life of man and given it to grasp the master key of knowledge, reverence, enfolds some germs of goodness and of right. Else never had the eager soul which loathes the slothful down of pampered ignorance found in it even a moment's fitful rest. There is an instinct in the human heart which makes that all the fables it hath coined to justify the reign of its belief and strengthen it by beauty's right divine veil in their inner cells a mystic gift which like the hazel twig in faithful hands points surely to the hidden springs of truth for as in nature naught is made in vain but all things have within their hall of use a wisdom and a meaning which may speak of spiritual secrets to the ear of spirit so in whatsoe'er the heart hath fashioned for a solace to itself to make its inspiration suit its creed and from the niggard hands of falsehood wring its needful food of truth there ever is a sympathy with nature which reveals not less than her own works pure gleams of light and earnest parables of inward lore hear now this fairy legend of old greece as full of freedom, youth, and beauty still as the immortal freshness of that grace carved for all ages on some attic frieze. A youth named Rokas, wandering in the wood, saw an old oak just trembling to its fall, and feeling pity of so fair a tree, he propped its gray trunk with admiring care, and with a thoughtless step loitered on. But as he turned, he heard a voice behind that murmured, Rokas. T'was as if the leaves, stirred by a passing breath, had murmured it. And while he paused bewildered, yet again it murmured, Rokas, softer than a breeze. He started and beheld with dizzy eyes what seemed the substance of a happy dream. Stand there before him, spreading a warm glow within the green glooms of the shadowy oak. It seemed a woman's shape, yet all too fair to be a woman, and with eyes too meek for any that were wont to mate with gods. All naked like a goddess stood she there, and like a goddess all too beautiful to feel the guilt-born earthliness of shame. Rokas, I am the dryad of this tree. Thus she began, dropping her low-toned words, serene and full and clear as drops of dew. And with it I am doomed to live and die. The rain and sunshine are my caterers, nor have I other bliss than simple life. Now ask me what thou wilt that I can give, 
and with a thankful joy it shall be thine. Then Rochus, with a flutter at the heart, yet by the prompting of such beauty bold, answered, What is there that can satisfy the endless craving of the soul but love? Give me thy love, or but the hope of that which must be evermore my spirit's goal. After a little pause she said again, but with a glimpse of sadness in her tone, I give it, Rochus, though a perilous gift, an hour before the sunset meet me here. And straightway there was nothing he could see but the green glooms beneath the shadowy oak, and not a sound came to his straining ears but the low trickling rustle of the leaves, and far away upon an emerald slope the falter of an idle shepherd's pipe. Now in those days of simpleness and faith, men did not think that happy things were dreams because they overstepped the narrow bourne of likelihood, but reverently deemed nothing too wondrous or too beautiful to be the guerdon of a daring heart. So Rochus made no doubt that he was blessed, and all along unto the city's gate earth seemed to spring beneath him as he walked. The clear, broad sky looked bluer than its wont, and he could scarce believe he had not wings. Such sunshine seemed to glitter through his veins instead of blood, so light he felt and strange. Young Rochus had a faithful heart enough, but one that in the present dwelt too much, and taking with blithe welcome whatsoe'er chance gave of joy, was wholly bound in that, like the contented peasant of a vale, deemed it the world and never looked beyond. So haply meeting in the afternoon some comrades who were playing at the dice, he joined them and forgot all else beside. The dice were rattling at the merriest, and Rochus, who had met but sorry luck, just laughed in triumph at a happy throw, when through the room there hummed a yellow bee that buzzed about his ear with down-dropped legs as if to light. And Rochus laughed and said, feeling how red and flushed he was with loss, By Venus does he take me for a rose, and brushed him off with rough impatient hand. But still the bee came back, and thrice again Rukus did beat him off with growing wrath. Then through the window flew the wounded bee, and Rukus, tracking him with angry eyes, saw a sharp mountain peak of Thessaly against the red disk of the setting sun. And instantly the blood sank from his heart, as if its very walls had caved away. Without a word he turned, and rushing forth, ran madly through the city and the gate, and o'er the plain, which now the wood's long shade, by the low sun thrown forward broad and dim, darkened well nigh into the city's wall. Quite spent and out of breath, he reached the tree, and listening fearfully, he heard once more the low voice murmur, Rokus, close at hand. Whereat he looked around him, but could see naught but the deepening glooms beneath the oak. Then sighed the voice, O Rochus, never more shalt thou behold me, or by day or night, me who would fain have blessed thee with a love more ripe and bounteous than ever yet filled up with nectar any mortal heart. But thou didst scorn my humble messenger, and sensed him back to me with bruised wings. We spirits only show to gentle eyes, we ever ask an undivided love, and he who scorns the least of nature's works is thenceforth exiled and shut out from all. Farewell, for thou canst never see me more. Then Rochus beat his breast and groaned aloud and cried, Be pitiful! Forgive me yet this once, and I shall never need it more. Alas, the voice returned, tis thou art blind, not I unmerciful. I can forgive, but have no skill to heal thy spirit's eyes. Only the soul hath power o'er itself. With that again there murmured, 
nevermore and rocus after heard no other sound except the rattling of the oak's crisp leaves like the long surf upon a distant shore raking the sea-worn pebbles up and down the night had gathered round him o'er the plain the city sparkled with its thousand lights and sounds of revel fell upon his ear harshly and like a curse above the sky with all its bright sublimity of stars deepened and on his forehead smote the breeze beauty was all around him and delight but from that eve he was alone on earth end of poem this recording is in the public domain james russell lowell read for LibriVox.org by sonia the falcon i know a falcon swift and peerless as ever was cradled in the pine no bird had ever eyes so fearless or wings so strong as this of mine the winds not better love to pilot a cloud with molten gold overrun than him a little burning islet a star above the coming sun for with a lark's heart he doth tower by a glorious upward instinct drawn no bee nestles deeper in the flower than he in the bursting rose of dawn no harmless dove no bird that singeth shudders to see him overhead the rush of his fierce swooping bringeth to innocent hearts no thrill of dread let fraud and wrong and baseness shiver for still between them and the sky the falcon truth hangs poised forever and marks them with his vengeful eye end of poem this recording is in the public domain by james russell lowell read for LibriVox.org by lois beachy yoder charlotte north carolina december third two thousand fifteen whether the idle prisoner through his grate watches the waving of the grass tuft small which having colonized its rift in the wall takes its free risk of good or evil fate and from the sky's just helmet draws its lot daily of shower or sunshine cold or hot whether the closer captive of a creed cooped up from birth to grind out endless chaff sees through his treadmill bars the noonday laugh and feels in vain his crumpled pinions breed whether the georgian slave look up and mark with bellying sails puffed full the tall cloud bark sink northward slowly thou alone seemst good fair only thou o freedom whose desire can light in muddiest souls quick seeds of fire and strain life's cords to the old heroic mood yet there are other gifts more fair than thine nor can i count him happiest who has never been forced with his own hand his chains to sever and for himself find out the way divine he never knew the aspirer's glorious pains he never earned the struggle's priceless gains O oh, block by block, with sore and sharp endeavor, lifelong we build these human natures up into a temple fit for freedom's shrine, and trial ever consecrates the cup wherefrom we pour her sacrificial wine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Requiem by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Lois Beachy Yoder Charlotte, North Carolina October 29, 2015 I, pale and silent maiden, cold as thou liest there, Thine was the sunniest nature that ever drew the air, The wildest and most wayward, and yet so gently kind, Thou seemest but to body a breath of summer wind. 
into the eternal shadow that girds our life around into the infinite silence wherewith death's shore is bound thou hast gone forth beloved and i were mean to weep that thou hast left life's shallows and dost possess the deep thou liest low and silent thy heart is cold and still thine eyes are shut for ever and death hath had his will he loved and would have taken i loved and would have kept we strove and he was stronger and i have never wept let him possess thy body thy soul is still with me more sunny and more gladsome than it was wont to be thy body was a fetter that bound me to the flesh thank god that it is broken and now i live afresh now i can see thee clearly the dusky cloud of clay that hid thy starry spirit is rent and blown away to earth i give thy body thy spirit to the sky i saw its bright wings growing and knew that thou must fly now i can love thee truly for nothing comes between the senses and the spirit the seen and the unseen lifts the eternal shadow the silence bursts apart and the soul's boundless future is present in my heart end of poem by james russell lowell read for librivox.org by larry wilson worn and footsore was the prophet when he gained the holy hill god has left the earth he murmured here his presence lingers still god of all the olden prophets wilt thou speak with men no more have i not as truly served thee as thy chosen ones of yore hear me guider of my fathers lo a humble heart is mine by thy mercy i beseech thee grant thy servant but a sign bowing then his head he listened for an answer to his prayer no loud burst of thunder followed nor a murmur stirred the air but the tuft of moss before him opened while he waited yet and from out the rock's hard bosom sprang a tender violet god i thank thee said the prophet hard of heart and blind was i looking to the holy mountain for the gift of prophecy still thou speakest with thy children freely as in eld sublime humbleness and love and patience still give empire over time had i trusted my nature and had faith in lowly things thou thyself wouldst again had i trusted in my nature and had faith in lowly things thou thyself wouldst then have sought me and set free my spirit's wings but i look for signs and wonders that o'er men should give me sway thirsting to be more than mortal i was even less than clay ere i entered on my journey as i girt my loins to start ran to me my little daughter the beloved of my heart in her hand she held a flower like to this as like may be which beside my very threshold she had plucked and brought to me 1842 end of poem this recording is in the public domain Behind the Curtain by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by John Burlinson We see but half the causes of our deeds, seeking them wholly in the outer life, and heedless of the encircling spirit world, 
which, though unseen, is felt, and sows in us all germs of pure and worldwide purposes. From one stage of our being to the next, we pass unconscious or a slender bridge, the momentary work of unseen hands, which crumbles down behind us. Looking back, we see the other shore, the gulf between, and, marveling how we won to where we stand, content ourselves to call the builder chance. We trace the wisdom to the apple's fall, not to the birth throes of a mighty truth, which, for long ages in blank chaos dumb, yet yearned to be incarnate, and had found at last a spirit meet to be the womb from which it might be born to bless mankind. Not to the soul of Newton, ripe with all the hoarded thoughtfulness of earnest years, and waiting but one ray of sunlight more to blossom fully. But whence came that ray? We call our sorrows destiny, but ought rather to name our high successors so. Only the instinct of great souls are fate, and have predestined sway. All other things, except by leave of us, could never be. For destiny is but the breath of God, still moving in us, the last fragment left of our unfallen nature, waking oft within our thought, to beckon us beyond the narrow circle of the seen and known, and always tending to a noble end, as all things must that overrule the soul, and for a space unseat the helmsman will. The fate of England and of freedom once seemed wavering in the heart of one plain man. One step of his and the great dial-hand that marks the destined progress of the world in the eternal round from wisdom on to higher wisdom had been made to pause a hundred years. That step he did not take. He knew not why, nor we but only God, and lived to make his simple oaken chair more terrible and grandly beautiful, more full of majesty than any throne before or after of a British king. Upon the pier stood two stern-visaged men, looking to where a little craft lay moored, swayed by the lazy current of the Thames which weltered by in muddy listlessness. Grave men they were, and battlings of fierce thought had trampled out all softness from their brows, and ploughed rough furrows there before their time, for another crop than such as home-bred peace sows broadcast in the willing soil of youth. Care, not of self, but of the common weal had robbed their eyes of youth, and left instead a look of patient power and iron will, and something fiercer, too, that gave broad hint of the plain weapons girded at their sides. The younger had an aspect of command, not such as trickles down a slender stream in the shrunk channel of a great descent, but such as lies entowered in heart and head, and an arm prompt to do the hests of both. His was a brow where gold were out of place, and yet it seemed right worthy of a crown, though he despised such, were it only made of iron or some serviceable stuff that would have matched his sinewy brown face. The elder, although he hardly seemed, care makes so little of some five short years, had a clear, honest face, whose rough-hewn strength was mildened by the scholar's wiser heart to sober courage, such as best befits the unsullied temper of a well-taught mind. 
yet so remained that one could plainly guess the hushed volcano smouldering underneath he spoke the other hearing kept his gaze still fixed as on some problem in the sky oh cromwell we are fallen on evil times there was a day when england had wide room for honest men as well as foolish kings but now the uneasy stomach of the time turns squeamish at them both therefore let us seek out that savage clime where men as yet are free there sleeps the vessel on the tide her languid canvas drooping for the wind give us but that and what need we to fear this order of the council the free waves will not say no to please a wayward king nor will the winds turn traitors at his beck all things are fitly cared for and the lord will watch as kindly o'er the exodus of his servants now as in old time we have no cloud or fire and haply we may not pass dry shod through the ocean stream but saved or lost all things are in his hand so spake he and meantime the other stood with wide gray eyes still reading the blank air as if upon the sky's blue wall he saw some mystic sentence written by a hand such as of old made pale the assyrian king girt with his satraps in the blazing feast hampton a moment since my purpose was to fly with thee for i will call it flight nor flatter it with any smoother name but something in me bids me not to go and i am one thou knowest who unmoved by what the weak deem omens yet give heed and reverence due to whatsoe'er my soul whispers of warning to the inner ear moreover as i know that god brings round his purposes in ways undreamed by us and makes the wicked but his instruments to hasten on their swift and sudden fall i see the beauty of his providence in the king's order blind he will not let his doom part from him but must bid it stay as twere a cricket whose enlivening chirp he loved to hear beneath his very heart why should we fly nay why not rather stay and rear again our zion's crumbled walls not as of old the walls of thebes were built by minstrel twanging but if need should be with more potent music of our swords think'st thou that score of men beyond the sea claim more god's care than all of england here no when he moves his arm it is to aid whole peoples heedless if a few be crushed as some are ever when the destiny of man takes one stride onward nearer home believe it tis the mass of men he loves and where there is most sorrow and most want where the high heart of man is trodden down the most tis not because he hides his face from them in wrath as purblind teachers prate not so there most is he for there is he most needed men who seek for fate abroad are not so near his heart as they who dare frankly to face her where she faces them on their own threshold 
where their souls are strong to grapple with and throw her. As I once, being yet a boy, did cast this puny king, who now has grown so dotard as to deem that he can wrestle with an angry realm, and throw the brawned Antaeus of men's rights, no, Hampton, they have halfway conquered fate, who go halfway to meet her, as will I. Freedom hath yet a work for me to do. She speaks that inward voice which never yet spake falsely when it urged the spirit on to noble deeds for country and mankind. And for success I ask no more than this, to bear unflinching witness to the truth, all true whole men succeed for what is worth success's name unless it be the thought the inward surety to have carried out a noble purpose to a noble end although it be the gallows or the block tis only falsehood that doth ever need these outward shows of gain to bolster her be it we prove the weaker with our swords, truth only needs to be for once spoke out, and there's such music in her, such strange rhythm, as makes men's memories her joyous slaves, and clings around the world as the sky clings round the mute earth, forever beautiful, and if, or clouded, only to burst forth more all-embracingly divine and clear. Get but the truth once uttered, and tis like a star new-born that drops into its place, and which, once circling in its placid round, not all the tumult of the earth can shake. What should we do in that small colony of pinched fanatics, who would rather choose freedom to clip an inch more from their hair than the great chance of setting England free. Not there, amid the stormy wilderness, should we learn wisdom, or if learned what room to put it into act, else worse than not. We learn our souls more, tossing for an hour upon this huge and ever-vexed sea of human thought, where kingdoms go to wreck like fragile bubbles yonder in the stream, than in a cycle of New England's sloth, broke only by some petty Indian war, or quarrel for a letter more or less, in some hard word which, spelt in either way not their most learned clerks can understand new times demand new measures and new men the world advances and in time outgrows the laws that in our father's day were best and doubtless after us some purer scheme will be shaped out by wiser men than we made wiser by the steady growth of truth. We cannot bring utopia by force, but better almost be at work in sin than in a brute inaction browse in sleep. No man is born into the world whose work is not born with him. There is always work, and tools to work withal for those who will, and blessed are the horny hands of toil. The busy world shoves angrily aside the man who stands with arms akimbo set, until occasion tells him what to do, and he who waits to have his task marked out shall die and leave his errand unfulfilled. Our time is one that calls for earnest deeds, reason and government, like two broad seas yearn for each other with outstretched arms, across this narrow isthmus of the throne, 
and roll their white surf higher every day one age moves onward and the next holds up cities and gorgeous palaces where stood the rude log huts of those who tamed the wild rearing from out the forests they had felled the godly framework of a fairer state the builder's trowel and the settler's axe are seldom wielded by the self-same hand ours is the harder task yet not the less shall we receive the blessing for our toil from the choice spirits of the aftertime my soul is not a palace of the past where outworn creeds like rome's gray senate quake hearing afar the vandal's trumpet horse that shakes old systems with a thunder fit the time is right and rotten right for change then let it come i have no dread of what is called for by the instinct of mankind nor think i that god's world will fall apart because we tear a parchment more or less truth is eternal but her effluence with endless change is fitted to the hour her mirror is turned forward to reflect the promise of the future not the past he who would win the name of truly great must understand his own age and the next and make the present ready to fulfill its prophecy and with the future merge gently and peacefully as wave with wave the future works out great men's destinies the present is enough for common souls who never looking forward are indeed mere clay wherein the footprints of their age are petrified forever better those who lead the blind old giant by the hand from out the pathless desert where he gropes and set him onward in his darksome way i do not fear to follow out the truth albeit along the precipice's edge let us speak plain there is more force in names than most men dream of and a lie may keep its throne a whole age longer if it skulk behind the shield of some bare seeming name let us call tyrants tyrants and maintain that only freedom comes by grace of god and all that comes not by his grace must fall for men in earnest have no time to waste in patching fig leaves for the naked truth i will have one more grapple with the man charles stuart whom the boy o'ercame the man stands not in awe of i perchance am one raised up by the almighty arm to witness some great truth to all the world souls destined to o'erleap the vulgar lot and mould the world unto the scheme of god have a fore consciousness of their high doom as men are known to shiver at the heart when the cold shadow of some coming ill creeps slowly o'er their spirits unawares hath god less power of prophecy than ill how else could men whom god hath called to sway earth's rudder and to steer the bark of truth beating against the tempest toward her port bear all the mean and buzzing grievances the petty martyrdoms wherewith sin strives to weary out the tethered hope of faith the sneers the unrecognizing look of friends who worship the dead corpse of old king custom where it doth lie in state within the church 
striving to cover up the mighty ocean with a man's palm, and making even the truth lie for them, holding up the glass reversed to make the hope of man seem farther off. My God, when I read o'er the bitter lives of men whose eager hearts were quite too great to beat beneath the cramped mode of the day, and see them mocked at by the world they love, haggling with prejudice for pennyworths of that reform which their hard toil will make the common birthright of the age to come. When I see this, spite of my faith in God, I marvel how their hearts bear up so long nor could they but for this same prophecy, this inward feeling of the glorious end. Deem me not fond, but in my warmer youth, ere my heart's bloom was soiled and brushed away, I had great dreams of mighty things to come, of conquest, whether by the sword or pen I knew not, but some conquest I would have, or else swift death. Now, wiser grown in years, I find youth's dreams are but the flutterings of those strong wings whereon the soul shall soar in aftertime to win a starry throne. And so I cherish them, for they were lots which I, a boy, cast in the helm of fate. Now will I draw them, since a man's right hand, a right hand guided by an earnest soul with a true instinct, takes the golden prize from out a thousand blanks. What men call luck is the prerogative of valiant souls. The fealty life pays its rightful kings. The helm is shaking now, and I will stay to pluck my lot forth. It was sin to flee. So they two turn together, one to die, fighting for freedom on the bloody field, the other far more happy to become a name earth wears forever next her heart, one of the few that have a right to rank with the true makers, for his spirit wrought order from chaos, proved that right divine dwelt only in the excellence of truth, and far within old darkness's hostile lines advanced and pitched the shining tents of light. Nor shall the grateful muse forget to tell that, not the least among his many claims to deathless honour, he was Milton's friend, a man not second among those who live to show us that the poet's lyre demands an arm of tougher sinew than the sword. 1843 End of poem this recording is in the public domain. By James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Song. O oh, moonlight deep and tender, a year and more agone, your mist of golden splendor round my betrothal shone. O oh, elm leaves dark and dewy, the very same ye seem. The low wind trembles through ye, ye murmur in my dream. O river, dim with distance, flow thus forever by, A part of my existence within your heart doth lie. O stars, ye saw our meeting, two beings and one soul, Two hearts so madly beating, to mingle and be whole. O happy night, deliver her kisses back to me, Or keep them all, and give her, a blissful dream of me. 1842. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Chippewa Legend by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Lois Beachy Yoder, Charlotte, North Carolina October 2, 2015 The old chief, feeling now well nigh his end, called his two eldest children to his side and gave them in few words his parting charge. My son and daughter, me ye see no more. The happy hunting grounds await me, green with change of spring and summer through the year. But for remembrance after I am gone, be kind to little Shima for my sake. Weakling he is, and young, and knows not yet to set the trap or draw the seasoned bow. Therefore of both your loves he hath more need, and he who needeth love to love hath right. It is not like our furs and stores of corn, whereto we claim sole title by our toil, but the great spirit plants it in our hearts, and waters it, and gives it some, to be the common stock and heritage of all. Therefore, be kind to Shema, that yourselves may not be left deserted in your need. Alone beside a lake their wigwam stood, far from the other dwellings of their tribe. And after many moons, the loneliness wearied the elder brother, and he said, Why should I dwell here all alone, shut out from the free natural joys that fit my age? Lo, I am tall and strong, well skilled to hunt, patient of toil and hunger, and not yet have seen the danger which I dared not look full in the face. What hinders me to be a mighty brave and chief among my kin? So taking up his arrows and his bow, as if to hunt, he journeyed swiftly on until he gained the wigwams of his tribe, where, choosing out a bride, he soon forgot in all the fret and bustle of new life the little Shema and his father's charge. Now when the sister found her brother gone, and that for many days he came not back, she wept for Shema more than for herself, for love bides longest in a woman's heart, and flutters many times before he flies, and then doth perch so nearly that a word might lure him back, as swift and glad as light. And duty lingers even when love is gone off, looking out in hope of his return. And after duty hath been driven forth, then selfishness creeps in the last of all, warming her lean hands at the lonely hearth, and crouching o'er the embers to shut out whatever paltry warmth and light are left, with avaricious greed from all beside. So for long months the sister hunted wide, and cared for little Shima tenderly. But daily more and more the loneliness grew wearisome, and to herself she sighed, Am I not fair? At least the glassy pool that hath no cause to flatter tells me so. But oh, how flat and meaningless the tale, unless it tremble on a lover's tongue. Beauty hath no true glass, except it be in the sweet privacy of loving eyes. Thus deemed she idly, and forgot the lore which she had learned of nature and the woods that beauty's chief reward is to itself, and that the eyes of love reflect alone the inward fairness, which is blurred and lost unless kept clear and white by duty's care. So she went forth and sought the haunts of men, and being wedded in her household cares, soon, like the elder brother, quite forgot the little Shema and her father's charge. But Shema, left alone within the lodge, waited and waited with a shrinking heart, thinking each rustle was his sister's step, till hope grew less and less and then went out, and every sound was changed from hope to fear. Few sounds there were, the dropping of a nut, the squirrel's chirrup, and the jay's harsh scream autumn's sad remnants of blithe summer's cheer heard at long intervals seemed but to make the dreadful void of silence silenter 
Soon what small store his sister left was gone, and through the autumn he made shift to live on roots and berries, gathered in much fear of wolves, whose ghastly howl he heard oft-times, hollow and hungry at the dead of night. But winter came at last, and when the snow thick heaped for gleaming leagues o'er hill and plain, spread its unbroken silence over all, made bold by hunger, he was fain to glean, more sick at heart than Ruth, and all alone. After the harvest of the merciless wolf, grim Boaz, who sharp-ribbed and gaunt, yet feared a thing more wild and starving than himself, till by degrees the wolf and he grew friends, and shared together all the winter through. Late in the spring, when all the ice was gone, the elder brother, fishing in the lake upon whose edge his father's wigwam stood, heard a low moaning noise upon the shore, half like a child, it seemed, half like a wolf. And straightway there was something in his heart that said, It is thy brother Shema's voice. So paddling swiftly to the bank, he saw within a little thicket close at hand a child that seemed fast changing to a wolf, from the neck downward, gray with shaggy hair, that still crept on and upward as he looked. The face was turned away, but well he knew that it was Shema's, even his brother's face. Then with his trembling hands he hid his eyes, and bowed his head, so that he might not see the first look of his brother's eyes, and cried, Oh, Shema, oh, my brother, speak to me. Dost thou not know me, that I am thy brother? Come to me, little Shema. Thou shalt dwell with me henceforth, and know no care or want. Shema was silent for a space, as if it were hard to summon up a human voice, and when he spake, the sound was of a wolf's. I know thee not, nor art thou what thou sayest. I have none other brethren than the wolves, and till thy heart be changed from what it is, thou art not worthy to be called their kin. Then groaned the other with a choking tongue, Alas, my heart is changed right bitterly, tis shrunk and parched within me even now. And looking upward fearfully, he saw only a wolf that shrank away and ran, ugly and fierce, to hide among the woods. End of poem. Author's note. For the leading incident in this tale, I am indebted to the very valuable Algic researches of Henry R. Schoolcraft, Esquire. Answers on Freedom by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Stanzas on Freedom Men, whose boast it is that ye Come of fathers brave and free, If there breathe on earth a slave, Are ye truly free and brave? If ye do not feel the chain When it works a brother's pain, Are ye not base slaves indeed, Slaves unworthy to be freed? Women, who shall one day bear Sons to breathe New England air, If ye hear without a blush Deeds to make the roused blood rush like red lava through your veins, for your sisters now in chains. Answer, are you fit to be mothers of the brave and free? Is true freedom but to break fetters for our own dear sake, and with leathern hearts forget that we owe mankind a debt? No, true freedom is to share all the chains our brothers wear, and with heart and hand to be earnest to make others free. They are slaves who fear to speak for the fallen and the weak. They are slaves who will not choose hatred, scoffing, and abuse, rather than in silence shrink from the truth they needs must think. They are slaves who dare not be in the right with two or three. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Columbus by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org. 
by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. The cordage creaks and rattles in the wind, with freaks of sudden hush the reeling sea, now thumps like solid rock beneath the stern, now leaps with clumsy wrath, strikes short and falling, crumbled to whispery foam, slips rustling down. The broad backs of the waves, with jostle and crowd, To fling themselves upon that unknown shore. There used familiar since the dawn of time, Whither this foredoomed life is guided on, To sway on triumph's hushed, aspiring poise. One glittering moment, then to break fulfilled. How lonely is the sea's perpetual swing, The melancholy wash, of endless waves the sigh of some grim monster undecried fear painted on the canvas of the dark shifting on his uneasy pillow of brine yet night brings more companions than the day to this drear waste new constellations burn and fairer stars with whose calm height my soul finds nearer sympathy than with my herd of earth and souls whose vision's scanty ring makes me its prisoner to beat my wings against the cold bars of their unbelief knowing in vain my own free heaven beyond o oh god this world so crammed with eager life that comes and goes and wanders back to silence like the idle wind which yet man's shaping mind can make his drudge to swell the longing sails of highest endeavor this mad unthrift world which every hour throws life enough away to make her deserts kind and hospitable lets her great destinies be waved aside by smooth lip reverent formal infidels who weigh the god they not believe with gold and find no spot in Judas, save that he, driving a duller bargain than he ought, saddled his guild with too cheap precedent. O faith, if thou art strong, thine opposite is mighty also, and the dull fool's sneer hath oft time shot chill palsy through the arm, just lifted to achieve its crowning deed, and made the firm based heart that would have quailed the rack or faggot shudder like a leaf wrinkled with frost and loose upon its stem the wicked and the weak by some dark law have a strange power to shut and rivet down their own horizon round us to unwing our heaven aspiring visions and to blur with surly clouds the future's gleaming peaks far seen across the brine of thankless years if the chosen soul can never be alone in deep mid silence open door to god no greatness ever had been dreamed or done among dull hearts a prophet never grew the nurse of full-grown souls is solitude the old world is a feat their man with man jostles and in the brawl for means to live life is trod under foot life the one block of marble that's vouchsafed wherefrom to carve our great thoughts white and godlike to shine down the future life the irredeemable block which one or hasty chisel's dint oft mars scanting our room to cut the features out of our full hope so forcing us to crown with a mean head the perfect limbs or leave the god's face glowing o'er a satyr's trunk failure's brief epitaph yes europe's world reels on to judgment there the common need losing god's sacred use to be a bond twixt me and thee sets each one scowlingly o'er his own selfish hoard at bay no state knit strongly with eternal fibres up of all men's separate and united wheels self-poised and soulless stars 
yet one is light, holds up a shape of large humanity, to which by natural instinct every man pays loyalty exulting, by which all mould their own lives and feel their pulses filled with the red fiery blood of the general life, making them mighty in peace as now in war. They are, even in the flesh of victory, weak, conquering that manhood which should them subdue. And what gift bring I to this untried world? Shall the same tragedy be played anew, and the same lurid curtain drop at last, on one dread desolation, one fierce crash, of that recoil which on its maker's God, that's ignorance and sin and hunger make? Early or late, or shall that commonwealth, whose potent unity and concentric force, can draw these scattered joints and parts of men, into a whole ideal man once more, which sucks not from its limbs the life away, but sends its flood tide and creates itself over again in every citizen? Be there built up, for me I have no choice. I might turn back to other destinies, for one sincere key opes all fortune's doors, but whoso answers not God's earliest call, forfeits or dulls that faculty supreme, of lying open to his genius, which makes the wise heart certain of its ends. Here am I, for what end God knows, not I. Westward still points the inexorable soul. Here am I, with no friends but the sad sea, the beating heart of this great enterprise, which, without me, would stiffen in swift death. This have I mused on, since mine eye could first, among the stars distinguish, and with joy, rest on that God-fed Pharos of the north, on some blue promontory of heaven lighted, that juts far out into the upper sea. To this one hope my heart hath clung for years, as would a foundling to the talisman, hung round his neck by hands he knew not whose. A poor, vile thing and dross to all beside, yet he therein can feel a virtue left by the sad pressure of a mother's hand. And unto him it still is tremulous, with palpitating haste and wet with tears. The key to him of hope and humanness, the coarse shell of life's pearl, expectancy. This hope hath been to me for love and fame, hath made me wholly lonely on the earth, building me up as in a thick-ribbed tower, wherewith in walled my watching spirit burned, conquering its little island from the dark, soul as a scholar's lamp, and heard men's steps in the far hurry of the outward world, pass dimly forth and back, sounds heard in dream, as Ganymede by the eagle was snatched up. From the gross sod to be Jove's cup-bearer, so was I lifted by my great design, and who hath trod Olympus from his eye, fades not that broader outlook of the gods. His life's low valleys over brow earth's clouds, and that Olympian spectre of the past, looms towering up in sovereign memory, beckoning his soul for meaner heights of doom. Had but the shadow of the thunderer's bird, flashing athwart my spirit made of me, a swift betraying vision's Ganymede, yet to have greatly dreamed precludes low ends. Great days have ever such a morning read, on such a base great futures are built up. And aspiration, though not put in act, comes back to ask its plighted trough again, still watches round its grave the unlaid ghost of a dead virtue, and makes other hopes, save that implacable one, seem thin and bleak, as shadows of bare trees upon the snow, bound freezing there by the unpitying moon. While other youths perplexed their mandolins, Praying that Thetis would her fingers twine In the loose glories of her lover's hair. And while another kiss to keep back day, 
I, stretched beneath the many centuried shade of some writhed oak, the woods lacoon, did of my hope a dryad mistress make, whom I would woo to meet me privily. Or underneath the stars, or when the moon flecked all the forest floor with scattered pearls. O oh, days whose memory tames to fawning down the surly fell of ocean's bristled neck. I know not when this hope enthralled me first, but from my boyhood up I love to hear the tall pine forests of the Apennine murmur their hoary legends of the sea, which hearing I in vision clear beheld the sudden dark of tropic night shut down o'er the huge whisper of great watery wastes the while a pair of herons trailingly flapped inland where some league-wide river hurled the yellow spoil of unconjectured realms far through a gulf's green silence never scarred by any but the north wind's hurrying keels and not the pines alone all sights and sounds to my world-seeking heart paid fealty, and catered for it as the Cretan bees, brought honey to the baby Jupiter, who in his soft hand crushed the violet, godlike for musing the rough thunder's gripe. Then did I entertain the poet's song, my great ideas guessed, and, passing o'er, that iron bridge the Tuscan built to hell. I heard Ulysses tell of mountain chains, whose adamantine links, his manacles, the western main shook growling, and still gnawed. I brooded on the wise Athenian's tale, of happy Atlantis, and heard Bjorn's keel, crunch the grey pebbles of the Vinland shore. For I believe the poets, it is they, who utter wisdom from the central deep, and, listening to the inner flow of things, speak to the age out of eternity ah me old hermits sought for solitude in caves and desert places of the earth where their own heartbeat was the only stir a living thing that comforted the ear but the bald pillar top of simeon in midnight's blankest waste were populous matched with the isolation drear and deep of him who pines among the swarm of men, at once a new thought's king and prisoner, feeling the truer life within his life, the fountain of his spirit's prophecy. Sinking away and wasting, drop by drop, in the ungrateful sands of septic years, he in the palace aisles of untrod woods, doth walk a king, for him the pent-up cell, widens beyond the circles of the stars and all the sceptred spirits of the past come thronging in to greet him as their peer but in the market-places glare and throng he sits apart in exile and his brow aches with the mocking memory of its crown but to the spirit select there is no choice he cannot say this will i do or that for the cheap means putting heaven's ends in pawn, And bartering his bleak rocks, the freehold stern, Of destiny's firstborn, for smoother fields, That yield no crop of self-denying will, A hand is stretched to him from out the dark, Which grasping without question he is led, Where there is work that he must do for God, The trial still is the strength's complement, and the uncertain, dizzy path that scales, the sheer heights of supremest purposes, is steeper to the angel than the child. Chances have laws as fixed as planets have, and disappointments dry and bitter root. Envy's harsh berries in the choking pool of the world's scorn are the right mother milk. To the tough hearts that pioneer their kind, and break a pathway to those unknown realms that in the earth's broad shadow lie enthralled endurance is the crowning quality and patience all the passion of great hearts these are their stay and when the leaden world sets its hard face against their fateful thought and brute strength like a scornful conqueror 
clangs his huge mace down in the other scale. The inspired soul but flings his patience in, and slowly that outweighs the ponderous globe. One faith against the whole earth's unbelief, one soul against the flesh of all mankind. Thus ever seems it, when my soul can hear, the voice that errs not, then my triumph gleams, o'er the blank ocean beckoning, and all night. My heart flies on before me as I sail. Far on I see my lifelong enterprise, which rose like Ganges mid the freezing snows, of a world's sordidness sweep broadening down, and, gathering to itself a thousand streams, grow sacred ere it mingle with the sea. I see the ungated wall of chaos old, with blocks cyclopean, hewn of solid night, fade like a wreath of unreturning mist, before the irreversible feet of light. And lo, with what clear omen in the east, on day's gray threshold stands the eager dawn, like young Leander rosy from the sea, glowing at hero's lattice. One day more, these muttering shoal brains leave the helm to me. God, let me not in their dull ooze be stranded. Let not this one frail bark to hollow which I have dug out the pith and sinewy heart of my aspiring life's fair trunk be so. Cast up to warp and blacken in the sun, just as the opposing wind gins whistle off. His cheek swollen mates and from the leaning mast fortune's full sail strains forward one poor day remember whose and not how short it is it is god's day it is columbus's a lavish day one day with life and heart is more than time enough to find a world eighteen forty four end of poem this recording is in the public domain. President of the Fire at Omberg by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Lois Beachy Yoder, Charlotte, North Carolina, November 18, 2015. The tower of old St. Nicholas soared upward to the skies like some huge piece of nature's make the growth of centuries you could not deem its crowding spires a work of human art they seemed to struggle lightward from a sturdy living heart not nature's self more freely speaks in crystal or in oak than through the pious builder's hand in that gray pile she spoke and as from acorn springs the oak so freely and alone sprang from his heart this hymn to God, sung in obedient stone. It seemed a wondrous freak of chance, so perfect yet so rough, a whim of nature crystallized slowly in granite tough. The thick spires yearned towards the sky in quaint harmonious lines, and in broad sunlight bask and slept like a grove of blasted pines. Never did rock or stream or tree lay claim with better right to all the adorning sympathies of shadow and of light. And in that forest petrified, as forester there dwells stout Herman, the old sacristan, so lord of all its bells. Surge leaping after surge, the fire roared onward red as blood till half of Hamburg lay engulfed beneath the eddying flood. For miles away the fiery spray poured down its deadly rain, and back and forth the billows sucked and paused and burst again. From square to square with tiger leaps panted the lustful fire, the air to leeward shuddered with gasps of its desire, and church and palace, which even now stood whelmed but to the knee, lift their black roofs like breakers lone amid the whirling sea. Up in his tower old Herman sat and watched with quiet look, 
His soul had trusted God too long to be at last forsook. He could not fear, for surely God a pathway would unfold through this Red Sea for faithful hearts, as once he did of old. But scarcely can he cross himself, or on his good saint call, before the sacrilegious flood or leap the churchyard wall, and ere a potter half was said, mid smoke and crackling glare, his island tower scarce juts its head above the wide despair. Upon the peril's desperate peak his heart stood up sublime. His first thought was for God above, his next was for his chime. Sing now, and make your voices heard in hymns of praise, cried he, as did the Israelites of old, safe walking through the sea. Through this Red Sea our God hath made the pathway safe to shore. Our promised land stands full in sight. Shout now, as near before. And as the tower came crushing down, the bells in clear accord pealed forth the grand old German hymn, all good souls praise the lord end of poem this recording is in the public domain by james russell lowell read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson i saw a sower walking slow across the earth from east to west his hair was white as mountain snow, his head drooped forward on his breast. With shriveled hands he flung his seed, nor ever turned to look behind. Of sight or sound he took no heed, it seemed he was both deaf and blind. His dim face showed no soul beneath, yet in my heart I felt a stir, as if I looked upon the sheath that once had clasped Excalibur i heard as still the seed is cast how crooning to himself he sung i sow again the holy past the happy days when i was young then all was wheat without a tear then all was righteousness fair and true and i am he whose thoughtful care shall plant the old world in the new the fruitful germs i scatter free with busy hand while all men sleep in europe now from sea to sea the nations bless me as they reap then i looked back along his path and heard the clash of steel on steel where man faced man in deadly wrath while while clanged the tocsin's hurrying peal the sky with burning towns flared red nearer the noise of fighting rolled and brother's blood by brother's shed crept curdling over pavements cold then marked i how each germ of truth which through the dotard's fingers ran was mated with a dragon's tooth whence there sprung up an armed man i shouted but he could not hear made signs but these he could not see and still without a doubt or fear broadcast he scattered anarchy long to my straining ears the blast brought faintly back the words he sung i saw again the holy past the happy days when i was young end of poem this recording is in the public domain by james russell lowell read for librivox dot org by sonia hunger and cold sisters too all praise to you with your faces pinched and blue to the poor man you've been true from of old you can speak the keenest word you are sure of being heard from the point you never stirred hunger and cold let sleek statesmen temporize palsied are their shifts and lies when they meet your bloodshot eyes grim and bold policy you set at naught in their traps you'll not be caught you're too honest to be bought hunger and cold bold and bar the palace door while the mass of men are poor naked truth grows more and more uncontrolled you had never yet i guess any praise for bashfulness you can visit sans court dress hunger and cold 
While the music fell and rose, And the dance reeled to its close, Where her round of costly woes Passion strolled, I beheld with shuddering fear Wolves' eyes through the windows peer. Little dream they you are near, Hunger and cold. When the toiler's heart you clutch, Conscience is not valued much. He wrecks not a bloody smutch on his gold. Everything to you defers, you are potent reasoners. At your whisper treason stirs, hunger and cold. Rude comparisons you draw, words refuse to sate your maw. Your gaunt limbs the cobweb law cannot hold. You are not clogged with foolish pride, but can seize the right denied. Somehow God is on your side, hunger and cold. You respect no hoary wrong, more for having triumphed long. Its past victims, haggard throng, from the mould you unbury, swords and spears, weaker art than poor men's tears, weaker than your silent years, hunger and cold. Let them guard both hall and bower, through the window you will glower, patient till your reckoning hour shall be told. Cheeks are pale, but hands are red, guiltless blood may chance be shed, but ye must and will be fed, hunger and cold. God has plans man must not spoil, some were made to starve and toil, some to share the wine and oil, we are told. Devil's theories are these, stifling hope and love and peace, framed your hideous lusts to please, hunger and cold. Scatter ashes on thy head, tears of burning sorrow shed, earth and be by pity led to love's fold. Ere they block the very door with lean corpses of the poor, and will hush for naught but gore, hunger and cold. 1844 End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Landlord by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Lois B. Yoder, Charlotte, North Carolina January 6, 2016 What boot your houses and your lands, In spite of close-drawn deed and fence, Like water twixt your cheated hands, They slip into the graveyard sands And mock your ownership's pretense. How shall you speak to urge your right, Choked with that soil for which you lust the bit of clay, For whose delight you grasp is mortgage too, Death might foreclose this very day in dust. Fence as you please, this poor plain man, Whose only fields are in his wit, Who shapes the world as best he can, According to God's higher plan, Owns you and fences as is fit. Though yours the rents, his incomes wax by right of eminent domain. From factory tall to woodman's axe, all things on earth must pay their tax to feed his hungry heart and brain. He takes you from your easy chair, and what he plans that you must do. You sleep in down, eat dainty fare. He mounts his crazy garret stair and starves the landlord over you. Feeding the clods your idlest drains, you make more green six feet of soil. His fruitful word, like suns and rains, Partakes the season's bounteous pains, And toils to lighten human toil. Your lands with force or cunning got, Shrink to the measure of the grave. But death himself abridges not the tenures of almighty thought, The titles of the wise and brave. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a Pine Tree by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Lois Beachy Yoder Charlotte, North Carolina Far up on Katahdin thou towerest purple-blue with the distance and vast, like a cloud o'er the lowlands thou lowerest, that hangs poised on a law in the blast, 
to its fall leaning awful. In the storm, like a prophet or maddened, thou singest and tossest thy branches. Thy heart with the terror is gladdened. Thou forebodest the dread avalanches when whole mountains swoop veilward. In the calm thou o'erstretchest the valleys with thine arms, as if blessings imploring, like an old king led forth from his palace, when his people to battle are pouring from the city beneath him. To the lumberer asleep neath thy glooming thou dost sing of wild billows in motion, till he longs to be swung mid their booming, in the tents of the Arabs of ocean, whose finned isles are their cattle. For the gale snatches thee for his lyre, with mad hand crashing melody frantic, while he pours forth his mighty desire to leap down on the eager Atlantic, whose arms stretch to his playmate. The wild storm makes his lair in thy branches, praying thence on the continent under, like a lion crouched close on his haunches, there awaiteth his leap the fierce thunder, growling low with impatience. Spite of winter, thou keep'st thy green glory, lusty father of titans past number. The snowflakes alone make thee hoary, nestling close to thy branches in slumber, and thee mantling with silence. Thou alone knowest the splendor of winter, mid thy snow-silvered hushed precipices, hearing crags of green ice groan and splinter, and then plunge down the muffled abysses in the quiet of midnight. Thou alone knowest the glory of summer, gazing down on thy broad seas of forest, on thy subjects that send a proud murmur up to thee, to their sachem, who towerest from thy bleak throne to heaven. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. O in Infernum, Ades, by James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org, by Sonia. Si descendero in infernum, Hades. O wandering dim on the extremest edge of God's bright providence, whose spirits sigh drearily in you, like the winter sedge that shivers over the dead pool stiff and dry, a thin, sad voice when the bold wind roars by from the clear north of duty, still by cracked arch and broken shaft I trace that here was once a shrine and holy place of the supernal beauty a child's play altar reared of stones and moss with wilted flowers for offering laid across mute recognition of the all-ruling grace how far are ye from the innocent from those whose hearts are as a little lane serene smooth heaped from wall to wall with unbroke snows or in the summer blithe with lamb cropped green save the one track where naught more rude is seen than the plump wain at even bringing home four months sunshine bound in sheaves how far are ye from those yet who believes that ye can shut out heaven your souls partake its influence not in vain nor all unconscious as that silent lane its drift of noiseless apple blooms receives Looking within myself, I note how thin a plank of station, chance or prosperous fate, doth fence me from the clutching waves of sin. In my own heart I find the worst man's mate, and see not dimly the smooth hinged gate that opens to those abysses where ye grope darkly, ye who never knew on your young heart's love's consecrating dew, or felt the mother's kisses, or home's restraining tendrils round you curled ah side by side with heart's ease in this world the fatal nightshade grows and bitter rue one band ye cannot break the force that clips and grasps your circles to the central light yours is the prodigal comet's long ellipse self-exiled to the farthest verge of night 
Yet strives with you no less that inward might No sin hath ever imbruted. The God in you, the creed dimmed eye eludes, The law brooks not to have its solitudes By bigot feet polluted. Yet they who watch your God-compelled return May see your happy perihelion burn, Where the calm sun his unfledged planets broods. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Past by James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. To the past. Wondrous and awful are thy silent halls, O kingdom of the past. There lie the bygone ages in their palls, guarded by shadows vast. There all is hushed and breathless, save when some image of old error falls, earth worshipped once as deathless. There sits drear Egypt mid beleaguered sands half woman and half beast, the burnt-out torch within her mouldering hands that once lit all the east. A dotard, blared and hoary, there Assa crouches over the blackened brands of Asia's long-quenched glory. Still as a city buried neath the sea, thy courts and temples stand, idle as forms on wind-wave tapestry of saints and heroes grand. Thy phantasms grope and shiver, or watch the loose shores crumbling silently into time's gnawing river. Titanic shapes with faces blank and dun of their old godhead lorn gaze on the embers of the sunken sun, which they misdeem for morn. And yet the eternal sorrow in their unmonarched eyes says day is done without the hope of morrow. O realm of silence and of swart eclipse, the shapes that haunt thy gloom, make signs to us and move their withered lips across the gulf of doom. Yet all their sound and motion bring no more freight to us than wraith of ships on the mirage's ocean. And if sometimes a moaning wandereth from out thy desolate halls, if some grim shadow of thy living death across our sunshine falls, and scares the world to error, the eternal life sends forth melodious breath to chase the misty terror. Thy mighty clamours, wars, and world noise deeds are silent now in dust, gone like a tremble of the huddling reeds beneath some sudden gust. Thy forms and creeds have vanished, tossed out to wither like unsightly weeds from the world's garden banished. Whatever of true life there was in thee leaps in our age's veins. Wield still thy bend and wrinkled empery and shake thine idle chains. To thee thy dross is clinging. For us thy martyrs die, thy prophets see, thy poets still are singing. Here mid the bleak waves of our strife and care float the green fortunate isles, where all thy hero spirits dwell and share our martyrdoms and toils. The present moves attended with all of brave and excellent and fair that made the old time splendid. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Future by James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org by Lois Beecher Yoder, Charlotte, North Carolina. O land of promise, from what Pisgah's height can I behold thy stretch of peaceful bowers, thy golden harvests flowing out of sight, thy nestled homes and sun-illumined towers, gazing upon the sunset's high-heaped gold its crags of opal and of chrysolite, its deeps on deeps of glory that unfold still brightening abysses and blazing precipices, whence but a scanty leap it seems to heaven. Sometimes a glimpse is given of thy more gorgeous realm, thy more unstinted blisses. O land of quiet, to thy shore the surf of the perturbed present rolls and sleeps. Our storms breathe soft as June upon thy turf, and lure out blossoms. To thy bosom leaps as to a mother's the o'erwearied heart, hearing far off and dim the toiling mart, the hurrying feet, the curses without number, encircled with the glow elysian of thine exalting vision, 
out of its very cares woos charms for peace and slumber. To thee the earth lifts up her fettered hands, and cries for vengeance. With a pitying smile thou blessest her, and she forgets her bands, and her old woe-worn face a little while grows young and noble. Unto thee the oppressor looks, and is dumb with awe. The eternal law, which makes the crime its own blind redresser, shadows his heart with perilous foreboding, and he can see the grim-eyed doom from out the trembling gloom its silent-footed steeds toward his palace goading. What promises hast thou for poets' eyes, a weary of the turmoil and the wrong? To all their hopes what overjoyed replies, what undreamed ecstasies for blissful song. Thy happy plains no war-trump's brawling clangor disturbs, and fools the poor to hate the poor. The humble glares not on the high with anger. Love leaves no grudge at less, no greed for more. In vain strives self the godlike sense to smother. From the soul's deeps it throbs and leaps. The noble neath foul rags beholds his long-lost brother. To thee the martyr looketh, and his fires unlock their fangs and leave his spirit free. To thee the poet mid his toil aspires, and grief and hunger climb about his knee, welcome as children. Thou upholdest the lone inventor by his demon haunted, the prophet cries to thee when hearts are coldest, and gazing o'er the midnight's bleak abyss, sees the drowsed soul awaken at thy kiss, and stretch its happy arms, and leap up disenchanted. Thou bringest vengeance, but so loving kindly, the guilty thinks it pity. Taught by thee, fierce tyrants drop the scourges, wherewith blindly their own souls they were scarring. Conquerors see with horror in their hands the accursed spear that tore the meek one's side on Calvary, and from their trophies shrink with ghastly fear. Thou too art the forgiver, the beauty of man's soul to man revealing. The arrows from thy quiver pierce error's guilty heart, but only pierce for healing. O oh, whither, whither, glory-winged dreams, from out life's sweat and turmoil would ye bear me. Shut gates of fancy on your golden gleams. This agony of hopeless contrast spare me. Fade, cheating glow, and leave me to my night. He is a coward who would borrow a charm against the present sorrow from the vague future's promise of delight. As life's alarms nearer roll, the ancestral buckler calls, self-clanging from the walls in the high temple of the soul. Where are most sorrows, there the poet's sphere is. To feed the soul with patience, to heal its desolations, with words of unshorn truth, with love that never wearies. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. By James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Hebe. I saw the twinkle of white feet, I saw the flash of robes descending. Before her ran an influence fleet that bowed my heart like barley bending. As in bare fields the searching bees pilot to blooms beyond our finding, it led me on by sweet degrees, joy's simple honey cells unbinding. Those graces were that seemed grim fates, with nearer love the sky leaned over me, the long-sought secret's golden gates on musical hinges swung before me. I saw the brimmed bowl in her grasp, thrilling with godhood, like a lover I sprang the proffered life to clasp, the beaker fell, the luck was over. The earth has drunk the vintage up, what boots it patch the goblet's splinters, can summer fill the icy cup? whose treacherous crystal is but winter's. O oh, spendthrift, haste, await the gods, 
Their nectar crowns the lips of patience. Haste scatters on unthankful sods the immortal gift in vain libations. Coy Hebe flies from those that woo, and shuns the hands would seize upon her. Follow thy life, and she will sue to pour for thee the cup of honor. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. By James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. I went to seek for Christ, and nature seemed so fair that first the woods and fields my youth enticed, and I was sure to find him there. The temple I forsook, and to the solitude allegiance paid. But winter came and shook the crown and purple from my wood. His snows, like desert sands with scornful drift, besieged the columned aisle and palace gate. My Thebes cut deep with many a solemn rift, but epitaphed her own sepulchred state. Then I remembered whom I went to seek, and blessed blunt winter for his counsel bleak. Back to the world I turned, for Christ, I said, is king. So the cramped alley and the hut I spurned, and as far beneath his sojourning, mid power and wealth I sought, but found no trace of him. And all the costly offerings I had brought, with sudden rust and mold, grew dim. I found his tomb, indeed, where, by their laws, all must on stated days themselves imprison mocking with bread a dead creed's grinning jaws witless how long the life had thence arisen do sacrifice as this they set apart prizing it more than christ's own living heart so from my feet the dust of the proud world i shook then came dear love and shared with me his crust and half my sorrow's burden took after the world's soft bed, its rich and dainty fare, Like down seemed love's coarse pillow to my head. His cheap food seemed as manna rare, Fresh trodden prints of bare and bleeding feet, Turned to the heedless city whence I came. Hard by I saw, and springs of worship sweet Gushed from my cleft heart, smitten by the same. Love looked me in the face and spake no words, but straight I knew those footprints were the Lord's. I followed where they led, and in a hovel rude, with naught to fence the weather from his head, the king I sought for meekly stood, a naked, hungry child, clung round his gracious knee, and a poor hunted slave looked up and smiled to bless the smile that set him free. New miracles I saw his presence do. No more I knew the hovel bare and poor. The gathered chips into the woodpile grew. The broken morsel swelled to goodly store. I knelt and wept. My Christ no more I seek. His throne is with the outcast and the weak. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. THE PRESENT CRISIS by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida When a deed is done for freedom Through the broad earth's aching breast Runs a thrill of joy prophetic Trembling on from east to west And the slave, where'er he cowers Feels the soul within him climb to the awful verge of manhood as the energy sublime of a century bursts full blossomed on the thorny stem of time through the walls of hut and palace shoots the instantaneous throw when the travail of the ages rings earth's systems to and fro at the birth of each new era with a recognizing start nation wildly looks at nation standing with mute lips apart. And glad truth's yet mightier man-child Leaps beneath the future's heart. 
So the evil's triumph sendeth with a terror and a chill, under continent to continent, the sense of coming ill. And the slave, where'er he cowers, feels his sympathies with God, and hot tear drops ebbing earthward, to be drunk up by the sod, till a corpse crawls round unburied, delving in the nobler clod. For mankind are one in spirit, and an instinct bears along, round the earth's electric circle, the swift flush of right or wrong. Whether conscious or unconscious, yet humanity's vast frame, through its ocean-sundered fibers, feels the gush of joy or shame. In the gain or loss of one race, all the rest have equal claim. Once to every man and nation comes a moment to decide, in the strife of truth with falsehood, for the good or evil side. Some great cause, God's new Messiah, offering each the bloom or blight, parts the goats upon the left hand, and the sheep upon the right. And the choice goes by forever, twixt that darkness and that light. Hast thou chosen, O my people, on whose party thou shalt stand, ere the doom from its worn sandals shakes the dust against our land though the cause of evil prosper yet tis truth alone is strong and albeit she wander outcast now i see around her throng troops of beautiful tall angels to enshield her from all wrong backward look across the ages and the beacon moments see that like peaks of some sunk continent jut through oblivion's sea not an ear in court or market for the low foreboding cry of those crises god's stern winnowers from whose feet earth's chaff must fly never shows the choice momentous till the judgment hath passed by careless seems the great avenger history's pages but record one death grapple in the darkness twixt old systems and the word truth forever on the scaffold wrong forever on the throne yet that scaffold sways the future and behind the dim unknown standeth god within the shadow keeping watch above his own we see dimly in the present what is small and what is great slow of faith how weak an arm may turn the iron helm of fate but the soul is still oracular amid the market's din lest the ominous stern whisper from the delphic cave within they enslave their children's children who make compromise with sin slavery the earth-born cyclops fellest of the giant brood sons of brutish force and darkness who have drenched the earth with blood famished in his self-made desert blinded by our purer day gropes in yet unblasted regions for his miserable prey shall we guide his gory fingers where our helpless children play then to side with truth is noble when we share her wretched crust ere her cause bring fame and profit and tis prosperous to be just then it is the brave man chooses while the coward stands aside doubting in his abject spirit till his lord is crucified and the multitude make virtue of the faith they had denied count me o'er earth's chosen heroes they were souls that stood alone while the men they agonized for hurled the contumelious stone stood serene and down the future saw the golden beam incline to the side of perfect justice mastered by their faith divine by one man's plain truth to manhood and to god's supreme design by the light of burning heretics christ's bleeding feet i track toiling up new calvaries ever with a cross that turns not back and these mounts of anguish number how each generation learned one new word of that grand credo which in prophet hearts hath burned since the first man stood god conquered with his face to heaven upturned for humanity sweeps onward where to-day the martyr stands on the morrow crouches judas 
with the silver in his hands. Far in front the cross stands ready, and the crackling faggots burn, while the hooting mob of yesterday in silent awe return, to glean up the scattered ashes into history's golden urn. Tis as easy to be heroes as to sit the idle slaves of a legendary virtue carved upon our fathers' graves. Worshippers of light ancestral make the present light a crime. Was the Mayflower launched by cowards, steered by men behind their time? Turn those tracks toward past or future that make Plymouth Rock sublime? They were men of present valor, stalwart old iconoclasts, unconvinced by axe or gibbet that all virtue was the past's. But we make their truth our falsehood, thinking that hath made us free, hoarding it in moldy parchments, while our tender spirits flee. The rude grasp of that great impulse, which drove them across the sea. They have rights who dare maintain them, we are traitors to our sires, smothering in their holy ashes, freedom's new-lit altar fires. Shall we make their creed our jailer? Shall we, in our haste to slay, from the tombs of the old prophets, steal the funeral lamps away, to light up the martyr faggots round the prophets of to-day? New occasions teach new duties, time makes ancient good uncouth. They must upward still and onward, who would keep abreast of truth. Lo, before us gleam her campfires, we ourselves must pilgrims be launch our mayflower and steer boldly through the desperate winter sea nor attempt the future's portal with the past's blood-rusted key december eighteen forty five end of poem this recording is in the public domain An Indian Summer Reverie by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by J. L. Baldwin What visionary tints the year puts on When falling leaves falter through motionless air Or numbly cling and shiver to be gone? How shimmer the low flats and pastures bare As with her nectar Hebe Autumn fills the bowl Between me and those distant hills And smiles and shakes abroad her misty tremulous hair no more the landscape holds its wealth apart, making me poorer in my poverty, but mingles with my senses and my heart. My own projected spirit seems to me in her own reverie the world to steep. Tis she that waves to sympathetic sleep, moving, as she is moved, each field and hill and tree. How fuse and mix with what unfelt degrees, clasped by the faint horizon's languid arms, each into each the hazy distances, the softened season all the landscape charms, those hills my native village that embay, in waves of dreamier purple roll away, and floating in mirage seem all the glimmering farms. Far distant sounds the hidden chickadee close at my side, far distant sound the leaves. The fields seem fields of dream, where memory wanders like gleaning ruth, and as the sheaves of wheat and barley wavered in the eye of Boaz as the maiden's glow went by, so tremble and seem remote all things the sense receives. The cock's shrill trump that tells of scattered corn passed breezily on by all his flapping mates, faint and more faint from barn to barn is borne, southward perhaps to far Magellan's straits. Dimly I catch the throb of distant flails, silently overhead the hen-hawk sails, with watchful, measuring eye, and for his quarry waits. The sobered robin, hunger silent now, seeks cedar berries blue, his autumn cheer. The squirrel on the shingly shagbark's bough now saws, now lists with downward eye and ear, then drops his nut, and with a chipping bound whisks to his winding fastness underground. The clouds like swans drift down the streaming atmosphere. O'er yon bare knoll, the pointed cedar shadows drowse on the crisp gray moss, the ploughman's call creeps faint as smoke from black, fresh-furrowed meadows. The single crow, a single call lets fall. And all around me, every bush and tree says autumn's here, and winter soon will be. 
who snows his soft white sleep and silence over all. The birch most shy and ladylike of trees, her poverty as best she may retrieves and hints at her foregone gentilities with some saved relics of her wealth of leaves. The swamp oak with his royal purple on glares red as blood across the sinking sun as one who proudlier to a falling fortune cleaves. He looks a sachem in red blanket wrapped who mid some council of the sad garbed whites erect and stern in his own memories lapped with distant eye broods over other sights sees the hushed wood the city's flare replace the wounded turf heal o'er the railway's trace and roams the savage past of his undwindled rights the red oak softer grained yields all for lost and with his crumpled foliage stiff and dry after the first betrayal of the frost rebuffs the kiss of the relenting sky the chestnuts lavish of their long-hid gold to the faint summer beggared now and old pour back the sunshine hoarded neath her favoring eye the ash her purple drops forgivingly and sadly breaking not the general hush the maple swamps glow like a sunset sea each leaf a ripple with its separate flush all round the wood's edge creeps the skirting blaze of bushes low as when on cloudy days ere the rain falls the cautious farmer burns his brush o'er yon low wall which guards one unkempt zone where vines and weeds and scrub oaks intertwine safe from the plough whose rough discordant stone is massed to one soft gray by lichen's vine the tangled blackberry crossed and recrossed weaves a prickly network of ensanguined leaves hard by with coral beads the prim black alders shine pillaring with flame this crumbling boundary whose loose blocks topple neath the ploughboy's foot who with each sense shut fast except the eye creeps close and scares the jay he hoped to shoot the woodbine up the elm's straight stem aspires coiling it harmless with autumnal fires in the ivy's paler blaze the martyr oak stands mute below the charles a stripe of nether sky now hid by rounded apple trees between whose gaps the misplaced sail sweeps bellying by now flickering golden through a woodland screen then spreading out at his next turn beyond a silver circle like an inland pond slips seaward silently through marshes purple and green dear marshes vain to him the gift of sight who cannot in their various incomes share from every season drawn of shade and light who sees in them but levels brown and bare each change of storm or sunshine scatters free on them its largesse of variety for nature with cheap means still works her wonders rare in spring they lie one broad expanse of green o'er which the light winds run with glimmering feet here yellower stripes track out the creek unseen there darker growths or hidden ditches meet and purpler stains show where the blossoms crowd as if the silent shadow of a cloud hung there be calmed with the next breath to fleet all round upon the river's slippery edge witching to deeper calm the drowsy tide whispers and leans the breeze entangling sedge through emerald glooms the lingering waters slide or sometimes wavering throw back the sun and the stiff banks and eddies melt and run of dimpling light and with the current seem to glide in summer tis a blithesome sight to see as step by step with measured swing they pass the wide-ranked mowers wading to the knee their sharp sighs panting through the thick-set grass then stretched beneath a rick's shade in a ring their nooning take while one begins to sing a stave that droops and dies neath the close sky of brass meanwhile the devil may care the bobolink remembering duty in mid-quaver stops just ere he sweeps o'er rapture's tremulous brink and twixt the windrows most demurely drops a decorous bird of business who provides for his brown mate and fledgling six besides and looks from right to left a farmer mid his crops another change subdues them in the fall but saddens not they still show merrier tints though sober russet seems to cover all when the first sunshine through their dewdrops glints look how the yellow clearness streamed across redeems with rarer hues the season's loss as dawn's feet there had touched and left their rosy prints or come when sunset gives its freshened zest lean o'er the bridge and let the ruddy thrill while the shorn sun swells down the hazy west glow opposite the marshes drink their fill and swoon with purple veins 
then slowly fade through pink to brown as eastward moves the shade, lengthening with stealthy creep of Simon's darkening hill. Later and yet ere winter wholly shuts, ere through the first dry snow the runner grates, and the loath cartwheel screams in slippery ruts, while firmer ice the eager boy awaits, trying each buckle and strap beside the fire, and until bedtime plays with his desire, twenty times putting on and off his new-bought skates. Then every morn the river's banks shine bright with smooth plate armor, treacherous and frail. By the frost's clinking hammers forged at night, against which the lances of the sun prevail, giving a pretty emblem of the day, when guiltier arms and light shall melt away, and states shall move free-limbed, loosed from war's cramping nail. And now those waterfalls the ebbing river twice every day creates on either side tinkle, as through their fresh-sparred grots they shiver in grass-arched channels to the sun denied. High flaps and sparkling blue the far-heard crow, the silvered flats gleam frostily below, suddenly drops the gull and breaks the glassy tide. But crowned in turn by vying seasons three, their winter halo hath a fuller ring. This glory seems to rest immovably. The others were too fleet and vanishing. When the hid tide is at its highest flow, or marsh and stream one breathless trance of snow with brooding fullness awes and hushes everything. The sunshine seems blown off by the bleak wind as pale as formal candles lit by day. Gropes to the sea the river dumb and blind, the brown ricks, snow-thatched by the storm in play, show pearly breakers combing o'er their lee, white crests as of some just-enchanted sea checked in their maddest sleep and hanging poised midway. But when the eastern blow, with rain aslant, from mid-sea's prairies green and rolling plains, drives in his wallowing herds of billows gaunt, and the roused Charles remembers in his veins old ocean's blood, and snaps his jives of frost, that tyrannous silence on the shores is tossed in dreary wreck, and crumbling desolation reigns. Edgewise or flat, in druid-like device, with leaden pools between or gullies bare, the blocks lie strewn, a bleak stonehenge of ice, no life, no sound to break the grim despair. Save sullen plunge, as through the sedges stiff, down crackles riverward some thaw-sapped cliff, or when the close-wedged fields of ice crunch here and there. But let me turn from fancy-pictured scenes to that whose pastoral calm before me lies. Here nothing harsh or rugged intervenes. The early evening, with her misty dyes, smooths off the reveled edges of the nigh, relieves the distant with her cooler sky, and tones the landscape down and soothes the wearied eyes. There gleams my native village, dear to me, though higher changes waves each day are seen. Whelming fields, famed in boyhood's history, sanding with houses the diminished green. There in red brick, which softening time defies, stand square and stiff the muses' factories. How with my life knit up is every well-known scene. Flow on, dear river, not alone you flow to outward sight and through your marshes wind, fed from the mystic springs of long ago, your twin flows silent through my world of mind. Grow dim, dear marshes, in the evening's gray. Before my inner sight ye stretch away, and will forever, though these fleshly eyes grow blind. Beyond that hillock's house-bespotted swell, where Gothic chapels house the horse and chaise, where quiet sits and Grecian temples dwell, where Coptic tombs resound with prayer and praise, where dust and mud the equal year divide, there gentle Alston lived and wrought and died transfiguring street and shop with his illumined gaze. Virgilium vidi tantum, I have seen, but as a boy who looks alike on all, that misty hair, that fine undine-like mien, tremulous as down to feeling's faintest call. Ah, dear old homestead, count it to thy fame that thither many times the painter came. One elm yet bears his name, a feathery tree and tall. Swiftly the present fades in memory's glow, our only sure possession is the past. The village blacksmith died a month ago, and dimmed to me the forge's roaring blast. Soon fire new medievals we shall see, oust the black smithy from its chestnut tree, and that hewn down, perhaps, the beehive green and vast. How many times, prouder than king on throne, loosed from the village school dame's A's and B's, panting have I the creaky bellows blown, and watched the pent volcano's red increase, 
then paused to see the ponderous sledge brought down by that hard arm voluminous and brown from the white iron swarm its golden vanishing bees dear native town whose choking elms each year with eddying dust before their time turn gray pining for rain to me thy dust is dear it glorifies the eve of summer day and when the westering sun half sunk and burns the moat thick air to deepest orange turns the westward horseman rides through clouds of gold away so palpable i've seen those unshorn few the six old willows at the causey's end such trees paul potter never dreamed nor drew through this dry mist their checkering shadows send striped here and there with many a long-drawn thread where streamed through leafy chinks the trembling red past which in one bright trail the hangbird's flashes blend yes dearer far thy dust than all that e'er beneath the awarded crown of victory gilded the blown olympic charioteer though lightly prized the ribbon parchments three yet colleges chivat i am glad that here what colleging was mine i had it linked another tie dear native town with thee nearer art thou than simply native earth my dust with thine concedes a deeper tie a closer claim thy soil may well put forth something of kindred more than sympathy for in thy bounds i reverently laid away that blinding anguish of forsaken clay that title i seemed to have in earth and sea and sky that portion of my life more choice to me though brief yet in itself so round and whole than all the imperfect residue can be the artist saw his statue of the soul was perfect so with one regretful stroke the earthen model into fragments broke and without her the impoverished seasons roll end of poem this recording is in the public domain Growth of the Legend by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Growth of the Legend A Fragment A legend that grew in the forest's hush Slowly as teardrops gather and gush When a word some poet chanced to say Ages ago in his careless way Brings our youth back to us out of its shroud Clearly as under yon thunder cloud I see that white seagull it grew and grew from the pine trees gathering a sombre hue till it seems a mere murmur out of the vast norwegian forests of the past and it grew itself like a true northern pine first a little slender line like a mermaid's green eyelash and then anon a stem that a tower might rest upon standing spare straight in the waist-deep moss its bony roots clutching around and across as if they would tear up earth's heart in their grasp ere the storm should uproot them or make them unclasp its cloudy boughs singing as suiteth the pine to shrunk snow-bearded sea-kings old songs of the brine till they straightened and let their staves fall to the floor hearing waves moan again on the perilous shore of vinland perhaps while their prow groped its way twixt the frothy gnashed tusks of some ship-crunching bay so pine-like the legend grew strong-limbed and tall as the gypsy child grows that eats crusts in the hall it sucked the whole strength of the earth and the sky spring summer fall winter all brought its supply twas a natural growth and stood fearlessly there a true part of the landscape as sea land and air for it grew in good times ere the fashion it was to force up these wild births of the woods under glass and so if tis told as it should be told though twere sung under venice's moonlight of gold you would hear the old voice of its mother the pine murmur sea-like and northern through every line and the verses should hang self-sustained and free round the vibrating stem of the melody like the lithe sun-steeped limbs of the parent tree yes the pine is the mother of legends what food for their grim roots is left when the thousand-yeared wood the dim aisled cathedral whose tall arches spring light sinewy graceful firm set as the wing from michael's white shoulder is hewn and defaced by iconoclast axes in desperate waste and its wrecks seek the ocean it prophesied long cassandra like crooning its mystical song then the legends grow with them even yet on the sea a wild virtue is left in the touch of the tree and the sailors night watches are thrilled to the core with the lineal offspring of Odin and Thor.
Yes, wherever the pine wood has never let in, Since the day of creation, the light and the din Of manifold life, but has safely conveyed From the midnight primeval its armful of shade, And has kept the weird past with its sagas alive, Mid the hum and the stir of today's busy hive. There the legend takes root in the age gathered gloom, And its murmurous boughs for their tossing find room. Where Eris took, far heard, seems to sob as he goes, Groping down to the sea neath his mountainous snows, Where the lakes frore Sahara of never checked white, When the cracks shoot across it, complains to the night With a long, lonely moan that leaks northward, is lost, As the ice shrinks away from the tread of the frost. Where the lumberers sit by the log fires, which throw Their own threatening shadows far round over the snow, when the wolf howls aloof, and the wavering glare Flashes out from the blackness the eyes of the bear. When the wood's huge recesses, half-lighted, supply A canvas where fancy her mad brush may try, Blotting in giant horrors that venture not down Through the right-angled streets of the brisk, whitewashed town. But skulk in the depths of the measureless wood, Mid the dark's creeping whispers that curdle the blood, when the eye, glanced in dread over the shoulder, may dream, ere it shrinks to the campfire's companioning gleam, that it saw the fierce ghost of the red man crouch back to the shroud of the tree trunk's invincible black. There the old shapes crowd thick round the pine shadowed camp, which shun the keen gleam of the scholarly lamp, and the seat of the legend finds true Norland ground, while the border tales told, and the canteen flits round. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Contrast by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Lois Beachy Yoder Charlotte, North Carolina October 9, 2015 Thy love thou sentest off to me and still as oft I thrust it back. Thy messengers I could not see in those who everything did lack, the poor, the outcast, and the black. Pride held his hand before mine eyes, the world with flattery stuffed mine ears. I looked to see a monarch's guise, nor dreamed thy love would knock for years, poor, naked, fettered, full of tears. Yet when I sent my love to thee, thou with a smile didst take it in, and entertainst it royally. Though grimed with earth, with hunger thin, and leprous with the taint of sin. Now every day thy love I meet, as o'er the earth it wanders wide, with weary step and bleeding feet, still knocking at the heart of pride and offering grace, though still denied. End of poem. Theme Unction by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Go, leave me, priest, my soul would be alone with the consoler death far sadder eyes than thine will see this crumbling clay yield up its breath these shriveled hands have deeper stains than holy oil can cleanse away hands that have plucked the world's coarse gains as erst they plucked the flowers of may call if thou canst to these gray eyes some faith from youth's traditions wrung, This fruitless husk which dustward dries, Has been a heart once, has been young. On this bowed head the awful past, Once laid its consecrating hands, The future in its purpose vast, Paused, waiting my supreme commands. But look whose shadows block the door, who are those two that stand aloof? See, on my hands this freshening gore Writes o'er again its crimson proof. 
my looked-for death-bed guests are met there my dead youth doth wring its hands and there with eyes that goad me yet the ghost of my ideal stands god bends from out the deep and says i gave thee the great gift of life wast thou not called in many ways are not my earth and heaven at strife i gave thee of my seed to sow bringest thou me my hundredfold can i look up with face aglow and answer father here is gold i have been innocent god knows when first this wasted life began not grape with grape more kindly grows than i with every brother man now here i gasp what lose my kind when this fast ebbing breath shall part what bands of love and service bind this being to the world's sad heart christ still was wandering over the earth without a place to lay his head he found free welcome at my hearth he shared my cup and broke my bread now when i hear those steps sublime that bring the other world to this my snake turned nature sunk in slime starts sideway with defiant hiss upon the hour when i was born god said another man shall be and the great maker did not scorn out of himself to fashion me he sunned me with his ripening looks and heaven's rich instincts in me grew as effortless as woodland nooks send violets up and paint them blue yes i who now with angry tears am exiled back to brutish clod have borne unquenched for fourscore years a spark of the eternal god and to what end how yield i back the trust for such high uses given heaven's light hath but revealed a track whereby to crawl away from heaven men think it is an awful sight to see a soul just set adrift on that drear voyage from whose night the ominous shadows never lift but tis more awful to behold a helpless infant newly born whose little hands unconscious hold the keys of darkness and of morn mine held them once i flung away those keys that might have open set the golden sluices of the day but clutch the keys of darkness yet i hear the reapers singing go into god's harvest i that might with them have chosen here below grope shuddering at the gates of night o glorious youth that once wast mine o high ideal all in vain ye enter at this ruined shrine whence worship ne'er shall rise again the bat and owl inhabit here the snake nests in the altar stone the sacred vessels moulder near the image of the god is gone end of poem this recording is in the public domain by james russell lowell read for librivox .org by sonia the oak what gnarl its stretch what depth of shade is his there needs no crown to mark the forest's king how in his leaves outshines full summer's bliss sun storm rain dew to him their tribute bring which he with such benignant royalty accepts as overpayeth what is lent all nature seems his vessel proud to be and cunning only for his ornament how towers he too amid the billowed snows an unquelled exile from the summer's throne whose plain uncinctured front more kingly shows now that the obscuring courtier leaves are flown his boughs make music of the winter air jewelled with sleet like some cathedral front 
where clinging snowflakes with quaint art repair the dints and furrows of time's envious brunt how doth his patient strength the rude march wind persuade to seem glad breaths of summer breeze and win the soil that fain would be unkind to swell his revenues with proud increase he is the gem and all the landscape wide so doth his grandeur isolate the sense seems but the setting worthless all beside an empty socket where he fallen thence so from off converse with life's wintry gales should man learn how to clasp with tougher roots the inspiring earth how otherwise avails the leaf creating sap that sunward shoots so every year that falls with noiseless flake should fill old scars upon the stormward side and make hoar age revered for age's sake not for traditions of youth's leafy pride so from the pinched soil of a churlish fate true hearts compel the sap of sturdier growth so between earth and heaven stand simply great that these shall seem but their attendants both for nature's forces with obedient zeal wait on the rooted faith and oaken will as quickly the pretenders cheat they feel and turn mad pucks to flout and mock him still lord all thy works are lessons each contains some emblem of man's all-containing soul shall he make fruitless all thy glorious pains delving within thy grace an eyeless mole make me the least of thy dodona grove cause me some message of thy truth to bring speak but a word through me nor let thy love among my boughs disdain to perch and sing end of poem this recording is in the public domain James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Ambrose Never, surely, was holier man than Ambrose since the world began. With diet spare and raiment thin, he shielded himself from the father of sin. With bed of iron and scourgings oft, his heart to God's hand as wax made soft. Through earnest prayer and watchings long, he sought to know twixt right and wrong much wrestling with the blessed word to make it yield the sense of the lord that he might build a storm-proof creed to fold the flock in at their need at last he builded a perfect faith fenced round about with the lord thus saith to himself he fitted the doorway's size meted the light to the need of his eyes and knew by a sure and inward sign that the work of his fingers was divine then ambrose said all those shall die the eternal death who believe not as i and some were boiled some burned in fire some sawn in twain that his heart's desire for the good of men's souls might be satisfied by the drawing of all to the righteous side one day as ambrose was seeking the truth in his lonely walk he saw a youth resting himself in the shade of a tree it had never been given him to see so shining a face and the good man thought for pity he should not believe as he ought so he sat himself by the young man's side and the state of his soul with questions tried but the heart of the stranger was hardened indeed nor received the stamp of the one true creed and the spirit of ambrose waxed sore to find such face the porch of so narrow a mind as each beholds in cloud and fire the shape that answers his own desire so each said the youth in the law shall find the figure and features of his mind and to each in his mercy has god allowed his several pillar of fire and cloud the soul of ambrose burned with zeal and holy wrath for the young man's weal believest thou then most wretched youth cried he a individual essence in truth i fear me thy heart is too cramped with sin to take the lord in his glory in now there bubbled beside them where they stood a fountain of waters sweet and good the youth to the streamlet's brink drew near saying ambrose thou maker of creeds look here six vases of crystal then he took and set them along the edge of the brook as into these vessels the water i pour there shall one hold less another more and the water unchanged in every case shall put on the figure of the vase o thou who wouldst unity make through strife canst thou fit this sign to the water of life when ambrose looked up he stood alone 
The youth and the stream and the vases were gone. But he knew by a sense of humbled grace He had talked with an angel face to face, And felt his heart change inwardly As he fell on his knees beneath the tree. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Of and Below by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida 1. O dwellers in the valley land, Who in deep twilight grope and cower, Till the slow mountain's dial hand Shortens to noon's triumphal hour, while ye sit idle, do ye think, The Lord's great work sits idle too, That light dare not, or leap the brink, Of morn, because tis dark with you? Though yet your valleys skulk in night, In God's ripe fields the day is cried, And reapers with their sickles bright, Troop singing down the mountain side. Come up and feel what health there is, in the frank dawn's delighted eyes, As bending with a pitying kiss, The night-shed tears of earth she dries. The Lord wants reapers, oh, mount up, Before night comes and says, too late, Stay not for taking scrip or cup, The master hungers while ye wait. Tis from these heights alone your eyes, The advancing spears of day can see, which o'er the eastern hilltops rise to break your long captivity. 2. Lone watcher on the mountain height, it is right precious to behold the first long surf of climbing light flood all the thirsty east with gold. But we who in the shadow sit know also when the day is nigh, seeing thy shining forehead lit with his inspiring prophecy thou hast thine office we have ours god lacks not early service here but what are thine eleventh hours he counts with us for morning cheer our day for him is long enough and when he giveth work to do the bruised reed is amply tough to pierce the shield of error through but not the less do thou aspire Light's earlier messages to preach. Keep back no syllable of fire. Plunge deep the rowels of thy speech. Yet God deems not thine arid sight More worthy than our twilight dim. For meek obedience too is light, And following that is finding him. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. By James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Kathleen. It was past the hour of trysting, but she lingered for him still. Like a child, the eager streamlet leaped and laughed adown the hill, happy to be free at twilight from its toiling at the mill. Then the great moon, on a sudden ominous and red as blood, startling as a new creation, o'er the eastern hilltop stood, casting deep and deeper shadows through the mystery of the wood dread closed huge and vague about her and her thoughts turned fearfully to her heart if there some shelter from the silence there might be like bare cedars leaning inland from the blighting of the sea yet he came not and the stillness dampened round her like a tomb she could feel cold eyes of spirits looking on her through the gloom she could hear the groping footsteps of some blind gigantic doom Suddenly the silence wavered like a light mist in the wind, for a voice broke gently through it, felt like sunshine by the blind, and the dread, like mist in sunshine, furled serenely from her mind. Once my love, my love forever, flesh or spirit still the same. If I missed the hour of trysting, do not think my faith to blame. I, alas, was made a captive, as from holy land I came on a green spot in the desert gleaming like an emerald star 
or a palm tree in lone silence yearning for its mate afar droops above a silver runnel slender as a scimitar there thou ilt find the humble postern to the castle of my foe if thy love burn clear and faithful strike the gateway green and low ask to enter and the warder surely will not say thee no slept again the aspen silenced but her loneliness was o'er round her heart a motherly patience wrapped its arms for evermore from her soul ebbed back the sorrow leaving smooth the golden shore dawn she now the pilgrim scallop took the pilgrim's staff in hand like a cloud shade flitting eastward wandered she o'er sea and land and her footsteps in the desert fell like a cool rain on the sand soon beneath the palm tree's shadow knelt she at the postern low and thereat she knocketh gently fearing much the warders know all her heart stood still and listen as the door swung backward slow there she saw no surly warder with an eye like bolt and bar through her soul a sense of music throbbed and like a guardian lar on the threshold stood an angel bright and silent as a star fairest seemed he of god's seraphs and her spirit lily wise blossomed when he turned upon her the deep welcome of his eyes sending upward to that sunlight all its due for sacrifice then she heard a voice come onward singing with a rapture new as eve heard the songs in eden dropping earthward with the dew well she knew the happy singer well the happy song she knew forward leaped she o'er the threshold eager as a glancing surf fell from her the spirit's languor fell from her the body's scurf neath the palm next day some arabs found a corpse upon the turf end of poem this recording is in the public domain tree by james russell lowell read for LibriVox.org by kathleen rippling through thy branches goes the sunshine among thy leaves that palpitate for ever ovid in thee a pining nymph had prisoned the soul once of some tremulous inland river quivering to tell her woe but ah dumb dumb for ever while all the forest which with slumberous moonshine holds up its leaves in happy happy silence waiting the dew with breath and pulse suspended i hear afar thy whispering gleamy islands and track thee wakeful still amid the wide hung silence upon the brink of some wood nestled lakelet thy foliage like the tresses of a dryad dripping about thy slim white stem whose shadow slopes quivering down the water's dusky quiet thou shrinkest as on her bath's edge with some startled dryad thou art the go-between of rustic lovers thy white bark has their secrets in its keeping reuben writes here the happy name of patience and thy lithe boughs hang murmuring and weeping above her as she steals the mystery from thy keeping thou art to me like my beloved maiden so frankly coy so full of trembling confidences thy shadow scarce seems shade thy pattering leaflets sprinkle their gathered sunshine o'er my senses and nature gives me all her summer confidences whether my heart with hope or sorrow tremble thou sympathizest still wild and unquiet i fling me down thy ripple like a river flows valleyward where calmness is and by it my heart is floated down into the land of quiet end of poem this recording is in the public domain with miles standish read for LibriVox.org by kathleen i sat one evening in my room in that sweet hour of twilight when blended thoughts half light half gloom throng through the spirit's skylight the flames by fits curled round the bars or up the chimney crinkled while embers dropped like falling stars and in the ashes tinkled i sat and mused the fire burned low and o'er my senses stealing crept something of the ruddy glow that bloomed on wall and ceiling my pictures they are very few the heads of ancient wise men smoothed down their knotted fronts and grew as rosy as excisemen my antique high-backed spanish chair felt thrills through wood and leather that had been strangers since while e'er mid andalusian heather 
the oak that made its sturdy frame his happy arms stretched over the ox whose fortunate hide became the bottom's polished cover it came out in that famous bark that brought our sires intrepid capacious as another ark for furniture decrepit for as that saved of bird and beast a pair for propagation so has the seed of these increased and furnished half the nation kings sit they say in slippery seats but those slant precipices of ice the northern voyager meets less slippery are than this is to cling therein would pass the wit of royal man or woman and whatsoe'er can stay in it is more or less than human i offer to all bores this perch dear well-intentioned people with heads as void as weekday church tongues longer than the steeple to folks with missions whose gaunt eyes see golden ages rising salt of the earth in what queer guise thou art fond of crystallizing my wonder then was not unmixed with merciful suggestion when as my roving eyes grew fixed upon the chair in question i saw its trembling arms enclose a figure grim and rusty whose doublet plain and plainer hose were something worn and dusty now even such men as nature forms merely to fill the street with once turned to ghosts by hungry worms are serious things to meet with your penitent spirits are no jokes and though i am not adverse to a quiet shade even they are folks one cares not to speak first to who knows thought i but he has come by charon kindly ferried to tell me of a mighty sum behind my wainscot buried there is a buccaneerish air about that garb outlandish just then the ghost drew up his chair and said my name is standish i come from plymouth deadly bored with toasts and songs and speeches as long and flat as my old sword as threadbare as my breeches they understand us pilgrims they smooth men with rosy faces strengths knots and gnarls all pared away and varnished in their places we had some toughness in our grain the eye to rightly see us is not just the one that lights the brain of drawing-room tortaeus they talk about their pilgrim blood their birthright high and holy a mountain stream that ends in mud methinks is melancholy he had stiff knees the puritan they were not good at bending the homespun dignity of man he thought was worth defending he did not with his pinchbeck oar his country's shame forgotten gild freedom's coffin o'er and o'er when all within was rotten these loud ancestral boasts of yours how can they else than vex us where were your dinner orators when slavery grasped at texas dumb on his knees was every one that now is bold as caesar mere pegs to hang in office on such stalwart men as these are good sir i said you seem much stirred the sacred compromises now god confound the dastard word my gall thereat arises northward it has this sense alone that you your conscience blinding shall bow your fool's nose to the stone when slavery feels like grinding tis shame to see such painted sticks in veins and winthrop's places to see your spirit of seventy-six drag humbly in the traces with slavery's lash upon her back and herds of office holders to shout applause as with a crack it peels her patient shoulders we forefathers to such a rout know by my faith in god's word half rose the ghost and half drew out the ghost of his old broad sword then thrust it slowly back again and said with reverent gesture no freedom no blood should not stain the hem of thy white vesture i feel the soul in me draw near the mount of prophesying in this bleak wilderness i hear a john the baptist crying far in the east i see up leap the streaks of first forewarning and they who sowed the light shall reap the golden sheaves of morning child of our travail and our woe light in our day of sorrow through my rapt spirit i foreknow the glory of thy morrow i hear great steps that through the shade draw nigher still and nigher and voices call like that which bade the prophet come up higher i looked no form mine eyes could find i hear the red cock growing 
and through my window chinks the wind a dismal tune was blowing thought i my neighbor buckingham hath somewhat in him gritty some pilgrim stuff that hates all sham and he will print my ditty end of poem this poem is in the public domain certain fugitive slaves near washington by james russell lowell read for LibriVox.org by sonia on the capture of certain fugitive slaves near washington look on who will in apathy and stifle they who can the sympathies the hopes the words that make man truly man let those whose hearts are dungeoned up with interest or with ease consent to hear with quiet pulse of loathsome deeds like these i first drew in new england's air and from her hardy breast sucked in the tyrant hating milk that will not let me rest and if my words seem treason to the dullard and the tame tis but my bay state dialect our father spake the same shame on the costly mockery of piling stone on stone to those who won our liberty the heroes dead and gone while we look coldly on and see law-shielded ruffians slay the men who fain would win their own the heroes of to-day are we pledged to craven silence oh fling it to the wind the parchment wall that bars us from the least of human kind that makes us cringe and temporize and dumbly stand at rest while pity's burning flood of words is red hot in the breast though we break our father's promise we have nobler duties first the traitor to humanity is the traitor most accursed man is more than constitutions better rot beneath the sod than be true to church and state while we are doubly false to god we owe allegiance to the state but deeper truer more to the sympathies that god has sent within our spirit's core our country claims our fealty we grant it so but then before man made us citizens, great nature made us man. He's true to God who's true to man, wherever wrong is done, to the humblest and the weakest, neath the all-beholding sun. That wrong is also done to us, and they are slaves most base, whose love of right is for themselves, and not for all their race. God works for all, ye cannot hem the hope of being free, with parallels of latitude, with mountain range or sea. Put golden padlocks on truth's lips, be callous as ye will, from soul to soul, over all the world, leaps one electric thrill. Chain down your slaves with ignorance, ye cannot keep apart, with all your craft of tyranny, the human heart from heart. When first the pilgrims landed on the Bay State's iron shore, the word went forth that slavery should one day be no more. Out from the land of bondage, tis decreed our slaves shall go, and signs to us are offered as earth to Pharaoh. If we are blind, their exodus, like Israel's of yore, through a Red Sea is doomed to be, whose surges are of gore. Tis ours to save our brethren, with peace and love to win their darkened hearts from error, ere they harden it to sin. But if before his duty man with listless spirit stands, Ere long, the great avenger takes the work from out his hands. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Line by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Dear common flower that grows beside the way, Fringing the dusty road with harmless gold, First pledge of blithesome May, Which children pluck and full of pride uphold, High-hearted buccaneers, o'erjoyed that they An Eldorado in the grass have found, Which not the rich earth's ample round may match in wealth, Thou art more dear to me than all the prouder summer blooms may be. Gold such as thy ne'er drew the Spanish prow, through the primeval hush of Indian seas, nor wrinkled the lean brow of age to rob the lover's heart of ease. Tis the spring's largesse which she scatters now to rich and poor alike 
with lavish hand though most hearts never understand to take it at god's value but pass by the offered wealth with unrewarded eye thou art my tropics and mine italy to look at thee unlocks a warmer clime the eyes thou givest me are in the heart and heed not space or time not in mid-june the golden curested bee feels a more summer-like warm ravishment in the white lily's breezy tent his fragrant sybaris than i when first from the dark green thy yellow circles burst then think i of deep shadows on the grass of meadows where in sun the cattle graze where as the breezes pass the gleaming rushes lean a thousand ways of leaves that slumber in a cloudy mass or whiten in the wind of waters blue that from the distance sparkle through some woodland gap and of sky above where one white cloud like a strayed lamb doth move my childhood's earliest thoughts are linked with thee the sight of thee calls back the robin song who from the dark old tree beside the door sang clearly all day long and i secure in childish piety listened as if i heard an angel sing with news from heaven which he could bring fresh every day to my untainted ears when birds and flowers and i were happy peers how like a prodigal doth nature seem when thou for all thy gold so common art thou teachest me to deem more sacredly of every human heart since each reflects in joy its scanty gleam of heaven and could some wondrous secret show did we but pay the love we owe and with a child's undoubting wisdom look on all these living pages of god's book end of poem this recording is in the public domain by james russell lowell read for LibriVox.org by sonia the ghosts here yea who passing graves by night glance not to the left or right lest the spirit should arise cold and white to freeze your eyes some weak phantom which your doubt shapes upon the dark without from the dark within a guess at the spirit's deathlessness which ye entertain with fear in your self-built dungeon here where ye sell your god-given lives just for gold to buy you jives yea without a shudder meet in the city's noonday street spirits sadder and more dread than from out the clay have fled buried beyond hope of light in the body's haunted night see ye not that woman pale there are bloodhounds on her trail bloodhounds too all gaunt and lean for the soul their scent is keen want and sin and sin is last they have followed far and fast want gave tongue and at her howl sin awakened with a growl ah poor girl she had a right to a blessing from the light title deeds to sky and earth god gave to her at her birth but before they were enjoyed poverty had made them void and had drunk the sunshine up from all nature's ample cup leaving her a firstborn's share in the dregs of darkness there often on the sidewalk bleak hungry all alone and weak she has seen in night and storm rooms o'erflown with firelight warm which outside the window glass doubled all the cold alas till each ray that on her fell stabbed her like an icicle and she almost loved the wail of the bloodhounds on her trail till the floor becomes her bier she shall feel their pantings near close upon her very heels spite of all the din of wheels shivering on her pallet poor she shall hear them at the door whine and scratch to be let in sister bloodhounds want and sin hark that rustle of a dress stiff with lavish costliness here comes one whose cheek would flush but to have her garment brush gainst the girl whose fingers thin wove the weary broidery in bending backward from her toil lest her tears the silk might soil and in midnight's chill and murk stitched her life into the work shaping from her bitter thought heart's ease and forget-me-not satirizing her despair 
with the emblems woven there. Little doth the wearer heed of the heartbreak in the breed. A hyena by her side skulks, down looking, it is pride. He digs for her in the earth where lie all her claims of birth, with his foul paws rooting over some long buried ancestor, who perhaps a statue won by the ill deeds he had done, by the innocent blood he shed, by the desolation spread over happy villages, blotting out the smile of peace. There walks Judas, he who sold yesterday his lord for gold, sold God's presence in his heart for a proud step in the mart. He hath dealt in flesh and blood, at the bank his name is good, at the bank and only there, tis a marketable ware. In his eyes that stealthy gleam was not learned of sky or stream, but it has the cold hard glint of new dollars from the mint. Open now your spirit's eyes, look through that poor clay disguise, which has thickened day by day, till it keeps all light at bay, and his soul in pitchy gloom gropes about its narrow tomb, from whose dank and slimy walls drop by drop the horror falls. Look, a serpent lank and cold hugs his spirit fold on fold. From his heart all day and night it does suck God's blessed light. Drink it will and drink it must till the cup holds naught but dust. All day long he hears it hiss, writhing in its fiendish bliss, all night long he sees its eyes flicker with foul ecstasies, as the spirit ebbs away into the absorbing clay. Who is he that skulks, afraid, of the trust he has betrayed, shuddering if, perchance, a gleam of old nobleness should stream through the pent unwholesome room where his shrunk soul cowers in gloom? Spirit sad beyond the rest by more instinct for the best. Tis a poet who was sent for a bad world's punishment, by compelling it to see golden glimpses of to be, by compelling it to hear songs that prove the angels near, who was sent to be the tongue of the weak and spirit wrung, whence the fiery winged despair in man's shrinking eyes might flare. Tis our hope doth fashion us to base use or glorious. He who might have been a lark of truth's morning from the dark Raining down melodious hope of a freer, broader scope. Aspirations, prophecies of the spirit's full sunrise, Chose to be a bird of night, which with eyes refusing light, Hooted from some hollow tree of the world's idolatry. Tis his punishment to hear flutterings of pinions near, And his own vain wings to feel drooping downward to his heel. All their grace and import lost, burdening his weary ghost. Ever walking by his side, he must see his angel guide, who at intervals doth turn, looks on him so sadly stern, with such ever new surprise of hushed anguish in her eyes, that it seems the light of day from around him shrinks away, or drops blunted from the wall build around him by his fall. Then the mountains, whose white peaks catch the morning's earliest streaks, he must see, where prophets sit, turning east their faces lit, whence, with footsteps beautiful, to the earth yet dim and dull, they the gladsome tidings bring of the sunlight's hastening. Never can those hills of bliss be overclimbed by feet like this. But enough, oh, do not dare from the next the veil to tear, woven of station, trade, or dress, more obscene than nakedness, wherewith plausible culture drapes fallen nature's myriad shapes. Let us rather love to mark how the unextinguished spark will shine through the thin disguise of our customs, pomps, and lies, and not seldom blown to flame vindicate its ancient claim. 1844 End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Heads by James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Studies for two heads. One. Some sort of heart I know is hers. I chanced to feel her pulse one night. A brain she has that never errs, and yet is never nobly right. 
It does not leap to great results, But in some corner out of sight Suspects a spot of latent blight, And over the impatient infinite She bargains, haggles, and consults. Her eye, it seems a chemic test, And drops upon you like an acid, It bites you with unconscious zest, So clear and bright, so coldly placid, It holds you quietly aloof, it holds, and yet it does not win you. It merely puts you to the proof and sorts what qualities are in you. It smiles, but never brings you nearer. It lights, her nature draws not nigh. Tis but that yours is growing clearer to her essays. Yes, try and try, you'll get no deeper than her eye. There, you are classified. She's gone, far, far away into herself, each with its Latin label on. Your poor components, one by one, are laid upon their proper shelf, in her compact and ordered mind, and what of you is left behind is no more to her than the wind, in that clear brain which, day and night, no movement of the heart ever jostles. Her friends are ranged on left and right, here silex, hornblende, cyanide, there animal remains and fossils. And yet, O oh, subtile analyst, that canst each property detect of mood or grain, that canst untwist each tangled skein of intellect, and with thy scalpel eyes lay bare each mental nerve more fine than air. O oh, brain exact that in thy scales canst weigh the sun and never err, for once thy patient science fails, one problem still defies thy art. Thou never canst compute for her the distance or diameter of any simple human heart. 2. Hear him but speak, and you will feel the shadows of the portico over your tranquil spirit steal, to modulate all joy and woe to one subdued, subduing glow, above our squabbling business hours, like Phidian Jovis, his beauty lowers, his nature satirizes ours, a form and front of attic grace, he shames the higgling marketplace, and dwarfs our more mechanic powers. What throbbing verse can fitly render that face, so pure, so trembling tender? Sensation glimmers through its rest, it speaks unmanacled by words, as full of motion as a nest that palpitates with unfledged birds. Tis like as to Bethesda's stream, forewarned through all its thrilling springs, white with the angel's coming gleam, and rippled with its fanning wings. Hear him unfold his plots and plans, and larger destinies seem man's, you conjure from his glowing face the omen of a fairer race. With one grand trope he boldly spans the gulf wherein so many fall, twixt possible and actual. His swift word, Talaria shot, exuberant with conscious God, out of the choir of planets blots the present earth with all its spots. Himself unshaken as the sky, his words like whirlwinds spin on high, systems and creeds pell-mell together. Tis strange as to a deaf man's eye, while trees uprooted splinter by, the dumb turmoil of stormy weather. Less of iconoclast than shaper, his spirit, safe behind the reach of the tornado of his speech, burns calmly as a glowworm's taper. So great in speech, but, ah, in act so overrun with vermin troubles, the coarse, sharp-cornered, ugly fact of life collapses all his bubbles. Had he but lived in Plato's day, he might, unless my fancy errs, have shared that golden voice's sway over barefooted philosophers. Our nipping climate hardly suits the ripening of ideal fruits. His theories vanquish us all summer, but winter makes him dumb and dumber. To see him mid life's needful things is something painfully bewildering. He seems an angel with clipped wings, tied to a mortal wife and children and by a brother seraph taken in the act of eating eggs and bacon. Like a clear fountain, his desire exults and leaps toward the light. In every drop it says, aspire, striving for more ideal height, and as the fountain, falling thence, crawls baffled through the common gutter, so from his speech's eminence he shrinks into the present tense, unkinged by foolish bread and butter. Yet smile not, worldling, for in deeds, not all of life that's brave and wise is, he strews an ampler future seeds. Tis your fault if no harvest rises, smooth back the sneer, for is it not that all he is and has is beauties? By soul the soul's gains must be wrought, 
The actual claims our coarser thought, the ideal has its higher duties. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Should of Dante by Giotto, by James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. On a Portrait of Dante by Giotto. Can this be thou who, lean and pale, with such immitigable eye, didst look upon those writhing souls in bale and note each vengeance and pass by unmoved, save when thy heart by chance cast backward one forbidden glance and saw Francesca? with child's glee subdue and mount thy wild horse knee and with proud hands control its fiery prance with half drooped lids and smooth round brow and eye remote that inly sees fair beatrice's spirit wandering now in some sea lulled hesperides thou movest through the jarring street secluded from the noise of feet by her gift blossom in thy hand thy branch of palm from holy land no trace is here of ruin's fiery sleet yet there is something round thy lips that prophesies the coming doom the soft gray herald shadow ere the eclipse notches the perfect disk with gloom a something that would banish thee and thine untamed pursuer be from men and their unworthy fates though florence had not shut her gates and grief had loosed her clutch and let thee free ah he who follows fearlessly the beckonings of a poet heart shall wander and without the world's decree a banished man in field and mart harder than florence's walls the bar which with deaf sternness holds him far from home and friends till death's release and makes his only prayer for peace like thine scarred veteran of a lifelong war End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Friend's Child by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Death never came so nigh to me before, Nor showed me his mild face. Oft had I mused of calm and peace and deep forgetfulness, Of folded hands, closed eye and heart at rest, And slumber sound beneath the flowery turf, Of thoughts forgotten and an inner place Kept sacred for us in the heart of friends. But these were idle fancies, Satisfied with the mere husk of this great mystery, And dwelling in the outward shows of things. Heaven is not mounted to on wings of dreams, nor doth the unthankful happiness of youth aim thitherward, but floats from bloom to bloom, with earth's warm patch of sunshine, while content. Tis sorrow builds the shining ladder up, whose golden rounds are our calamities, whereon our firm feet planting, nearer God, the spirit climbs, and hath its eyes unsealed. True is it that death's face seems stern and cold, when he is sent to summon those we love, but all God's angels come to us disguised. Sorrow and sickness, poverty and death, one after other lift their frowning masks, and we behold the seraph's face beneath, all radiant with the glory and the calm of having looked upon the front of God. With every anguish of our earthly part, the spirit's sight grows clearer. This was meant when Jesus touched the blind man's lids with clay. Life is the jailer. Death, the angel sent, to draw the unwilling bolts and set us free. He flings not ope the ivory gate of rest, only the fallen spirit knocks at that, but to benigner regions beckons us, to destinies of more rewarded toil. In the hushed chamber, sitting by the dead, it grates on us to hear the flood of life whirl rustling onward, senseless of our loss. The bee hums on. Around the blossom vine whirs the light hummingbird, the cricket chirps, the locust's shrill alarum stings the ear, hard by the cock shouts lustily, from farm to farm his cheery brothers telling of the sun. Answer, till far away the joint dies. We never knew before how God had filled the summer airs with happy living sounds. All round us seems an overplus of life, and yet, the one dear heart lies cold and still. 
it is most strange when the great miracle hath for our sakes been done when we have had our inwardest experience of god when with his presence still the room expands and is awed after him that naught is changed that nature's face looks unacknowledging and the mad world still dances heedless on after its butterflies and gives no sign tis hard at first to see it all aright in vain faith blows her trump to summon back her scattered troop yet through the clouded glass of our own bitter tears we learn to look undazzled on the kindness of god's face earth is too dark and heaven alone shines through it is no little thing when a fresh soul and a fresh heart with their unmeasured scope for good not gravitating earthward yet but circling in diviner periods are sent into the world no little thing when this unbounded possibility into the outer silence is withdrawn ah oh, in this world where every guiding thread ends suddenly in the one sure centre death the visionary hand of might have been alone can fill desire's cup to the brim how changed dear friend are thy part and thy child's he bends above thy cradle now or holds his warning finger out to be thy guide thou art the nursling now he watches thee slow learning one by one the secret things which are to him used sights of every day he smiles to see thy wandering glances con the grass and pebbles of the spirit world to thee miraculous and he will teach thy knees their due observances of prayer children are god's apostles day by day sent forth to preach of love and hope and peace nor hath thy babe's mission left undone to me at least his going hence hath given serener thoughts and nearer to the skies and opened a new fountain in my heart for thee my friend and all and oh if death more near approaches meditates and clasps even now some dearer more reluctant hand god strengthen thou my faith that i may see that tis thine angel who with loving haste unto the service of the inner shrine doth waken thy beloved with a kiss 1844 end of poem this recording is in the public domain by james russell lowell read for librivox.org by sonia eurydice heaven's cup held down to me i drain the sunshine mounts and spurs my brain Bathing in grass, with thirsty eye, I suck the last drop of the sky. With each hot sense I draw to the lees the quickening outdoor influences, and empty to each radiant comer a supernaculum of summer. Not Bacchus, all thy grosser juice, could bring enchantment so profuse, though for its press each grape bunch had the white feet of an oread through our coarse art gleam now and then the features of angelic men neath the lewd satire's veiling paint glows forth the sibyl muse or saint the dauber's botch no more obscures the mighty master's portraitures and who can say what luckier beam the hidden glory shall redeem for what chance clod the soul may wait to stumble on its nobler fate or why to his unwarned abode still by surprises comes the god some moment nailed on sorrow's cross may mediate a whole youth's loss some windfall joy we know not whence redeem a lifetime's rash expense and suddenly wise the soul may mark stripped of their simulated dark mountains of gold that pierce the sky girdling its valid poverty i feel ye childhood's hopes return with olden heats my pulses burn Mine be the self-forgetting sweep, the torrent impulse swift and wild, wherewith Tacanic's rock-born child dares gloriously the dangerous leap, and in his sky-descended mood transmutes each drop of sluggish blood by touch of bravery's simple wand to amethyst and diamond, proving himself no bastard slip but a true granite-cradled one, nursed with the rock's primeval drip, the cloud-embracing mountain sun prayer breathed in vain no wishes sway rebuilds the vanished yesterday 
For plated wares of Sheffield stamp We gave the old Aladdin's lamp. 'Tis we are changed. Ah! whither went That undesigned abandonment, That wise, unquestioning content Which could erect its microcosm Out of a weed's neglected blossom, Could call up Arthur and his peers By a low moss's clump of spears, Or in its shingle trireme launched Where Charles in some green inlet branched, could venture for the golden fleece and dragon watched Hesperides, or from its ripple shattered fate Ulysses' chances recreate, when heralding life's every face, there glow the goddess veiling haze, a plenteous forewarning grace, like that most tender dawn that flies before the full moon's ample rise. Methinks thy parting glory shines through yonder grove of singing pines. At that elm vista's end I trace dimly thy sad leave-taking face. Eurydice, Eurydice, the tremulous leaves repeat to me. Eurydice, Eurydice, no gloomier orca swallows thee than the unclouded sunset's glow. Thine is at least Elysian woe. Thou hast good's natural decay, and fadest like a star away into an atmosphere whose shine with fuller day overmasters thine. Entering defeat as were a shrine for us, we turn life's diary o'er to find but one word nevermore. 1845. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Came and went by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. As a twig trembles which a bird lights on to sing, then leaves unbent, so is my memory thrilled and stirred. I only know she came and went. As clasps some lake by gusts unriven, the blue dome's measureless content so my soul held that moment's heaven i only know she came and went as at one bound our swift springs heaps the orchards full of bloom and scent so clove her may my wintry sleeps i only know she came and went an angel stood and met my gaze through the low doorway of my tent the tent is struck the vision stays i only know she came and went oh when the room grows slowly dim and life's last oil is nearly spent one gush of light these eyes will brim only to think she came and went. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Changeling by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. I had a little daughter and she was given to me to lead me gently backward to the heavenly father's knee that i by the force of nature might in some dim wise divine the depth of his infinite patience to this wayward soul of mine i know not how others saw her but to me she was wholly fair and the light of the heaven she came from still lingered and gleamed in her hair for it was as wavy and golden and as many changes took as the shadows of sun-gilt ripples on the yellow bed of a brook to what can i liken her smiling upon me her kneeling lover how it leaped from her lips to her eyelids and dimpled her wholly over till her outstretched hands smiled also and i almost seemed to see the very heart of her mother sending sun through her veins to me she had been with us scarce a twelvemonth 
and it hardly seemed a day when a troop of wandering angels stole my little daughter away or perhaps those heavenly zingari but loosed the hampering strings and when they had opened her cage door my little bird used her wings but they left in her stead a changeling a little angel child that seems like her bud in full blossom and smiles as she never smiled when i wake in the morning i see it where she always used to lie and i feel as weak as a violet alone neath the awful sky as weak yet as trustful also for the whole year long i see all the wonders of faithful nature still worked for the love of me winds wander and dews drip earthward rain falls suns rise and set earth whirls and all but to prosper a poor little violet this child is not mine as the first was i cannot sing it to rest i cannot lift it up fatherly and bliss it upon my breast yet it lies in my little one's cradle and sits in my little one's chair and the light of the heaven she's gone to transfigures its golden hair End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. By James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org, by Hanford. The Pioneer What man would live coffined with brick and stone, imprisoned from the influences of air, and cramped with selfish landmarks everywhere, when all before him stretches, furrowless and lone, the unmapped prairie none can fence or own. What man would read and read the selfsame faces, and like the marbles which the windmill grinds, rub smooth forever with the same smooth minds, this year retracing last year's, every year's, dull traces, when there are woods and unmanned stifled places? What man or one old thought would pour and pour, shut like a book between its covers thin, for every fool to leave his dog's ears in, when solitude is his and God for evermore, just for the opening of a paltry door. What man would watch life's oozy element creep lethyward forever, when he might down some great river drift beyond men's sight, to where the undethroned forest's royal tent broods with its hush or half a continent? What man with men would push and altercate piecing out crooked means for crooked ends, when he can have the skies and woods for friends, snatch back the rudder of his undismantled fate, and in himself be ruler, church, and state. Cast leaves and feathers rot in last year's nest, the winged brood flown thence, new dwellings plan. The surf of his own past is not a man, to change and change his life, to move and never rest, not what we are, but what we hope is best. The wild free woods make no man halt or blind. Cities rob men of eyes and hands and feet, patching one whole of many incomplete. The general plays upon the individual mind, and each alone is helpless as the wind. Each man is some man's servant. Every soul is by some other's presence quite discrowned. Each owes the next through all the imperfect round. Yet not with mutual help, each man is his own goal, and the whole earth must stop to pay his toll. Here, life the undiminished man demands. New faculties stretch out to meet new wants. What nature asks, that nature also grants. Here man is lord, not drudge, of eyes and feet and hands, and to his life is knit with hourly bands. Come out, then, from the old thoughts and old ways before you harden to a crystal cold which the new life can shatter but not mold. Freedom for you still waits, still, looking backward, stays, but widens still the irretrievable space. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Longing by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Of all the myriad moods of mind that through the soul come thronging, Which one was e'er so dear, so kind, so beautiful as longing? The thing we long for, that we are for one transcendent moment Before the present, poor and bare, can make its sneering comment still through our paltry stir and strife glows down the wished ideal and longing moulds in clay what life carves in the marble real to let the new life in we know desire must ope the portal perhaps the longing to be so helps make the soul immortal longing is god's fresh heavenward will with our poor earthward striving we quench it that we may be still content with merely living but would we learn that heart's full scope which we are hourly wronging our lives must climb from hope to hope and realize our longing ah let us hope that to our praise good god not only reckons the moments when we tread his ways but when the spirit beckons that some slight good is also wrought beyond self-satisfaction when we are simply good in thought howe'er we fail in action and a poem this recording is in the public domain france by james russell lowell read for LibriVox.org by leonard wilson of springfield ohio ode to france february eighteen forty eight as flake by flake the beetling avalanches build up their imminent crags of noiseless snow till some chance thrill the loosened ruin launches and the blind havoc leaps unwarned below so grew and gathered through the silent years the madness of a people wrong by wrong there seemed no strength in the dumb toiler's tears no strength in suffering but the past was strong the brute despair of trampled centuries leaped up with one hoarse yell and snapped its bands groped for its right with horny callous hands and stared around for god with bloodshot eyes what wonder if those palms were all too hard for nice distinctions if that meaned throng they whose thick atmosphere no bard had shivered with the lightning of his song brutes with the memories and desires of men whose chronicles were writ with iron pen in the crooked shoulder and the forehead low set wrong to balance wrong and physicked woe with woe they did as they were taught not theirs the blame if men who scattered firebrands reaped the flame they trampled peace beneath their savage feet and by her golden tresses drew mercy along the pavement of the street o oh, freedom freedom is thy morning dew so gory red alas thy light had ne'er shone in upon the chaos of their lair they reared to thee such symbol as they knew and worshipped it with flame and blood a vengeance axe in hand that stood holding a tyrant's head up by the clotted hair what wrongs the oppressor suffered these we know these have found piteous voice in song and prose but for the oppressed their darkness and their woe their grinding centuries what muse had those though hall and palace had nor eyes nor ears hardening a people's heart to senseless stone thou knowest them o earth that drank their tears 
O heaven that heard their inarticulate moan! They noted down their fetters, link by link. Coarse was the hand that scrawled, and red the ink. Rude was their score as suits unlettered men, Notched with the headman's axe upon a block. What marvel if, when came the avenging shock, Twas Ate, not Urania, held the pen. With eye averted and an anguished frown, Loathingly glides the muse through scenes of strife, where, like the heart of vengeance up and down, Throbs in its framework the blood-muffled knife. Slow are the steps of freedom, But her feet turn never backward, Hers no bloody glare, Her light is calm and innocent and sweet, And where it enters there is no despair. Not first on palace and cathedral spire quivers and gleams that unconsuming fire while these stand black against her morning skies the peasant sees it leap from peak to peak along his hills the craftsman's burning eyes own with cool tears its influence mother meek it lights the poet's heart up like a star ah while the tyrant deemed it still afar and twined with golden threads his futile snare that swift convicting glow all round him ran twas close beside him there sunrise whose memnon is the soul of man o broker king is this thy wisdom's fruit a dynasty plucked out as twere a weed grown rankly in a night that leaves no seed could eighteen years strike down no deeper root but now thy vulture eye was turned on spain a shout from paris and thy crown falls off thy race has ceased to reign and thou become a fugitive and scoff slippery the feet that mount by stairs of gold and weakest of all fences one of steel Go and keep school again like him of old, the Syracusan tyrant. Thou mayst feel royal amid a birch-swayed commonweal. Not long can he be ruler who allows his time to run before him. Thou wast not, soon as the strip of gold about thy brows was no more emblem of the people's thought vain were thy bayonets against the foe thou hadst to cope with thou didst wage war not with french men merely no thy strife was with the spirit of the age the invisible spirit whose first breath divine scattered thy frail endeavour and like poor last year's leaves whirled thee and thine into the dark for ever is here no triumph nay what though the yellow blood of trade meanwhile should pour along its arteries a shrunken flow and the idle canvas droop around the shore these do not make a state nor keep it great i think god made the earth for man not to trade and where each humblest human creature can stand no more suspicious or afraid erect and kingly in his right of nature to heaven and earth knit with harmonious ties where i behold the exultation of manhood glowing in those eyes that had been dark for ages or only lit with bestial love and rages there i behold a nation the france which lies between the pyrenees and rhine is the least part of france I see her rather in the soul whose shine burns through the craftsman's grimy countenance in the new energy divine of toil's enfranchised glance. And if it be a dream, if the great future be the little past, neath a new mask which drops and shows at last the same weird mocking face to bulk and blast, yet muse 
a gladder measure suits the theme and the turkin harp love's notes more resolute and sharp throbbing as throbs the bosom hot and fast such visions are of morning there is no vague forewarning the dreams which nations dream come true and shape the world anew if this be a sleep make it long make it deep o father who sendest the harvests men reap while labor so sleepeth his sorrow is gone no longer he weepeth but smileth and steepeth his thoughts in the dawn he heareth hope yonder rain lark like her fancies his dreaming hands wander mid heart's ease and pansies tis a dream tis a vision shrieks mammon aghast the day's broad derision will chase it at last ye are mad ye have taken a slumbering kraken for firm land of the past ah if ye awaken god shield us all then if this dream rudely shaken shall cheat him again since first i heard our north wind blow since first i saw atlantic throw on our fierce rocks his thunderous snow i love thee freedom as a boy the rattle of thy shield at marathon did with a grecian joy through all my pulses run but i have learned to love thee now without the helm upon thy gleaming brow a maiden mild and undefiled like her who bore the world's redeeming child and surely never did thy altars glance with purer fires than now in france while in their bright white flashes wrong's shadow backward cast waves cowering o'er the ashes of the dead blaspheming past o'er the shapes of fallen giants his own unburied brood whose dead hands clinch defiance at the overpowering good and down the happy future runs a flood of prophesying light it shows an earth no longer stained with blood blossom and fruit where now we see the bud of brotherhood and right and a poem this recording is in the public domain parable by james russell lowell read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson said christ our lord i will go and see how the men my brethren believe in me he passed not again through the gate of birth but made himself known to the children of earth then said the chief priests and rulers and kings behold now the giver of all good things go let us welcome him with pomp and state him who alone is mighty and great with carpets of gold the ground they spread wherever the son of man should tread and in palace chambers lofty and rare they lodged him and served him with kingly fare great organs surged across arches dim their jubilant floods in praise of him and in church and palace and judgment hall he saw his image high over all but still wherever his steps they led the lord in sorrow bent down his head and from under the heavy foundation stones the son of mary heard bitter groans and in church and palace and judgment hall he marked great fissures that rent the wall and opened wider and yet more wide as the living foundation heaved and sighed have ye founded your thrones and altars then on the bodies and souls of living men and think ye that buildings shall endure which shelter the noble and crushes the poor with gates of silver and bars of gold ye have fenced my sheep from their father's fold i have heard the dropping of their tears in heaven 
these eighteen hundred years o oh, lord and master not ours the guilt we build but as our fathers built behold thine images how they stand sovereign and sole through all our land our task is hard with sword and flame to hold thy earth forever the same and with sharp crooks of steel to keep still as thou leftest them thy sheep then christ sought out an artisan low-browed stunted haggard man and a motherless girl whose fingers thin pushed from her faintly want and sin these set he in the midst of them and as they drew back their garment him for fear of defilement lo here said he the images ye have made of me end of poem this recording is in the public domain ode by james russell lowell read for librivox by chris bars february twenty third two thousand sixteen Ode, written for the celebration of the introduction of the Cochituate Water into the city of Boston. My name is Water. I have sped through strange dark ways untried before. By pure desire of friendship led, Cochituate's ambassador. He sends four royal gifts by me, long life, health, peace, and purity. I am Ceres cup-bearer I pour, for flowers and fruits and all their kin, her crystal vintage from of yore, stored in old earth's selectest bin, flora's phalerian ripe since God, the wine-press of the deluge trod, in that far isle whence iron-willed the new world sires their bark unmoored. The fairy's acorn cups I filled, Upon the toadstool's silver board, And neath Hearn's oak for Shakespeare's sight, Strewed moss and grass with diamonds bright. No fairies in the Mayflower came, And lightsome as I sparkle here, For Mother Bay State busy dame. I've toiled and drudged this many a year, Throbbed in her engine's iron veins, twirled myriad spindles for her gains. I, too, can weave the warp I set, through which the sun his shuttle throws, and bright as Noah saw it yet. For you the arching rainbow glows, a sight in paradise denied, to unfallen Adam and his bride. When winter held me in his grip, you seized and sent me o'er the wave ungrateful in a prison ship but i forgive not long a slave for soon as summer south winds blew homeward i fled disguised as dew for countless services i'm fit of use of pleasure and of gain but lightly from all bonds i flit nor lose my mirth nor feel a stain from mill and wash tub i escape and take in heaven my proper shape. So free myself to day late, I come from far o'er hill and mead, and here Cochituate's envoy wait to be your blithesome Ganymede, and brim your cups with nectar true that never will make slaves of you. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. By James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org, by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Suggested by the graves of two English soldiers on Concord battleground. The same good blood that now refills the doddered Orient's shrunken veins, the same whose vigor westward thrills, bursting Nevada's silver chains poured here upon the april grass freckled with red the herbage new 
on reeled the battle's trampling mass back to the ash the bluebird knew poured here in vain that sturdy blood was meant to make the earth more green but in a higher gentler mood than broke this april noon serene two graves are here to mark the place at head and foot an unhewn stone o'er which the herald lichens trace the blazon of oblivion these men were brave enough and true to the hired soldier's bulldog creed what brought them here they never knew they fought as suits the english breed they came three thousand miles and died to keep the past upon its throne unheard beyond the ocean tide their english mother made her moan the turf that covers them no thrill sends up to fire the heart and brain no stronger purpose nerves the will no hope renews its youth again from farm to farm the concord glides and trails my fancy with its flow o'erhead the balanced hen hawk slides twinned in the river's heaven below but go whose bay state bosom stirs proud of thy birth in neighbor's right where sleep the heroic villagers born red and stiff from concord fight thought reuben snatching down his gun or seth as ebbed the life away what earthquake rifts would shoot and run world-wide from that short april fray what then with heart and hand they wrought according to their village light twas for the future that they fought their rustic faith in what was right upon earth's tragic stage they burst unsummoned in the humble sock there's the fifth act the curtain first rose long ago on charles block their graves have voices if they threw dice charged with fates beyond their ken yet to their instincts they were true and had the genius to be men fine privilege of freedom's host of even foot soldiers for the right for centuries dead ye are not lost your graves send courage forth and might end of poem this recording is in the public domain by james russell lowell read for LibriVox.org by sonia two we too have autumns when our leaves drop loosely through the dampened air when all our good seems bound in sheaves and we stand reaped and bare our seasons have no fixed returns without our will they come and go at noon our sudden summer burns ere sunset all is snow but each day brings less summer cheer crimps more our ineffectual spring and something earlier every year our singing birds take wing as less the olden glow abides and less the chillier heart aspires with driftwood beached in past spring tides we light our sullen fires by the pinched rushlight's starving beam we cower and strain our wasted sight to stitch youth's shroud up seam by seam in the long arctic night it was not so we once were young when spring to womanly summer turning her dewdrops on each grass blade strung in the red sunrise burning we trusted then aspired believed that earth could be remade to-morrow ah why be ever undeceived why give up faith for sorrow o thou whose days are yet all spring faith blighted once is past retrieving experience is a dumb dead thing the victories in believing end of poem this recording is in the public domain by james russell lowell read for LibriVox.org by sonia freedom are we then wholly fallen can it be that thou north wind that from thy mountains bringest their spirit to our plains and thou blue sea who on our rocks thy wreaths of freedom flingest as on an altar can it be that ye have wasted inspiration on dead ears 
dulled with the too familiar clang of chains the people's heart is like a harp for years hung where some petrifying torrent rains its slow encrusting spray the stiffened chords faint and more faint make answer to the tears that drip upon them idle are all words only a silver plectrum wakes the tone deep buried neath that ever thickening stone we are not free freedom does not consist in musing with our faces toward the past while petty cares and crawling interests twist their spider threads about us which at last grow strong as iron chains to cramp and bind in formal narrowness heart soul and mind freedom is recreated year by year in hearts wide open on the godward side in souls calm cadenced as the whirling sphere in minds that sway the future like a tide no broadest creeds can hold her and no codes she chooses men for her august abodes building them fair and fronting to the dawn yet when we seek her we but find a few light footprints leading mournward through the dew before the day had risen she was gone and we must follow swiftly runs she on and if our steps should slacken in despair half turns her face half smiles through golden hair forever yielding never wholly won that is not love which pauses in the race two close linked names on fleeting sand to trace freedom gained yesterday is no more ours men gather but dry seeds of last year's flowers still there's a charm ungranted still a grace still rosy hope the free the unattained makes us possession's languid hand let fall tis but a fragment of ourselves is gained the future brings us more but never all and as the finder of some unknown realm mounting a summit whence he thinks to see on either side of him the imprisoning sea beholds above the clouds that overwhelm the valley land peak after snowy peak stretch out of sight each like a silver helm beneath its plume of smoke sublime and bleak and what he thought an island finds to be a continent to him first oped so we can from our height of freedom look along a boundless future ours if we be strong or if we shrink better remount our ships and fleeing god's express design trace back the hero freighted mayflower's profit track to europe entering her blood-red eclipse end of poem this recording is in the public domain bibliolatrice by james russell lowell read for LibriVox.org by sonia bibliolatrice bowing thyself in dust before a book and thinking the great god is thine alone o rash iconoclast thou wilt not brook what gods the heathen carves in wood and stone as if the shepherd who from outer cold leads all his shivering lambs to one sure fold were careful for the fashion of his crook there is no broken reed so poor and base no rush the bending tilt of swamp fly blue but he therewith the ravening wolf can chase and guide his flock to springs and pastures new through ways unlooked for and through many lands far from the rich folds built with human hands the gracious footprints of his love i trace and what art thou own brother of the clod that from his hand the crook would snatch away and shake instead thy dry and sapless rod to scare the sheep out of the wholesome day yea what art thou blind unconverted jew that with thy idle volumes covers too wouldst make a jail to coop the living god thou hearst not well the mountain organ tones by prophet ears from hor and sinai caught thinking the cisterns of those hebrew brains drew dry the springs of the all-knower's thought nor shall thy lips be touched with living fire who blows old altar coals with sole desire to well the new the spirit's broken chains god is not dumb that he should speak no more if thou hast wanderings in the wilderness and findst not sinai this thy soul is poor there towers the mountain of the voice no less which whoso seeks shall find but he who bends intent on manna still and mortal ends sees it not neither hears its thundered lore slowly the bible of the race is writ and not on paper leaves nor leaves of stone each age each kindred adds a verse to it 
Texts of despair or hope, of joy or moan. While swings the sea, while mists the mountains shroud, While thunder surges burst on cliffs of cloud, Still at the prophet's feet the nations sit. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. By James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Beaver Brook. Hushed with broad sunlight lies the hill, And, minuting the long day's loss, The cedar's shadow, slow and still, Creeps over its dial of grey moss. Warm noon brims full the valley's cup, The aspen's leaves are scarce astir, Only the little mill sends up Its busy, never-ceasing burr. Climbing the loose-piled wall That hems the road along the mill pond's brink, From neath the arching barberry stems, My footstep scares the shy chewink. Beneath a bony buttonwood The mill's red door lets forth the din, The whitened miller Dust imbued, flits past the square of dark within. No mountain torrent's strength is here, Sweet beaver, child of forest still, Heaps its small pitcher to the ear, And gently waits the miller's will. Swift slips Undine along the race, Unheard, and then with flashing bound, Floods the dull wheel with light and grace, And laughing, hunts the loath drudge round. The miller dreams not at what cost The quivering millstones hum and whirl, nor how for every turn are tossed armfuls of diamond and of pearl. But summer cleared my happier eyes with drops of some celestial juice to see how beauty underlies for evermore each form of use. And more, methought I saw that flood which now so dull and darkling steals thick here and there with human blood to turn the world's laborious wheels. No more than doth the miller there shut in our several cells do we know with what waste of beauty rare moves every day's machinery? Surely the wiser time shall come, when this fine overplus of might, no longer sullen, slow and dumb, shall leap to music and to light. In that new childhood of the earth, life of itself shall dance and play. Fresh blood in time's shrunk veins make mirth, and labor meet delight halfway. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Door by James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Apple Door. How looks Apple Door in a storm? I have seen it when its crags seemed frantic, butting against the maddened Atlantic, when surge after surge would heap enorm cliffs of emerald topped with snow, that lifted and lifted and then let go a great white avalanche of thunder, a grinding, blinding, deafening ire. Monadnock might have trembled under. And the island, whose rock roots pierce below, To where they are warmed with the central fire, You could feel its granite fibres wrecked, As it seemed to plunge with a shudder and thrill, Right at the breast of the swooping hill, And to rise again, snorting a cataract, Of rage froth from every cranny and ledge, While the sea drew its breath in, hoarse and deep, and the next vast breaker curled its edge, gathering itself for a mighty leap. North, east, and south there are reefs and breakers you would never dream of in smooth weather, that toss and gore the sea for acres, bellowing and gnashing and snarling together. Look northward, where Duck Island lies, and over its crown you will see a rise, against the background of slaty skies, a row of pillars, still and white, that glimmer and then are out of sight, as if the moon should suddenly kiss, while you cross the gusty desert by night, the long colonnades of Persepolis, and then as sudden a darkness should follow, to gulp the whole scene at single swallow, the city's ghost, the drear brown waste, and the string of camels, clumsy paced. Look southward for white island light, the lantern stands ninety feet over the tide, there is first a half mile of tumult and fight, of dash and roar, and tumble and fright, and surging bewilderment, wild and wide, where the breakers struggle left and right, then a mile or more of rushing sea, and then the lighthouse, slim and lone, and whenever the whole weight of ocean is thrown, 
full and fair, on White Island Head, a great Miss Jotun you will see, lifting himself up silently, high and huge, over the lighthouse top, with hands of wavering spray outspread, groping after the little tower that seems to shrink and shorten and cower, till the monster's arms of a sudden drop, and silently and fruitlessly he sinks again into the sea. You, meanwhile, where drenched you stand, awaken once more to the rush and roar, and on the rock point tighten your hand, as you turn and see a valley deep that was not there a moment before, suck rattling down between you and the heap of toppling billow, whose instant fall must sink the whole island once for all, or watch the silenter, stealthier seas, feeling their way to you more and more, if they once should clutch you high as the knees, they would whirl you down like a sprig of kelp, beyond all reach of hope or help. And such in a storm is Appledore. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. By James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Dara. When Persia's sceptre trembled in a hand, wilted by harem heats, and all the land was hovered over by those vulture ills that snuff decaying empire from afar, then, with a nature balanced as a star, Dara arose, a shepherd of the hills. He who had governed fleecy subjects well made his own village by the selfsame spell, secure and peaceful as a guarded fold, till, gathering strength by slow and wise degrees, under his sway to neighbor villages order returned and faith and justice old now when it fortuned that a king more wise endued the realm with brain and hands and eyes he sought on every side men brave and just and having heard the mountain shepherd's praise how he rendered the mould of elder days to dara gave a satrapy in trust so Dara shepherded a province wide, nor in his viceroy's sceptre took more pride than in his crook before. But envy finds more soil in cities than on mountains bare, and the frank sun of spirits clear and rare breeds poisonous fogs in low and marish mines. Soon it was whispered at the royal ear that, though wise Dara's province year by year, like a great sponge, drew wealth and plenty up, Yet when he squeezed it at the king's behest, some golden drops, more rich than all the rest, went to the filling of his private cup. For proof, they said that wheresoever he went, a chest beneath whose weight the camel bent, went guarded, and no other eye had seen what was therein, save only Dara's own. Yet when it was opened, all his tent was known to glow and lighten with heaped jewels sheen. The king set forth for Dara's province straight, where, as was fit, outside his city's gate, the viceroy met him with a stately train, and there, with archers circled, close at hand, a camel with the chest was seen to stand. The king grew red, for thus the guilt was plain. "'Open me now,' he cried, "'yon treasure chest.' "'Twas done, and only a worn shepherd's vest was found within. Some blushed and hung the head, not Dara, Open as the sky's blue roof he stood, and, O oh my lord, behold the proof that I was worthy of my trust, he said. For ruling men, lo, all the charm I had, my soul in those coarse vestments ever clad, still to the unstained past kept true and leal, still on these plains could breathe her mountain air, and fortune's heaviest gifts serenely bear, which bend men from the truth and make them real. To govern wisely I had shown small skill, were I not lord of simple Dara still. That sceptre kept, I cannot lose my way. Strange dew in royal eyes grew round and bright, and thrilled the trembling lids. Before it was night, two added provinces blessed Dara's sway. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. J.F.H. By James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. To J. F. H. Nine years have slipped like hourglass sand from life's fast emptying globe away. Since last, dear friend, I clasped your hand and lingered on the impoverished land, watching the steamer down the bay. 
I held the keepsake which you gave, Until the dim smoke pennon curled Over the vague rim tween sky and wave, And closed the distance like a grave, Leaving me to the outer world. The old worn world of hurry and heat, The young fresh world of thought and scope, While you, where silent surges fleet, Toward far sky beaches still and sweet, Sunk wavering down the ocean slope. Come back our ancient walks to tread, Old haunts of lost or scattered friends, Amid the muses' factories red, Where song and smoke and laughter sped The nights to proctor-hunted ends. Our old familiars are not laid, Though snapped our wands and sunk our books, They beckon, not to be gainsaid, Where round broad meads which mowers wade, Smooth charts his steel-blue sickle crooks. Where, as the cloudbergs eastward blow, From glow to gloom the hillside shifts, Its lakes of rye that surge and flow, Its plums of orchard trees arrow, Its snowy white weeds summer drifts. Or led us to Nantasket, There to wander idly as we list, Whether on rocky hillocks bare, Sharp cedar points like breakers tear, the trailing fringes of grey mist. Or whether under skies clear blown the heightening surfs with foamy din, their breeze caught forelocks backward blown against old Neptune's yellow zone, curled slow and plunge forever in. For years thrice three, wise Horace said, a poem rare let silence bind, and love may ripen in the shade, like ours, for nine long seasons late. In crypts and arches of the mind. That right for learning friendship old, While we, to grace our feast, call up, And freely pour the juice of gold That keeps life's pulses warm and bold, Till death shall break the empty cup. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of miscellaneous poems by James Russell Lowell.